I'm a Bastard But You're Worse, Volume 1 by Lena D, translated by Shin Translations, audiobook by Masquerade at Masquerade Audiobooks, Chapter 1, Engagements Are Broken So Suddenly, Dinger Maxwell I hereby declare your engagement to Selena Void What? It all started one afternoon I was in the Royal Academy located in Sehan, capital of the Lamparor U Kingdom More precisely, I was walking through the Academy's garden when suddenly I heard a voice from behind me. I turned around to look at the source of the voice and found a young man with flowing golden locks and a familiar face. Oh my, to be honored by the presence of your highness Prince Sullivan, how may I be of service? The abrupt declaration had come from none other than the first prince of the Lamparor U Kingdom, Sullivan Lamparor Uj. Basically, the heir to the throne of Lamparor U Kingdom. Standing behind Sullivan, as if trying to hide from me. I saw my fiancé, Selena Noms. My petite, lovely fiancé was acting just like a small frightened animal. She looked at me with fear in her eyes, while almost hugging Sullivan's back. Your Highness, if I may be so bold, are you not standing a bit too close to my fiancé? I believe it is against the gentleman's code of conduct to be in such close contact with a woman engaged to another man, you fool. How dare you still speak of Selena as if she was your fiancé? Did you not hear what I said? Sullivan started shouting, irritated by my attitude. The prince's handsome features, very much unlike his character, were twisted beyond recognition. Since lunch break was not over yet, many of the academy's students were still in the garden. Some were sitting on a bench eating, others chatting with their friends. The commotion caused by the prince, however, attracted the curiosity of many of them. I looked around, concerned by the attention we were drawing, then sighed, making sure Sullivan didn't notice. By what I said, your highness is referring to my engagement with Selena being voided. So you did hear, do not make me repeat myself again. My apologies, it was all so abrupt. I could not help it. My shoulders dropped. Breaking up an engagement was a very delicate matter, something that should be dealt with privately, but if it was handled openly like this, with witnesses everywhere, it would be impossible to hide. My engagement with Selina was formed between the house of Margrave Maxwell and the house of Baron Noms. Thus, I cannot accept its cancellation by my own accord. I also believe that a member of the royal family, which has no relation to this engagement, has no power to change it, or am I wrong? What did you say? I have no relation to Selena. Sullivan pulled Selena closer to himself and put his arm around her back. The crown prince's sudden action caused the students around us to start whispering. Dot. Is this guy for real? I felt my facial muscles tense up because of the unbelievable sight before me. Regardless of whether I accepted the cancellation of the engagement or not, Selena was still my fiancé at the moment. To embrace someone else's fiancé so casually was beyond sanity in my eyes. Selena and I are in a relationship and will be married soon. A promise made with some countryside noble like you means nothing before true love. Just accept that your engagement is no more. Countryside, noble. The provinces ruled by the Maxwell House are located near the eastern borders of the kingdom. That was true. The crown prince was born and raised in the capital, so I probably was a country bumpkin in his eyes. The Maxwell House had been assigned such territories because of the trust it earned from the royal family. It was charged with defending the borders, so it had the military power to protect the kingdom from foreign enemies. The soldiers stationed round the capital might be greater in number, but in terms of individual ability and battle experience, the knights of the Maxwell House were without a doubt superior. The royal family had nothing to gain by picking a fight with the Maxwell House. Selena's house Nums was a vassal of House Maxwell. Their territories were also close. So if I was a countryside noble, then Selena was too. Did he realize it? For now. I shall pretend I have not heard the slander to my house. Rather, your highness, you have said you and Selina are in a relationship. HMPH. That is indeed what I said. It's time for you to accept reality and withdraw. He really admitted it in public, with so many people around us. Did Sullivan understand what it actually meant for a crown prince to lay his hands on someone else's fiancé? Sullivan was basically using the authority of the royal family to steal a vassal's fiancé. 
did he not realize that such an action would severely damage the trust of the nobles towards the royal family? Your Highness, if I may ask, does Lady Marianne know of this? The name I mentioned was Sullivan's fiance, Marianne Rosais, daughter of Duke Rosais, the Chancellor of the Kingdom of Lamperor Uge, the noblest young lady in all of the kingdom. She was praised as a lady among ladies in high society. M. Marianne, she, Sullivan, who had been talking arrogantly from the start, mumbled for the first time. It was a rather obvious change. Marianne was a proud woman who valued loyalty very highly. She would definitely never forgive Sullivan's unfaithfulness or the treacherous act of stealing a vassal's fiancé. Could it be that your highness is planning to take Selina as a concubine? Marianne as a royal wife and Selina as a concubine. It was still more understandable. Polygamy was not officially recognized in the kingdom, but it was not rare for royalty or certain nobles to take in concubines or mistresses in order to ensure the birth of an heir. Whether Lady Marianne would approve of this or not was a whole nother story. Of course, Lord Sullivan, the first reaction to my words came not from Prince Sullivan, but my fiancée Selina. Selina looked at Sullivan like she couldn't believe her eyes, so he hurriedly started explaining himself. N no. You are the only one I love, Selina. Thus your highness will also cancel the engagement with Lady Marianne. Sire, I trust you know what such a thing would imply, local powers tended to have considerable power in this kingdom, not even the royal house had absolute authority, the Lamperor U royal house was, ultimately, a representative of all noble families, a sort of delegate, the king was closer to the leader of an alliance than an absolute monarch. To cut ties with Duke Rosais, the most powerful noble family in the central region of the kingdom signified the loss of a major supporter for Crown Prince Sullivan to become king. And naturally, I hereby announce that my engagement with Marianne is void and that I shall marry Selina. She will be the next queen of the Lamperor U kingdom. Sullivan turned out to be much more of a moron than I imagined. Somehow, he still thinks he's going to be king, even without Duke Rosai's backing him up. Are you serious, Sir Sullivan? I dropped Crown Prince or Your Highness on purpose and Sullivan became even more heated up. I've never liked that woman in the first place. Always full of opinions, always telling me to fix this and that, to behave like a proper crown prince, always arrogant, always aggravating to a member of the royal family. How dare the mere daughter of a duke order the crown prince around? Taking advantage of the fact that Marianne wasn't here, Sullivan started saying whatever he wanted. While Marianne wasn't here in person, our audience contained several people with ties to House Rose Eyes. Sullivan's words were definitely going to be delivered to Marianne and Duke Rose Eyes. What a fine mess this has turned into. So I whispered to myself, making sure Sullivan couldn't hear. I thought the crown prince would be a bit smarter than this but evidently I was wrong. Until now, he probably managed to uphold the least authority as Crown Prince only thanks to Lady Marianne being at his side. I wondered what fate awaited a man who swore to discard an engagement to Lady Marianne for the sake of true love. Selina! Exclamation mark. I called Selina's name and she started trembling as she hid behind Sullivan's back. She had always been like that, always timid and clumsy, never voicing her opinion. Every time I approached her, she would run away frightened. She was indeed the complete opposite type from Lady Marianne, thus perfectly suiting Sullivan's tastes. Is this really okay with you? Do you truly wish for this? I tried giving Selina one final chance. Was she going to ruin herself together with this fool? Or would she come back to me? The decision was up to her. Ah, Selina looked confused, glancing left and right. Then Sullivan encouraged her. Say it, Selina. Don't worry, I'm with you. I will protect you, no matter what that man may do. Why yes. Pushed forward by Sullivan, Selina raised her voice and stated her decision. Her beautiful green eyes looked straight at me. I thought it had been a rather long time since our eyes met like this. I, uh, I, Lord Dinger, I am afraid of you. Because you have killed so many people. You killed so many people. I see so that's the reason. House Maxwell, the kingdom's guardian, has always protected it against invaders from the east. I was 13 when I participated in my first battle, 
five years ago. Since then, I have fought in many battles and have ended the lives of many soldiers with my hands. I became your fiancé because I couldn't disobey father, but I cannot endure it anymore. Lord Dinger, I do not want to be with you one second if I can help it, I beg of you. Please let me be free. Do you finally understand? It is simply appalling for a murderer like you to be engaged to lovely Selina. Your bloody hands have no right to embrace her. Go back to your province already, you murderous lunatic. Murderous lunatic. Sullivan's words caused me to shake in anger. I fought on the battlefield ever since I was a child. I fought to protect my household, my province, the kingdom. I was proud of my bloody hands. Not once did I feel any shame in them. And this man? dares call them the hands of a murderous lunatic. A man who has been protected by the nobles fighting on the frontier his whole life. A moron who has lived with a silver spoon in his mouth, who has never even seen a battlefield. The cancellation of the engagement is accepted. For the time being, we shall contact the royal house officially in the near future. I desperately held back from reaching for the sword at my waist and uttered only those words. I turned my back to Sullivan and Selina and walked away. The students who came to see the commotion opened a path for me, scared by the killing intent I couldn't keep from leaking out. I have to endure it. There's no point in killing him here. I'd turn into the aggressor. Besides, that man is going to ruin himself on his own soon. The house of Duke Rosais and the house of Margrave Maxwell. There was no way he could make an enemy of two of the most powerful noble houses in the kingdom and get away with it. I cannot draw my sword here. If I did, I would bear the name of a traitor. Lord Dinger, may I have a word with you? I was walking away silently when a student approached me. He was a bit shorter than me. The color at the badge on his uniform indicated he was enrolled in a grade below mine. I had seen his flaming red hair and the fierce light in his eyes somewhere, though. You are, the second son of the Efreta house, aren't you? My name is Luke, Luke Efreta. It is an honor to speak with you. I see. So your lad's younger brother. What business do you have with me? Luke looked around, then continued talking in the hushed tone of voice. If you will start a campaign to defend the honor of the eastern provinces, please let me, Luke Efreta, stand on the front lines. I swear on the name of House Efreta that I shall present you the head of that foolish prince, my lord. The house of Viscount Efreta was well known among the vassals of House Maxwell, especially for its military power. I was moved by his dedication but had to reprimand my hot-blooded junior nonetheless. Your loyalty is well appreciated. I have no intention to start a campaign, though, not yet, at least. That fool is going to self-destruct anyway. Understood. But if that time ever comes, please do summon me, Lord Dinger. May I ask what you plan to do? I reflected on Luke's words for a bit, then replied, I must return to my house's territory first. I have to present a formal protest to the royal house via my father, after all, if the king handles the matter with integrity, then everything is solved, if he tries to cover for the moron, however, you will have plenty of chances to prove your worth, I am at your service, my lord, I shall report to you everything that happens in the academy, please rest easy on your way to your home province, you have my trust. It is a joy to have such able vessels. When one door closes, another one opens. I had lost my fiancé but gained a trustworthy retainer. I tapped Luke's shoulder and he blushed fiercely. Why your words honor me? I heard from my brother about your battle against the Empire five years ago, so I always admired your prowess in battle. My lord. Oh, okay. I ended up being showered with Luke's praise all the way to the gate leading out of the academy. That day I learned how both words filled with malice and words filled with respect can wear you down if they continue excessively. I was feeling fatigued in more ways than one. As I sighed, packed my luggage, and departed from the royal capital. Chapter 2 Countermeasures are crafted in bed. As soon as I returned to my home province, I reported the whole incident to my father and wrote a letter of protest to the king and baron noms. Apparently, his Majesty the King had already been informed about the commotion in the Academy, and immediately sent a letter of apology. Thanks to the proper response of the Royal House and the abundant sum included as recompensation, the matter could be considered resolved, for the time being. On the other hand, Baron Noms, Selina's father, 
apparently was not aware of the relationship between his daughter and the crown prince. The moment he read the letter, he started foaming at the mouth and lost consciousness. M. My deepest apologies. The Baron then visited the Maxwell residence and apologized profusely, prostrated on the ground. He cast away all pride apologizing while hitting his head on the floor so hard one might worry he was going to open a hole in it. His prostration was so well done, so perfect, that I felt compelled to praise him. Section. Incidentally, Sullivan and Selina went to visit Lady Marianne after thrusting the cancellation of the engagement on me. As it turns out, the Crown Prince started by listing baseless accusations of Lady Marianne's alleged misconduct bullying Selina, abusing the authority of her family to control the academy, making secret allegiances with enemy states, and more. There was no way false charges like that could ever work on Lady Marianne, though, she shut down all of his arguments and harshly chastised his unfaithfulness instead. Her brilliant counterattack would eventually become a hot topic of discussion among students for a long time. The final result was that the Crown Prince bore all responsibility for the events and was demoted in the Royal Registry from Crown Prince to Vassal. He reaped what he sowed all right. I was lying on my bed in my home residence as I read the reports sent by Liu Kefrita from the capital. All the above information was included in his report one month after the abrupt cancellation of my engagement. I had withdrawn from the academy and returned to my home province. Even if the crown prince took responsibility for the events, I could not prevent other students from looking down on me. I wasn't keen on frequenting the academy anyway, so I chose to return to my province and help my father, in order to prepare to succeed him as Margrave. Now that the situation was over, I could say that the cancellation of the engagement was not a complete loss for House Maxwell. We had received an abundant sum from the royal house as compensation, house nums returned the sum we had offered in advance as financial aid in view of my marriage with Selina, and we also raised the interest rates of the debts they owed to the Maxwell house. For me, the best outcome is not having to marry Selina, though. Oh my, you did not like Lady Selina, my lord? The question came from the woman lying in bed next to me. The name of the disrobed lady was Eliza. She was the daughter of a house that served the Maxwells for generations and was also in charge of my education ever since I was small. Eliza, who was five years older than me, was now lying with her head on my chest, exhibiting most of her naked figure, which only grew in sensuality over the years, as she peeked at the document I was reading. She was pretty cute, so I did want to make her a woman myself but she was more trouble than she was worth. She was always a crybaby, definitely too weak to become the wife of a house in the border provinces. It might have been fun to bully her a bit though. How cruel, I certainly didn't raise you like that, young master. You most certainly have. It was you who taught me what I know about women. The relationship between Eliza and me began five years ago. After my first battle, I experienced my first real combat and achieved my first victories, unable to suppress the excitement after our triumphant return. I gave in to my instincts and assaulted Eliza. She pushed back at first, but ultimately accepted my advances. I thus had my first experience at the age of 13. Our relationship continued since then. Whenever I was back in my residence, we would sleep together almost every night. Oh, young master, to think you were so cute once, what a devil of a man you have become, as your tutor. I feel responsible. What? I've become a healthy and vigorous young man, as you can see, so you should feel proud instead. I laughed wryly and shrugged. I wasn't the only one to grow big and strong anyway, so I thought while gazing at Eliza's ample bust. It's a real pity for Baron Noms, though. Selina and I were both cheating on each other, but because of Sullivan the moron, they received the whole punishment. If they used all my mistresses as the reason for breaking off the engagement, they could have forced us to pay up instead. Maybe they simply do not know of the relationship young master holds with us? <laughs> Maybe Selina doesn't, but I doubt the Baron doesn't know anything. I went several times to the red light district in the capital and never did anything to hide it either. It isn't uncommon for nobles to entertain relationships with multiple women, so maybe he was just pretending not to know, 
In any case, if Sullivan had at least something resembling a brain, he would have gone to house noms first to discuss the matter, and history would have changed. This is my first time hearing about the pleasure district. How cruel you are, telling something like that to me without a shred of apology. Eliza pouted and pinched my chest, looking at her adorable gesture, in contrast with her mature charm, made me smile. I wanted to make you jealous. Men want to see all sorts of expressions from the woman they fell for. You know that. Oh, you make it sound like a nice thing to say, your bad habits with women haven't changed even in the academy. After all the trouble master went through to register you. HMPH. If he put me in there hoping to fix me, that'd be a real waste. Father must be pretty distressed too, with how things turned out. I recalled my father's reaction when I told him about the engagement cancellation affair and smiled bitterly. My father, the Margrave, had a personality completely different from mine. He was an austere, serious, upright man. I was prepared to be scolded and preached at for a couple of hours, as it often happened, but after hearing my report, my father reacted in a way I definitely did not expect. Just do what you want. I don't care anymore. He then slumped on his chair, as if he was terribly exhausted. Looking at my father so devastated, even I couldn't help but feel pain. Continuing my conversation with Eliza, in any case, the prince has got to take responsibility for what he's done. Oh? He was disinherited and demoted to vassal status, was he not? Has he not been punished already? Eliza cocked her head to the side, curious. Yeah, the royal house has handed out its punishment, but that's just his responsibility as crown prince, right? He hasn't paid for humiliating me as a man yet. Nor for insulting the house of Maxwell. He picked a fight with me first. I have a duty to pay him back till he cries and begs for mercy. Sullivan might be finished as a member of the royal family, but that was not enough punishment for that man. Even if he became a marquis or a count, he could still lead a life of freedom and luxury, unless I did something about it. He snatched my woman and even dared insult the pride of all soldiers who fight to defend this country, the bastard. I won't be satisfied until he fully learns what kind of person he made an enemy of. He had better enjoy the calm before the storm. You are a man to be feared, young master. Eliza then raised her head and kissed me. Our tongues clashed and meshed wildly, then she laid her body over mine. Thanks to our long relationship, Eliza knew how excited, how frenzied I became before a battle, and how I appeased that drive by seeking female company. Take it all, Eliza. Yes, young Mars, HNN. I switched positions with Eliza and hungrily became one with her, making love to her body, which had become much more mature the first time, five years ago. Section. In the end, my desire wasn't satisfied until noon of the following day. Eliza had gasped, moaned, and shouted through the night. So by the morning she was lying exhausted, unable to move. So I took the newly hired maid who came to announce breakfast was ready and dragged her into the bed. I listened to her miserable shrieking as I possessed her virgin body, thinking that younger girls weren't bad either. Chapter 3 The Prodigal Son Moves in the Shadows Point of View, Margrave Maxwell Is Din still in bed? Yes, he had quite a long night, after all, so replied the Maxwell house steward, a troubled tone in his voice. I pressed my fingers against my temples, trying to subdue the migraine I felt coming. My name is Dietrich Maxwell. A margrave in charge of the provinces on the eastern border of the Lamperor U Kingdom. Nobles ruling over territories located on the border have much to be worried about. We must be ready at all times for enemy invasions, as well as prevent any foreign ruffians from entering the country or domestic criminals from crossing the borders. My house of Maxwell is also the leader of the Alliance of Nobles of the Eastern Provinces. We have the duty to act as a mediator in case of disputes between noble families, as well as negotiate on behalf of local nobles with the royal house or central nobles. My gravest concern as of late, however, is the attitude of my own son, Dinger Maxwell. He's been at it every night since he returned, the two years spent in the academy did nothing to mend his womanizing habits, then, one month ago, my son's engagement with the young lady of the Noms house was forcefully broken by the crown prince. Thus he returned to his home province. 
I thought that such an event would have brought him down, but had to quickly retract my concerns. Ever since that day, he started taking the female servants he used to frolic within the past and engaged in indescribable debauchery every night. My lord, I do not know what to say. It's all my daughter's fault. The house steward bowed deeply. No, it's not your fault. I have to apologize to you instead. No, my lord. The house steward looked conflicted. My son had several mistresses, but the first lady, for lack of a better term, was the house steward's daughter, Eliza. How would a father feel when his only daughter, raised with love and care, ended up sleeping with his master's son? I was honestly terrified to know, so I never asked. Young Master Dinger is, how can I put it, he has heroic traits about him. He cannot be satisfied with a single woman, I suppose. Heroes are amorous. As the proverb says, it does sound nice if you put it like that. But, as a father, it is an endless source of concern. Indeed, if he was unskilled, I would have gladly disowned him. I furrowed my brow and let out a deep sigh. My son, Dinger, was what you would call a prodigal son. If you asked me if he was an incompetent idiot, however, I would have to firmly shake my head. Dinger showed traits of excellence ever since his infancy. He was an incredibly quick learner in terms of politics, economy, strategy, everything. His martial instructor even said that he had an incredible talent for fighting. He was very popular among the vessels. The children of other nobles regarded him with respect and affection as a big brother. Five years ago, he participated in his first battle a small skirmish with one of our neighboring countries, in which he managed to lead a small battalion to ambush the enemy and even take the enemy commander's head. Genius, prodigy, hero that will go down in history, even without my parental bias, I believed such words were meant for him. The only thing such a formidable son could not resist was the opposite gender. Dinger had his awakening at the age of thirteen, by bonding with Eliza, the house steward's daughter. Ever since then, he had become obsessed with women. Starting from Eliza, Dinger has laid his hands on most if not all female servants in the residence. I could not help but feel terrible whenever I saw them. I honestly wanted to scold him, but all the money Dinger used on women came from his own pocket. He used the money I gave him as an allowance to start a small business with other nobles. In five years, the profits from the diplomatic trade doubled. Being so successful is what makes him so awful, I have no basis to scold him, if only he could get rid of his lust for women, I could let him take over without a single worry. Lord Dinger's talents are exceptional, after all. Incidentally, he appears to have established new transactions with friends he met in the academy. I see, so even if he looks like he's always playing around, he made new connections too. At least he understands what the duties of a noble are. Yes, indeed, though he also visited the pleasure district once a week. So it is also true that he was playing around. I lost count of how many times I had sighed already. Dejected, I slumped down on the table. Having a foolish son would definitely be a problem, but an excessively skilled one was troublesome too. Especially if he was skillful and foolish at the same time. Well, that's still, with some effort with great effort, we can overlook that. Instead, do you know what happened to the daughter of Baron Noms after that? I changed the topic, as to escape reality for a while. Baron Noms was a vassal of House Maxwell. His daughter Selina had been my son's fiancée. When I heard that the engagement had been broken by her, I started having cold sweats, thinking that my son's womanizing habits had been found out. I would have never expected for her to be the unfaithful one, and with the crown prince no less. Despite looking so timid and meek, she managed to seduce the kingdom's crown prince of all people. I had to change my opinion of her. Baron Noms appears uncertain on how to punish her too. Her engagement with the former crown prince was announced in public, after all. I don't know the extent of their relationship, but she could already be pregnant with a child of royal blood. If that happens, it is likely to breed political conflict, after the engagement breakup events, Crown Prince Sullivan was disinherited. Sullivan was the eldest son, but his mother's status was relatively low. Without the backup of Duke Rose's eyes, he was unlikely to become king. 
Having insulted the House of Rose Eyes, such a punishment was inevitable. Selena's fate was also most likely sealed. She would end up being used by a faction rebelling against the royal family or disposed of before that. I couldn't foresee any light in her future. If only it all happened behind closed doors. It could have been suppressed somehow, but to expose a delicate problem like the breakup of an engagement in public, I didn't think of him as such a fool. He was a crown prince, but still a man, after all. When a woman is involved, men become fools, like someone else I know. Is that sarcasm? Of course not, sire. I looked silently at the house steward's eyes, then slowly shook my head. Well, it appears that His Majesty the King, the Baron and I have all raised our children wrong. At least my own fool has decent judgment. I have to be thankful for that, at least. Indeed, sir, sigh. Ha. I sighed at the same time as the house steward, then the door of my study opened. Only one person in this residence would ever enter the Margrave's study without knocking. Morning, old man, I've got something to talk about. You've got time now, right? My skirt-chasing idiot of a son. Of course. The house steward and I looked at each other, our expressions turning sour. What? Were you both complaining about me or something? Is there something we should complain about? Not that I know of. I'm as pure and honest as they come. Can you say that about your own body too, young master? Though you have spent a pleasant night apparently, that is very nice. Hey, no sarcasm. I took a bath, mind you. Shut up already, idiot. Can't you see the murderous intent in the eyes of the house steward? I wish the daggers he's throwing would actually stab, honestly. Such thoughts popped up my mind, but I decided to listen to him for now. What business do you have? You haven't come to help with my work. Have you? Work? If you mean the western region's irrigation. I've already sent the workers. Same for the bandits around Zess village. The expedition corps are already on their way. The scouts for the Eastern Four are not leaving tomorrow morning, so that's taken care of too. Oh, about the horseback bandits in the territory of Viscount Silphys, I've got a plan to leave it all to me. I'll take care of them in the next few days. You're a real fool of a son. This excellent side of his makes him all the more despicable. I bet I'm the only father bothered by the skills of his son. Anyway, what did you come for then? I've got a favor to ask, that's all. Here. My son handed me an envelope. It wasn't sealed, so I took out the paper inside and read it, finding that its contents were quite bizarre. This is, I want you to send that with your name, addressed to His Majesty the King. What are you thinking? I looked at my son's face and found a prankster's smile on his lips. The same face he showed when he brought me the enemy commander's head in his first battle. The last eighteen years had taught me, to a painful extent. How that face meant something nasty was approaching. The former crown prince and my former fiancé lady are going to have a bit of a bad time. It's just a prank, nothing more. HMGH. When I came back, you told me to do what I wanted, right? I'm sticking to your words, old man. I scanned the letter again and felt the headache growing stronger. A few days after Crown Prince Sullivan was disinherited and the commotion settled down, a letter from Margrave Maxwell was delivered to the Royal House of Lamperor Ouge. It was a very succinct letter. I offer heartfelt congratulations for Prince Sullivan's marriage into the family of Baron Noms. Chapter 4 Prank Celebration Point of View Duke Rose Eyes Maxwell's rascal is up to no good again. Royal capital of the Lamperor U Kingdom, in the Royal Duties Office. I, Bert Rose Eyes, the current head of the House of Rose Eyes, read the contents of the letter sent by House Maxwell and grumble to myself. I offer heartfelt congratulations for Prince Sullivan's marriage into the family of Baron Noms. Congratulations. So the letter said, but this was, for all intents and purposes, a threat. The malice contained in this short sentence was so intense that I, as the kingdom's chancellor, could not help but be impressed by its craftiness. Approximately one month ago, my beloved daughter Marianne was told by Crown Prince Sullivan that their engagement was no more. The reason was that he actually loved someone else, truly childish. The sender of this letter, Dinger Maxwell, 
was none other than the fiancé of Prince Sullivan's mistress, Selina Noms. Sole responsibility for the broken engagements fell on Sullivan's shoulders. Sullivan apparently continued repeating that he had found true love, while also pathetically whining about how Marianne was not suited to be his fiancée. In any case, he had laid hands on another woman despite being engaged, so there was no doubt that he was at fault. The woman he laid his hands on was also engaged herself. No matter how many excuses the moron of a crown prince could find, abusing the authority of the royal family to snatch a vassal's fiancé would brand him with infamy. Section. You you, Chancellor. Can we do something about this? This pitifully weak tone was produced by none other than the master of this office of royal duties, His Majesty the King. This ancient man, far too weak-willed for his position, had two sons, but he especially favoured his firstborn, Sullivan. He looked at me with an expression full of concern for Sullivan's future. His Majesty, King Salachalam Peror Uj, was a rather ordinary man compared to his rank. He had no impressive military feats to his name nor enough wisdom to be remembered. His only positive trait was that he was well aware of his limited abilities. He never imposed his opinion on political or military matters, always carefully listening to the opinions of those around him. You could also say that he can't decide anything by himself, though. While mentally judging him harshly, I answered the king's question. Nothing, I'm afraid, Maxwell. The victim in this series of events, is requesting for the marriage of Prince Sullivan into the family of Baron Noms to be celebrated. Our only option is for the prince to actually marry into the Noms family, regardless of what they actually thought. On the surface, the victim was relinquishing their rights, so they could not be denied. H however, if that happens, the king faltered and babbled. Sullivan marrying into the family of Baron Noms, even his mediocre intelligence grasped what a terrible punishment it was. A baron might be a noble rank, but its status was extremely close to a commoner. The territory a baron could rule over amounted to one or two villages at most, with minimal tax revenues. Such a house could not lead a lavish lifestyle, naturally. For Sullivan, who had lived among luxuries all his life, as a member of the royal family, it would be impossible to inch marrying into such a family. In addition, the noms were vassals of House Maxwell and even owed them money. They would have to obey almost any order from House Maxwell. In the case of armed conflict, they would likely be sent to the front lines. Sullivan would thus become the subordinate of the man he angered by stealing his fiancée. A life of torment would await him. Could there be any punishment more terrifying than this? The king seemed to want to say something, so I encouraged him to speak. And the words started sputtering out of his mouth. HMGH. I know, I know what Maxwell means, but is this not too much? For a member of the royal family to marry into a baron's house? There could be no worse humiliation. Sullivan has already been disinherited. Why must that poor boy meet such a cruel fate? That punishment was not enough, then, at least. That is what Maxwell seems to think. A judgment my house of Rosais fully agrees with. In the letter sent to the house of Maxwell, it was written that Sullivan would be punished severely. His Majesty, the weak and kind king, however, had no intention to actually administer a strict punishment to his son. Sullivan's rank was demoted to that of a vassal of the royal family, but depending on the situation, it did not amount to a very severe punishment, because he would be adopted by a marquis without heirs and thus lead a stable lifestyle. They probably saw through the fact that the king wasn't strict enough to actually punish Sullivan, MMPH. While it is a troublesome matter, it is a favorable development for me as a Rose Eyes. The Rose Eyes family was also a victim in this series of events and was equally dissatisfied with the slap on the wrist Sullivan received. Despite our dissatisfaction, we were forced to accept this conclusion because, as representative of the central noble families, it was our duty to minimize any threats to the capital's stability. However, my precious daughter's face had been smeared with mud, as a father, I would like to at least strip that idiotic former crown prince to shreds. H however, oh yes, Chancellor, if you bowed personally to Maxwell, then... That's the proposal the king came up with. I should do that, for Sullivan's sake. Yes, a king cannot bow his head to his vassals, but if you, the chancellor did, then, 
Maybe, I glared at the king with all the murderous intent I could muster, and his words trailed off. Allow me to ask one more time, your majesty. I should throw away my pride and lower my head, for the sake of the man who betrayed my daughter? G.H. The king finally seemed to comprehend the enormity of his blunder. Like father, like son, I sighed mentally. His majesty did not spout such nonsense normally. But, like Sullivan, he apparently had a tendency to let his emotions take over at times. If he truly wished to protect his son, he should just do so, even at the cost of offending the Maxwell or the Rosai's nobles. Was he so scared of us? However his cowardice made him ideal as this kingdom's ruler. A truly competent king would be resented by the four houses, in the Lamper or U kingdom. The four Margrave houses protecting the borders in the four cardinal directions boasted considerable power. They were normally called the four houses. The measure of a king's true ability in this country was in how well they could rule while not making enemies of the four houses. His Majesty the King was too weak-willed to be the ruler of a nation, but because of that, there was no threat to the four houses' privileges or authority. He was seen as an easy-to-carry figurehead. Truly able kings never last long. After all, Sullivan should consider himself lucky not to have had any unfortunate accidents. The four houses must not be opposed. The kings buried in darkness because of them were too many to count. Chapter 5 Dealing with Fools Takes Its Toll. Point of view Duke Rose Eyes in a private room of the royal palace. Nonsense. I, the crown prince, have to marry into a baron's family. Do you realize how stupid it sounds? Before me, a fool was shouting and gesticulating. The fool's name was, naturally, Sullivan Lamper or Uge, the kingdom's former crown prince. Unfortunately, His Majesty the King decided thus. We must ask for Your Highness' acceptance. I carefully picked my words. Dealing with the aftermath of the events was exhausting enough. I was already sick of dealing with prattling fools. Why do I have to do this in the first place? So I cursed under my breath, normally. It was his majesty's duty to deliver royal edicts and announce such decisions, but this time I, the chancellor, was sent to act in his majesty's place. His majesty the king loathed the idea of announcing such a thing to his beloved son, so the troublesome task was laid upon my shoulders. Needless to say, not only did he fail to uphold his responsibility as king, but as a father too. How many times has the royal family disappointed me in the last month? I was not a man of extreme ambitions, but the recent events caused the word rebellion to flicker in my mind. There has to be some mistake. I'll talk with my father. Sullivan roughly curled up the royal edict into a ball and threw it on the floor. I felt my facial muscles tense up. A royal edict is not only signed by the king in person but also bears the royal seal of the Lamperor U kingdom. Treating a royal edict in such a way was a barbarous act, tantamount to treason. Even if this man still had the rank of the crown prince, if such an act occurred in public, his execution would be inevitable. I might as well use this to have him executed, but if I did, his majesty would die of grief. I kept my composure as I repeated the facts. Unfortunately, this has already been decided. Could you please confirm the contents one more time? You can see the royal seal has been stamped. Yes? You. Sullivan finally realized what he had done and picked up the royal edict at his feet. An awkward expression on his face. He spread the high-quality parchment, carefully stretched out the wrinkles, and read it again. Why yes, there is the royal seal, but I cannot believe this. I cannot believe my father would abandon me. I thought I would just be demoted until things boiled over. To marry into a baron's family. W. What did I do to deserve this? What did I do, you say? Could it possibly be that this man has not yet grasped the extent of his actions? Margrave Maxwell was the guardian of the eastern provinces and the biggest single military force in the kingdom. The House of Rosais was the leader of the central nobles and the pivot of the kingdom's political world. This man turned both of these major noble families into his enemies and created an unmendable fissure between them and the royal family, yet he still acts like he's the victim. I should maybe consider myself lucky that the engagement was broken. At least my precious daughter doesn't have to marry this buffoon anymore. While mentally sighing in relief, I started explaining again, as patiently as I could. Lord Sullivan, as I believe you are aware, in this kingdom, 
There are four Margrave houses, the so-called Four Houses, who possess vast power. The royal family and duke families have higher official rank and greater political authority, but as these houses are charged with defending the borders, their military power is something even His Majesty the King can't ignore. You have snatched the fiancé of the heir to one of such Margraves and enraged them, without proper punishment. A rift would open between the royal family and the Margraves. Please understand that His Majesty the King took this decision with a heavy heart. N no, I can't. Sullivan turned pale and started trembling. Apparently, he finally understood the gravity of his actions. I, I just fell in love with Selina, and, was I in the wrong? Is it wrong to pursue true love? Sullivan weakly collapsed on the ground, mumbling such words with a lifeless look on his face. True love, sir? So very beautiful. My lips twisted, and I slowly shook my head. It is truly unfortunate, Lord Sullivan, but beautiful and righteous are two different things. If you truly simply wished to uphold your love with Selina Noms, you should have made proper preparations. At the very least, if you had first apologized to Maxwell then talked properly with Marianne. Your punishment would not have been so harsh. N no. No, ah. Sullivan. His palms on the ground, screamed in desperation. How pitiful. Had Sullivan not made this mistake, he would have become my son-in-law. If I had kept a closer eye on him, I could have prevented him from falling so low. Couldn't I? I suppose I shall give him my support to not further offend Maxwell. That is my responsibility. So I was thinking when, as a final gesture of good conscience, I got on one knee and stretched a hand to Sullivan. However, I know. What? I know, I know. I just need to fix the mistake. Just need to make it as nothing happened. Sir Sullivan, overwhelmed by Sullivan's sudden momentum as he stood back up, I moved two steps backward. I could not tell why, but I had a terrible feeling about it. Chancellor. Yes, sir. I take back breaking the engagement with your daughter. Ha! Huh? My body bent backward and my eyes opened wide. Did this man really say that? If I get engaged with Marianne again I don't have to marry into Baron Nom's family. And since I have a duke family as support, I can be the crown prince again too. Then I can just use the Rosai's finances to pay Maxwell a recompensation. Selina, well, I can take her as a concubine, and it's all settled. How low will this man stoop to? I could tell that all signs of emotion had left my face. How selfish can one be? To force the people around him to move for his sake, with no regards at all for their own circumstances. Good, good. It's decided. Go call Marianne. Tell her that I'll let our engagement be mended and silence. Gua. Before I realized it, my right hand grabbed Sullivan's neck. He surely never expected something like that to happen. There was nothing but shock and surprise in his eyes. Chan, Sel, Law, did you seriously think that my dear daughter's life, that the future of the noble house of Rose Eyes, is for you to decide on a whim? Who do you think you are? I, am, Crown, Prince. The former crown prince, yes? Sullivan's face lost color, turning a shade of purple, so I finally released him. He collapsed on the floor again, coughing several times. Be thankful that we are in the royal palace, if we had met outside, I'd have strangled you. Ka, ha, ha, don't think, you'll get, away with this. Oh? He still hadn't spouted all of his nonsense. Apparently, I raised a foot and pressed the heel on Sullivan's right hand. Gay. I won't get away with this. What will you do, then? You, the adopted son of a baron, without a shred of power or authority. What can you do to the head of House Rose Eyes? Say it. F. Father will see to it. The same father said that he will not meet you. He probably doesn't want to even see the face of his idiot of a son. Why you're lying. Father would never abandon me. Go confirm that yourself then. Not that you even have the right to request an audience, as you are now. I turned my back to Sullivan. I had no more words for the man. As they say, there is no cure for stupidity. Chapter 6, Holidays are for Hunting. Clop, 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 clop. Several dozen horses trotted across the plains with armed men rode on top of them. The atmosphere surrounding the men was too casual to think they were soldiers. Their outfits were also completely mismatched. 
Some of them wore knight-like armor, others wore animal skins haphazardly stitched together to form some sort of clothing. These men were the Crimson Tigers, a gang of horseback thieves that, in recent years, scoured the territories of Viscount Silthys, located in the eastern provinces of the Lamparoru Kingdom. The Silthys territory was one of the major producers of crops in the Kingdom of Lamparoru. Most of the area was composed of plains. Horseback thieves could easily move across the plains, making them very difficult to deal with and turning them into an endless source of concern for Viscount Silthys. The Crimson Tigers were infamous for their ruthlessness, several villages had already been burned to the ground by them, the villagers murdered brutally. The village is up ahead, right? Yes, we're very close. The large, burly man heading the group barked a question, and the lean man riding next to him replied. The large man bore a fang-like tattoo on his bald head and rugged muscles on his body riddled with scars. He had the aura of a veteran of many battlefields. This man was the leader of the Crimson Tigers, while his real name was unknown. He was wanted and feared with the name of Man-Eating Tiger. The men are going to bring wheat to the Lord today, so there should be only women, children and old people in the village, boss. It's gonna be a feast. He he he. The lean man licked his lips. In response, the man-eating tiger snorted. We're not gonna find much if they already carried away the wheat. I guess we'll leave just enough so they won't starve. We're gonna find women, boss. We can do what we want with them, yeah? Yeah, do whatever you want. Just don't take too much time. Loud and clear, boss. He he he. Soon enough, the village became visible. The village was surrounded by relatively tall fences, which served to keep out wolves and other beasts. For the horseback invaders, it amounted to paper-thin defenses. The man-eating tiger drew the broadsword on his back and held it high, while deftly controlling the horse with one hand. Listen well, men. We are beasts, monsters that feast on human flesh. Kill, rape, take everything you can. The horseback bandits roared in response to the man-eating tiger's shout. A small group of bandits ran ahead of the group and tore down the fences for the rest to rush into the village. The Crimson Tigers were all experienced in the art of plunder and slaughter, their leader more than anyone else. Of course, the people of such a small, weak village could not have the means to stop their barbaric acts. A banquet of flesh and blood was about to start. Gwawah. The man-eating tiger followed his subordinates inside, hearing screams of agony coming from the village already. Ah, But there, the man-eating tiger froze in his tracks. A completely unexpected scenery welcomed him. Ready your bows, fire. Gwawah. For some reason, there were rows of soldiers armed with bows in the village. The corpses of the bandits who entered the village first were strewn at their feet. S shit. Why are there soldiers in a place like this? The man-eating tiger swiftly moved his broadsword to parry the arrows, but one of the arrows he missed struck his horse. The bandit leader jumped away from his collapsing horse, rolled on the ground, and quickly got into stance again. TCH, charge, men, kill them all. The horseback thieves not felled by the arrows rushed towards the soldiers. Just when they were close enough to attack, however, another group of soldiers appeared at their back. This time armed with spears, they proceeded to charge at the bandits from behind, thrusting their spears into the ruffians. Gwawah, B boss, help, GWFH, W we can't win this. Run, the horseback bandits drew ability manifested in being able to freely maneuver through wide grasslands. In a small village with many obstacles, their capabilities amounted to half as much. The bandits were taken out, one after the other. Shit. The man-eating tiger decided quickly. He ditched his surviving subordinates and fled in direction of the torn fence. He ran desperately, using his broadsword to knock away any subordinates in his way. They must have found out that we were going to attack this village. Shit, where's the way out? Where? The leader ran for dear life, as the screams of his subordinates grew fainter in the background. Just then, a horse. I have to find a horse. You're the man-eating tiger. Yeah? Exclamation mark. A young man suddenly appeared at his side. I've been waiting for you. The man-eating tiger turned round and saw a young man clad in knight armor, with a group of soldiers, apparently his subordinates, 
There were the dead bodies of several bandits at their feet, probably those who attempted to escape before. Who are you, bastard? Definitely not someone a filthy thief can call a bastard. The name's Dinger. Not that it means anything at this point, shrugged the young man. Dinger, Maxwell. Why are you here? The eastern provinces are Maxwell Turf. We don't directly rule over this area, but there's no reason why we can't be here, is there? This is bullshit. Well, if you really want to know, as the next lord of these lands, I feel like I have to protect my little brothers, see? So I figured I could take a load off the shoulders of my precious vessel. Dinger chuckled and drew his sword. The dull glow of his blade was very different from the ceremonial blades nobles often wielded. It was not a decoration, but a fine tool made for killing. Come get yours already. I'll do you a favor and take you one on one. Dinger pointed his sword at the man-eating tiger and grinned playfully. None of the soldiers even tried to dissuade their lord. They were positive he would win, apparently. Don't get so cocky, brat. The man-eating tiger held his broadsword high, leapt forward, and took advantage of the momentum to swing it down, despite his large body. His movements were very agile. You look like a tiger all right. Even before the bandits kill a strike, Dinger was as nonchalant as ever. He easily sidestepped the attack and swung his sword in return. And done! Exclamation mark. Dinger swung his sword twice, the first slash cut off the bandit's hands holding the broad sword, the second opened a deep gash on his legs. The hands used to hold a weapon were gone, and he now had lost the use of his legs to escape. The man-eating tiger, having lost control of his limbs, could only fall face down on the ground. Gah! Ha! Itter, you urts! Stop the blood and drop him off at the inspector's place. Make sure he can't kill himself. Yes, sir. My, that was splendid. One man stepped forward, congratulating Dinger on his victory. To cut down the man-eating tiger so easily, your sword play was something to behold. He he he. The lavish praise and creepy chuckle came from the lean man that rode into the village alongside the leader of the bandits. R, thanks for your help too. Sorry to have you do something so troublesome. Not at all. Troublesome tasks are my line of work after all. He he. The lean man was a spy sent by Dinger to infiltrate the Crimson Tigers. Thanks to his information, they could prepare a trap for the horseback bandits this time. I'll send someone with your reward later. I'll be counting on you again if something comes up. Yes, naturally, sir. By the way, was there a reason to leave that man alive? The lean man spoke while looking at the soldiers tying the man-eating tiger and carrying him away. My men have already taken over the Crimson Tiger's hideout, so I don't think there's anything to gain by interrogating that man, honestly. He he he. Oh yeah. About that, Dinger picked up the broad sword used by the man-eating tiger. This is a pretty good sword, isn't it? It's dirty with mud and blood right now, but it was made with good metal. It's not some mass-produced thing, but a one-of-a-kind genuine product of fine blacksmithing. It'd fetch a fair bit of money on the market. Yes? What are you talking about, sir? The lean man was puzzled by the sudden change of topic. Dinger did not seem to care, however, and continued. It's the same for the other bandits' weapons. You can't find high-quality gear like this just by plundering villages. There has to be a sponsor backing them up. Someone pulling the strings, sir? Yeah, my first bet is the Empire. Then, a central noble that wanted to take us down a peg. The Dark Horse is the Lamperor royal family. Dinger tossed away the broadsword and wiped his hands with his sleeve as if he had touched something disgustingly filthy. In any case, there's plenty of stuff to ask him, so he's not going to have an easy death. Poor guy. He he. What a terrifying person. Much more than these thieves. The lean man looked up to the sky, as chills ran down his spine. After the horseback thieves were finished, I was at the village as well wiping blood off my weapons. We had informed the villagers about the operation in advance, so they were now returning from the shelters, little by little, among them. There were also some innocent-looking girls. <laughs> the women here aren't half bad either. Pure, naive beauty, like a wildflower blooming in the grasslands, I could do two or three before going back. As I was gazing at the young female villagers happily confirming each other's safety, 
one of my subordinates ran up to me, Lord Danger, a messenger from Margrave Maxwell. There are orders for you to return to the castle immediately, my lord, TCH. What's the damn hurry? My expectations of a good time were abruptly interrupted, so I replied with an annoyed tone. The messenger looked terrified of having soured my mood as he continued his report. M my deepest apologies. A apparently, Baron Noms and his son-in-law wish to see you at all costs. Ha ha. I see, so they came. Maybe startled by my loud reaction, the villagers in the surroundings quickly scattered. The young girls I enjoyed looking at so much were gone, but I was in very good spirits nonetheless. I'm going back to the Maxwell territory. Those who can leave right now, come with me. Hey, why young master? I ignored my subordinates booing, hopped on my horse, and galloped away. Ha ha ha. Welcome to the outer provinces, O oh former crown prince, you'll enjoy your life in the countryside. Chapter 7, The Conclusion of the Prank Lord Dinger. The guests are here. Oh, they've arrived? It was the day after the extermination of the horseback bandits in the Silphys territory and my return to the Maxwell Castle. Today was the day scheduled for the meeting with Baron Noms and Sullivan. NNH. R. Well, it's not like they're important guests or anything. They can wait a bit longer. Arn, young master. I wonder what kind of face the crown prince is going to make when he realizes that the man he's always looked down on is making him wait. Young, R, master, feels so good. Oh really now, I suppose we could enjoy yourselves a bit more. Incidentally, I was presently working out with Eliza on the bed. The current time was noon, but I didn't really care about the time of day for my workouts. When I was back in my house, whenever I wasn't working. I was usually together with the maids. Sigh. What's with you, Sakia? If you have something on your mind, I'll listen. The young girl, now looking at us with a jaded look on her face, was one of the maids working in the castle who came to announce the guest's arrival. Her name was Sakia. She had black hair and black eyes, a rare combination in this kingdom. Her cold, strict expression clearly showed she did not find my behavior at all proper. I shall take your permission to speak then. Lord Dinger, while you might be known for your vigor, to skip both breakfast and lunch to indulge in lustful acts cannot be healthy. I must ask you to take better care of yourself. Please understand the feelings of those who serve under you. NNH, R, Arn, it is a servant's duty to care for their master's health. Please. At least have a light meal. Being scolded by a maid younger than myself, I couldn't help but feel awkward. I paused for a moment and sat on the bed, on the battlefield. It's not rare to go half a day or more without eating, though. This is your residence, my lord, not the battlefield. It would be an eternal shame for a maid to let the master starve. <laughs> Guess that can't be helped. Bring me something quick, anything is fine. Yes. My lord, I thought you might say that, so I have already made preparations. Sakia took out a basket from who knows where and showed it to me. It contained toasted bread, bacon, slices of fruit, and more. Looks good, give it here. Yes, if you will excuse me. I stretched a hand to grab the basket, but Sakia dodged it and slipped inside the bed. If you wanted to join in, you should have just said so. To not speak of such matters openly is what they call gracefulness. Say ah, my lord. Ah, have some egg, then. Ah, Sakuya fed me, like a mother hen would do to her chick. She was as expressionless as before, but her lips seemed to be curved in a faint smile. Thank you for the meal. So now it's my turn. And, as expected, it didn't end with just eating. After the meal I had Sakuya as dessert. I took care of Eliza too. At the same time of course, forgetting about the passing time, I completely forgot about my guests and relished repeatedly in my two partners section. Sorry for the wait. I ended up playing with them until the house steward couldn't stand it anymore and barged into my room. I put on some clothes and went to the waiting room. There were three men in the waiting room, who each reacted to my arrival in their own way. He really made us wait this long. The barely audible whisper came from the cause of the whole engagement breakup commotion, former Crown Prince Sullivan Lamperor Ouge. Well, now that he's been erased from the royal register, 
I should say Sullivan noms. I hadn't seen Sullivan in a few months, he looked a bit leaner than before. Maybe because of the long time he had to wait. I could see the humiliation on his face. Oh, oh no, sir. We must apologize for taking time from your busy schedule. The completely apologetic tone came from the bowed head of Baron Thomas Noms, the same man who had exhibited an impeccable prostrated posture when he came to apologize for his daughter's misdeeds one month ago. He also looked almost emaciated as he wiped copious amounts of sweat from his forehead. The third guest was a young man in his early twenties. You are, the firstborn of House Noms, right? Your name was Cranoms, young master. Cranoms was casually wearing an elegant formal suit. He looked quite different from his father in many ways. He took a nonchalant attitude while sending a criticizing look in my direction. Oh yes. Now I remember. Sorry. Oh no. There is no need for you to remember the name of the man that, because of his younger sister's fiancé, lost his inheritance rights. Young master. None at all. See Cray. Do not disrespect the young master. Cray reacted to his father's rebuke by shrugging and smiling wryly. I see, Sullivan marrying into the Noms family also meant that Cray lost his spot as next in line for the Baron title. Sullivan had been erased from the royal register. But Baron Noms probably thought that since he still had royal blood in his veins, he had to nominate Sullivan as his successor. I must apologize for what you've been through. I will prepare a new job and house for you, Cray. I'm thankful to hear that. I suppose it was worth it to come all the way here. I had met Cranoms a few times before on social occasions, but it was the first time we actually talked. He seemed to have a good head on his shoulders and was brave as well. Pretty interesting guy. I might have actually found a hidden gem here. While Baron Noms might have picked the wrong person. A successor. After considering such thoughts, I formally asked the reason for their visit. So... To what do I owe the pleasure today? Oh, yes, Sullivan, who married into the Noms family recently, wished to formally greet you, my lord. Dot. After Baron Noms spoke, Sullivan turned a fiery shade of red and glared at him. He was clearly infuriated to hear a mere Baron address him without any titles or honorifics. Mile per hour. If you get pissed over every little thing like that, you're not going to last long around here. I mentally scoffed at Sullivan, then replied in an affected tone. Oh my, I am grateful for your courtesy. You have an upstanding, polite son-in-law, Baron Noms. Sullivan picked up what my words implied and his expression twisted even more. Dripping sweat from his forehead, Baron Noms looked at Sullivan and me. Sullivan stared at the clenched fists on his lap for a moment and then eventually resolved to bow his head. I must apologize for my past disrespect. As the successor to House Noms, I'll try. I shall strive to prove my worth. Thus I am at your service. Yes, do your best. Let us do our utmost for the prosperity of the Eastern Provinces, together. You as the next Baron of House Noms. I as the next Margrave of House Maxwell, G.H., understood. Sullivan's head was still lowered, so I couldn't see his expression. The fists clenched on his lap, however, were visibly shaking, surely out of anger and humiliation. Good, very good. You have finally realized your mistakes, haven't you? The move I tried on the royal palace was really worth it. Ha ha ha, let's do away with the formalities and have some tea, shall we? I'm going to brew some for you. I felt a weight was taken off my chest and was in very good spirits as I took the teapot. The man who insulted the Margrave house as country bumpkins was now shaking and lowering his head to me. It was a joy to see and experience. I had been working for this since the engagement breakup events. All in order to drag down this ignorant son of royalty, make him crawl in the mud, and step all over him. That's all folks. With this my debt is repaid. Feeling all merry and light-hearted, I personally made tea for the guests. Th thank you very much. Baron Noms took the cup with shaking hands and took a sip. He couldn't endure the atmosphere. Probably. The teacup clattered against his teeth. I wondered if he was even tasting the tea. Sullivan, on the other hand, was still there with his head hanging down and wouldn't even touch the cup. Ooh, delicious. This tea comes from the Trafalgar region in the south, doesn't it? The exclamation of cheer came from Cranoms. Of the three guests, one not only enjoyed the tea, 
but even guessed where it came from. Ooh, you can tell? Yes, the pleasant temperature and climate there make it possible to raise high quality tea leaves. It's easy to tell. I enjoy them too, though I have never drunk fine ones such as these, naturally. Ha ha ha, I love these leaves too. Here, have another cup. Gladly, thank you. Cray and I had a delightful chat while enjoying the tea. I repaid my debt to Sullivan and even made a new tea friend. Today was a really fruitful day. W well then, we shouldn't impose on the young master's hospitality too long, we should be going now. Baron Noms waited for the conversation between me and Cray to die down and proposed they should leave. Naturally, he couldn't wait to get out of this situation. It would be pointless to keep them, so I accepted. I see. Thank you and sorry for chatting so long, Cray. Oh no. I enjoyed myself very much. Thank you for the tea. Let's drink again sometime. I have some good wine from the Empire. That will be an honor, young master. Until next time then. Yes, farewell. Cray and I said our goodbyes. Normally, guests would then simply leave. One of them, however, still hadn't stood up from his seat. Hey, it's time for us to go. Sullivan? And that guest was Sullivan. Even if the Baron, who had stood up already, nudged him to go. He wouldn't move an inch. Sullivan, come on. After his father-in-law nudged him several more times, Sullivan finally stood up, slowly. He weakly wobbled towards me, a face pale like a ghost. There was no more humiliation in his expression. His eyes, void of all life, showed something like regret and obsession. Sir, Dinger, Maxwell. What? Sullivan's sudden change made me wary he was up to something. I replied while gripping the hilt of my sword. I prudently waited for his next move, ready for anything to happen. But Sullivan's words took me completely by surprise. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry for taking your fiancé. I'll apologize as much as you want. I'll do anything you want, so let me be the crown prince again. You what? I was so surprised my body bent backward. W what has gotten into you? Baron Noms was equally surprised. He shouted as if he had been bitten by something out of the blue. I cannot endure it anymore. The baron's household or this province. All my life, I was raised to be the king and nothing else. I was never taught how to live as a penniless baron in the countryside. As if something very important had snapped in his head, Sullivan's expression now showed nothing but insanity. It hasn't even been a long time since you married into the baron's family. You are quite frail aren't you? I sighed out of pity. I did think that, sooner or later, he would come crying to me, but to think that he would do so at this time, if this guy becomes king, this country is done for. I had him kicked out of the royal family to teach him a lesson, but I guess it was a move much wiser than I expected. As I was relishing such thoughts, Baron Nom started yelling at Sullivan. What foolishness do I have to hear? This forsaken marriage has been registered already. The ceremony is next week. For heaven's sake, how can you think you could return to being the crown prince at this point? What would you do about Selina? Anyway, say, Selina. Sullivan started mumbling after hearing the name of his beloved. After looking around helplessly for a while, Selina, I, I'll return her to Sir Dinger. Wah, are? Yet again, Sullivan said something unbelievable. Baron Nom's expression turned severe, naturally, so did mine. Despite all the ruckus he raised about true love, now that he was in trouble, he betrayed her in a heartbeat. He was truly nothing but scum, both as a man and as a human being. Even if our relationship was no more, it was still irritating to see my ex fiance being treated as lightly as that. Baron Noms had been rendered speechless, in his stead. Cray raised his voice. Sullivan, do you even realize what you're saying? Cray's nonchalant attitude was no more. He was now sharply glaring at Sullivan. I, I mean, it's not like I can help it. Rebuked by his brother-in-law, Sullivan faltered a little but quickly started making excuses again. I never thought it would come to this. It was just a little slip, both getting with Selena and dumping Marianne. So why do I have to put up with all this? It was just one mistake. One. I worked hard since I was a kid to become the king, and it's all over because of one mistake? It doesn't make sense. That was definitely what Sullivan honestly thought. Because of a temporary whim, a fickleness of the heart, he ended up causing a whole commotion, a rush decision based on a crush. 
It certainly wasn't a rare event during youth. I also had rather embarrassing feelings towards Eliza in the past. Nevertheless, Sullivan, however, had caused too much trouble for too many people in this commotion. The fact that a provincial margrave and a duke's families were the victims was the worst thing that could happen to him. If only he had kept the engagement breakup private. It might have been possible to pretend nothing happened. Now that the scandal has spread, there is no going back. Even if Sullivan's words had the tiniest shred of truth to them, not one of the people present would be moved by them. No one could turn back the hands of time, after all, just one mistake. Yes, I suppose that's true. Why yes, that's right. Do you understand? Sullivan's face turned bright after hearing me agree. You are a fool. I guess it might not make sense to lose everything after one single mistake. But all this whining is not becoming of someone that is supposed to stand above others, eh? Someone that stands above others, be it a king or a local lord, sways the fates of many with a single decision. Retainers, soldiers, citizens, the lives of many depends on a single decision from them. A single mistake might cause a whole country to fall into ruin, depending on the circumstances. Someone that minimizes the importance of his decisions as a single mistake isn't fit to be the king. Uh, R, A. Sullivan probably failed to grasp the meaning of my words, as he just mumbled incoherently. There is no cure for stupidity, realizing that these words were proven true just before my eyes, my lips twisted. Well, putting aside the difficult words, filthy scum like you is never going back to the royal family, it's for this kingdom's sake. What? I'm a bastard too, but you're worse, just give up. Sullivan finally appeared to understand what I meant and turned beet red. I, I even bowed my head to you. I, the crown prince, you're not the crown prince anymore, right? It's time to face reality son-in-law of a baron. Why you? Sullivan's hand went to the sword at his waist. My eyes narrowed, and I exhaled sharply. He hasn't realized his position yet, has he? This is hopeless. I guess I should just kill him. I decided to end the life of the foolish man before me. Sullivan had been disinherited but was still of royal descent. If I killed him, there would definitely be a heavy penalty from the royal family. However, we were in the eastern province the area under the influence of House Maxwell, it would be all too easy to have one person's whereabouts become unknown, there were plenty of reasons why a demoted crown prince would mysteriously disappear, so we had plenty of excuses we could use with the royal family. Anyway, I didn't even need to draw my sword against scum like him, I just needed one arm to kill a snotty brat who hadn't stepped on a battlefield his whole life. I prepared a palm thrust to take care of his throat first. When? Please forgive you 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 us. Bah. How? Baron Noms prostrated himself. He grabbed Sullivan's and Cray's heads, pushed them to the floor, and rubbed them against it too. Please forgive my son-in-law's terrible disrespect. His lack of learning is all my responsibility. Please take my head in his stead. Ooh. A prostration that was as dazzling as ever. To think I would see such incredible prostrating in such a short span of time. My deepest apologies, my lord. My brother-in-law is regretting what he did. As you can see, so please grant us your forgiveness. Gba, ga, g. Why you little, gay, thud, 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 thud. Cray smashed Sullivan's head against the floor, over and over and over. Eventually. He started spraying blood from his face every time he raised it, as he gradually lost consciousness. Ha ha ha. Out of respect for such an excellent apology, I will forget about what happened today. Well, how can I say this? Good luck to you. Our deepest gratitude to you, my lord. We are grateful from the bottom of our hearts. Whoops. Gay. Cray gave one powerful final push to Sullivan's head. It was probably the coup de grace to his consciousness. The pitiful former crown prince stopped moving completely. Oh my, looks like my brother-in-law drifted off to sleep because of fatigue. He was surely nervous because of meeting the young master. That cannot do. We should take our leave quickly, lest we bother the young master. Take care, both of you. The noms duo exhibited perfect coordination as they lifted Sullivan's body and left the Maxwell residence. Despite how little they resembled each other, 
There apparently was a great affinity between them. I felt that what I did ended up inconveniencing them too and regretted it a little. Chapter 8 We met in the fairy tale. Point of view, Selena Noms. Today is my wedding day. I was sitting by myself in the bride's waiting room. There was no one else in the room. The maids left as soon as they finished helping me don the dress. The dress I was wearing was the same one my mother wore for her wedding. Ever since I was a child, I always dreamed of wearing my mother's dress for my own wedding. Several years after that, my dream had finally come true. My heart, however, was mired in deep, dark sadness. Why did things turn out like this? I was supposed to be happy, to be celebrated by everyone, to become one with the person I loved, to reach a happy ending like in the fairy tales. However, reality was different. More than half of the invitation letters I sent to my friends and acquaintances were returned to the sender, the seal still unbroken. Even the maids who made preparations for the ceremony looked like they were just putting up a front and did not wish me well from their hearts. Where did I go wrong? The answer to that question was clear, but my heart refused to accept it. What did I do wrong? Where did I stray off the right path? I recalled my life until now. Section. Ever since I was a little girl, I always wanted to become a princess. A princess just like in the picture books my late mother read to me. My mother was crippled by sickness even before she gave birth to me. As long as I could remember, she was confined to her bed. Father desperately sought a cure for her, desperate enough to even borrow money from Lord Maxwell, but could not find anything in the end. I loved my mother and often slipped inside her bed, begging her to read me stories. Thinking about it now, that might have worsened her condition. But mother always listened to my requests, even when she was feeling worse than usual. Don't worry, Selena, one day a prince will come for you. My mother used to tell me that every time she finished reading a picture book, patting my head. The words don't worry were what my mother said to convince herself, maybe. Mother probably felt she wouldn't live the day to see me grow up. So she said that to dispel her worries about my future. Sometime after my mother's death, a man claiming to be my elder brother came to the house. Father had sired a child with another woman. You're Selena, right? Nice to meet you. I don't know you. A. R. Wait. I always avoided my brother. I couldn't believe father had cheated on mother. Nor could I ever forgive him. I couldn't accept the existence of my brother. Even if the decision came from my father's position as head of the family as my sickly mother could not give birth to a male heir. Even if my mother was aware of my father's infidelity and gave her permission, I could never forgive them. Not my father, nor my brother. Then it happened, father arranged a fiancé for me. Cheers Selena, I have the perfect fiancé for you. I was 13 when I became engaged. He was the successor of the house of Margrave Maxwell, Lord Dinger. I'm Dinger Maxwell. Nice to meet you, Lord Dinger introduced himself in this friendly way. At first, I planned to act disrespectfully towards my fiancé, in order to shame my father. The moment I saw Lord Dinger's face, however, such thoughts completely vanished from my head. Eek, what's wrong? The first thing I felt when I saw Lord Dinger's face was fear. At first glance, Lord Dinger looked like a friendly quiet young man. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something unfathomable, something more beast than human, was hiding inside him. Yes, something like the dragon that kidnaps the princess in the fairy tales. What was the name of that terrible dragon? All black, as large as a mountain. The name of the dragon sent chills down your spine just by saying it. I didn't know why I felt like that, but it might have been because of my mother's blood. Mother was a priestess in the royal capital's sanctuary until she married my father. Lord Dinger has taken the enemy commander's head in the last battle with the Empire. Further talked about Lord Dinger's military exploits. To explain what an incredible person he was. Who would start liking a person because they heard how they killed other people? I wondered. My days of despair started like that. Lord Dinger was apparently aware that just looking at him scared me witless. So he tried to gain my favor by sending me flowers and other gifts any chance he had, to me. However, it looked like the evil dragon was just saying sweet words to the prey closer. Father and even my brother tried to help me and Lord Dinger grow closer. But their actions always had the opposite effect. I hated them both, after all. 
the relationship between Lord Dinger and I never improved. Eventually, the day came when we would go to the Royal Capital and enroll in the Royal Academy section. That day was simply unforgettable. On the day of my birthday, I visited the Academy's rear flower garden. The Academy had a flower garden both in the inner and rear courtyards, but most students visited the inner courtyard's flower garden, as it was larger and close to the Academy buildings. Few people ever visited the rear garden, so it was perfect to think about things on my own. Phew, what should I do with this? I sat on a bench, with a birthday gift I received from my fiancé in my hands. It was a silver bracelet adorned with emerald gems, the same color as my eyes. It's so pretty. Why does he send me such beautiful things, every time? Lord Dinger's presents were always exquisite. If only he sent something completely inappropriate. I could just throw it away, but his presents always matched my tastes so perfectly, so I ended up accepting them every time. How does Lord Dinger know my tastes so well? I was terrified just thinking about it. One more year, the following year, Lord Dinger and I would graduate from the academy. I would then become Lord Dinger's bride. I was scared to death of the day. I didn't want to be with him even for one second. How could I ever spend my life at his side? You, you. tears started falling naturally, trailing on my cheeks and dripping on the bracelet. Ah, eh? I heard someone's surprised voice and raised my head. Finding a man standing there, hair shining much like gold, pearly white skin, eyes as blue as the sky. A noble young man, just like a prince from the fairy tales. He was the kingdom's crown prince, Sullivan Lamperor Ouj. I apologize if I bothered you. I didn't think anyone except me ever visited this garden, you see. And no, I must apologize. Instead, I hurriedly stood up from the bench. But before I could, Sullivan's handkerchief was gently caressing my cheeks. Ah, please, sit down. It is a gentleman's duty to wipe a woman's tears. T that's. I timidly lowered my eyes, but Lord Sullivan smiled softly and continued wiping my tears. Before I realized it, I had already stopped crying. My heart beat like crazy instead. Who would ever think that a low-class noble like me could ever have the chance to speak with the prince? When I saw you, I thought a flower fairy had come to this garden. I ended up shouting in response to Lord Sullivan's words. I hurriedly apologized for my bad manners, but Lord Sullivan's warm smile made me forget everything. I'm the same as you. Actually, when cruel things happen to me and I feel like crying, I always come to this place. Cruel things. I couldn't believe such a perfect looking prince had any troubles. You see, actually, Lord Sullivan then started talking. Surprisingly, his worries were very similar to mine. Lord Sullivan also suffered because of the person he was engaged to. Lord Sullivan's fiancée, Lady Marianne, was a young lady that could be said to be without fault. She was very proud, however, and looked down on other students as she was going to be the future queen, she does not wish to become my wife, all she wants is to be enthroned as queen, to rule over this country, she is just using me for that end, there is no love between us, oh my, that is horrible, Lord Sullivan, you are such a gentle, wonderful person, and yet, why are you forced to marry such a person, you are the only person who ever said something like that to me, Marianne is, yes, like one of those evil witches from the fairy tales. Those words made me feel even closer to him. A perfect fairy tale prince, with the same problems as me. For some reason, it made me really happy. When I revealed my own troubles Lord Sullivan consoled me kindly. I see, we are the same, aren't we? Yes, that was how I met Lord Sullivan. That day onwards, our relationship progressed at a fast pace. My prince finally came for me. This prince will surely slay the evil dragon and save me, or so I fully believed. I believed that there was no way the prince would lose to the dragon, even though I had no proof. Lord Sullivan and I continued to meet secretly in the rear flower garden, deepening our relationship. When we were together, I could feel at peace. A feeling of pure bliss, something I had not felt since my mother died, filled my heart. Our forbidden love, hidden from our fiancés, burned brighter the more we saw each other and eventually passed the point of no return. Lord Sullivan invited me to one of his residences. I went there, avoiding being seen by anyone, and we became one. Selina, I want you to marry me. On the bed, embraced by Sullivan, 
tears flowed from my eyes. His arms, as warm as the sun, filled my body with comfort. His gentle words thawed my frozen heart. Lord Sullivan caressed my head as I wept uncontrollably. Surrounded by his warmth, I replied gladly, my prince section. Eventually, the fated day came. My noble prince set out to slay the evil dragon, Ginger Maxwell. I hereby declare your engagement to Selina Void. Lord Sullivan so announced to Lord Dinger. Lord Dinger expanded on how breaking an engagement was something unjust, but Lord Sullivan faced him without fear. He was just like a brave hero armed with his holy sword. His forceful words dispelled all fear from my heart. I never thought I could ever see the day when I could speak my true feelings to my terrifying fiancé. The cancellation of the engagement is accepted. For the time being, we shall contact the royal house officially in the near future. When I heard Lord Dinger's words, tears of happiness started streaming down my cheeks. I was finally released from the grip of that monster of man. I was free at last. Selina. Lord Sullivan, I am so happy. We embraced each other without regard for the people watching, the garden was crowded, everyone was looking at us but it mattered little to me, I will bring you happiness, Selina, I will never let you go, never, Lord Sullivan, Lord Sullivan, I love you, Lord Sullivan, it all felt like a dream, like the ending of our fairy tale, the evil dragon had fallen before the brave prince and the princess was rescued, the two became one and lived happily ever after, section, the time of bliss, which I thought would last forever, ended immediately instead. So, is that all you have to say, Lord Sullivan? Ah, no, I, we were overjoyed by Lord Dinger's unexpectedly quick acceptance of the broken engagement, but it did not last long. Words as chilling as cold water rained upon us. Lord Sullivan's fiancée, Lady Marianne Rose Eyes. Before her, Lord Sullivan, who was a noble fairy tale prince just moments ago faltered and wavered. Lady Marianne, surrounded by people, probably her servants, looked down at the fearful Lord Sullivan from her seat, as if she was utterly bored. I had heard from Lord Sullivan about Lady Marianne's awful personality, but I did not expect her to be such a harsh person. Lord Sullivan accused Lady Marianne of mistreating me, pointing out the rumours that she made secret connections with the Empire and more. I had never heard such rumours nor was I ever treated badly by her, it was my first time meeting Lady Marianne, after all, I was surprised and looked at Lord Sullivan, but he did not spare a glance at me, I am afraid all of this is simply ridiculous, did I make secret connections with the Empire, do you have any evidence, there was no evidence, of course, Lord Sullivan's excuses were all made on the spot, it was clear that there was no truth in them, Lady Marianne sighed helplessly, then started preaching endlessly about how Lord Sullivan's conduct was unfit for his title of the Crown Prince. When Lord Sullivan was completely devastated, Lady Marianne said her last words. You wish to annul our engagement, yes? That is fine. Let our relationship end here and now. Lord Sullivan's expression turned brighter. The words that followed, however, froze it again. I shall duly inform my father, the Chancellor, about Lord Sullivan's infidelity and your false accusations towards me as well. Rest assured I shall spare no details. Please prepare to receive a fitting punishment for your actions. I trust you do not believe you will be king without the support of House Rose Eyes, yes? Ah, uh, er, uh, T that's. Lord Sullivan was visibly shaken and could not speak clearly. My beloved prince was troubled and cornered so I overcame my fear and managed to speak. L. Lady Marianne, Lord Sullivan is the crown prince. Your words overstep your bounds. Do you know who you are talking to? Those of lower rank should not speak to those of higher rank, as the unspoken rule of high society goes. Shame on you, you miserable daughter of a baron. Whipped by Lady Marianne's harsh words, I shook in anger. She's really an evil witch. Just like Lord Sullivan said, I, I am Lord Sullivan's lover. Ah, you're the mistress. How filthy. F. Filthy. No, that's, I would have cared nothing about whatever you two did after my engagement with His Highness was broken, until proper procedures are taken, however, we are engaged. I have no ears to be soiled by the words of a woman who would lust after an engaged man. Do not speak another word if you please. H. How can you say something so cruel? What did I ever do to you? What did you do? Well, 
I suppose you should tell me where you went in the evening two days ago. You left a request to spend the night outside the dormitory, did you not? Ah, Lady Marianne's words left me frozen too. It was the day Lord Sullivan and I became one for the first time. Did you perhaps take me for an ignorant fool? Margrave Maxwell's heir was unaware of your relationship, apparently. But that is only because he only exhibited the least possible interest in your affairs. Did you really think your childish attempts to conceal your tryst would deceive the eyes of House Rose Eyes? Ah, uh, I, that's, but, I planned to overlook everything if it was meant to be a trifle, but now that things turned out like this, I will have no mercy. I have enough evidence for your infidelity, which I shall submit to the attention of His Majesty the King. How long will His Majesty protect you before he must abandon you? That will be something to see. Lord Sullivan and I were both too shocked to move. Our relationship was exposed since who knows when. We had been found out, just left alone. If you will excuse me. Then, oh, and, goodbye. My former fiancé. W. Wait. Oh no, I shan't do that. I have no duty to obey your words anymore. Lord Sullivan attempted to cling to Lady Marianne nonetheless, but her servants stopped him. Lady Marianne thus left her graceful manners never leaving her person even a moment. Her noble and proud silhouette made me think for a moment that she was the perfect image of a queen. Worried, I took Lord Sullivan's hand. The hand that caressed my head so gently when we were in bed together was now trembling ever so slightly. Lord Sullivan, it's all right, don't worry. Selina, I'll protect you no matter what. Father will never abandon me, so don't worry. Lord Sullivan's face was stretched thin his eyes wide open and bloodshot. He talked as if he wanted to convince himself more than me. The noble prince that bravely faced off Lord Dinger was completely gone, leaving a husk filled with worry, fear, and traces of regret. He was a fairy tale prince no more, but a very realistic figure of a man driven to desperation. My heart, on the other hand, was filled with concern for a future I could not predict any more. Section. What awaited us next was fall after fall. Before we could do anything, Lord Sullivan was removed from the royal register and forced to marry into the Noms house. Father and brother condemned Lord Sullivan and me, because of us, Margrave Maxwell now viewed the Noms with disfavor. After marrying into my family, Lord Sullivan was at first confident that he would soon return to the royal family and send many letters to His Majesty the King and his friends among powerful nobles in the royal capital. However, Lord Sullivan gradually grew irritated by the fact that no reply ever came and eventually started yelling at me. The gentle prince was nowhere to be seen. No, maybe this was Lord Sullivan's true self. If only you didn't exist. I pretended not to notice glimmers of such feelings in Lord Sullivan's eyes and continued living while interacting with my father and brother as little as possible. Then today eventually came. I was going to become Lord Sullivan's bride, the bride of a man who lost everything. A bride not blessed by her family, friends, or anyone else. Lady Selina, the preparations for the ceremony are complete. This way, please. Yes, I'm coming. I replied to the maid who came to call me and stood up from my chair, the beautiful dress left by my beloved mother. The pure white dress I dreamed of wearing now seemed soiled by invisible, indescribable stains. Chapter 9 Puberty is awkward for both parent and child. Margrave Maxwell Manor, study. I was sitting at the desk, looking at documents, a rarity for me. I was more of an outdoor person, even for work, I usually preferred to be in the field giving orders directly, not everything could be done that way, of course, so sometimes I took care of the paperwork presently in the study, there were only two people, me and my father, the current Margrave Maxwell, it felt somewhat awkward working alone with my father, I had nothing to talk about with him and the mood was kind of tense, further seemed uncomfortable too, I found him glancing my way a few times while we worked. He could have gone ahead and spoken up if he had something to say, but apparently he found it as difficult as me to find a topic. The awkward mood was finally disrupted when a third party entered the study. Excuse me, my lord, young master. The third party was the house steward. He usually called me Lord Din, like he did when I was a child, but, when I worked, he would use the term young master. I have presently returned. I apologize for making you wait. Yes. 
Thank you for your hard work. My father, looking very relieved, greeted the house steward. The house steward had participated in the wedding ceremony of house noms in my stead. The wedding ceremony of young lady noms and Lord Sullivan was held without a hitch. They were extremely pleased by the congratulatory presents and entrusted me with a return gift as well. I see, good to know that everything went well. My father sighed in relief. Naturally, I had reported everything about Sullivan's rampage when he came to visit. Sullivan had gone so far as to say he'd give his fiancée, Selina, back to me. Father was surely worried whether he would actually be in the ceremony. Excellent, like the old man said. How did the ceremony go? The house steward nodded and started explaining. The close relatives of house noms all participated in the ceremony, but house Efrita, house Silthys, house Undine, and other direct retainers of house Maxwell were not present. Well yeah, I suppose they wouldn't. What about the nobles from the capital? Some friends of Lord Sullivan were present, but they were all counts or lower ranked nobles. Duke and Marquis houses only sent messengers, apparently. I see. The royal family's powerful nobles had completely abandoned Sullivan then. About the same time as Sullivan and Selina's marriage was officially registered, the royal family announced that Sullivan's younger brother, the second-born prince, was the new crown prince. The reason why Sullivan was removed from his position as crown prince was not that he picked a fight with House Rosies and House Maxwell but embellished as he found true love. According to the royal family's announcement, Sullivan had fallen in love with a low-rank noble. A forbidden love between a man and a woman already engaged to others. In order to be with his true love, Sullivan voluntarily relinquished his title of the crown prince and cut all ties with the royal family. Moved by their pure love, House Rosies and House Maxwell gave their blessings to their union. Thus Sullivan married into the house of Baron Noms, or so the announcement said. Duke Rosies wrote the plot, I guess. It's almost admirable how they can serve the royal family, despite being betrayed like that. I silently praised Duke Rosies, a model of nobility in my eyes, then crossed my arms and thought out loud, now there's zero chance for Sullivan to ever return to the royal family. Will that unstable fool accept this situation though? You talk as if you have nothing to do with it, that all happened because you pushed him too hard, didn't it? Further sighed hopelessly and rebuked me. He picked a fight with me first. Without proper retaliation, the Maxwell House's reputation would have suffered, wouldn't it? My fiancé was snatched away and I was humiliated in public. If I just sucked it up and did nothing, it would look like the Maxwell House was the royal family's lapdog. Even if the royal family was superior in rank. We needed to show that they couldn't just do anything they wanted. Besides, looking at the results, I'm pretty sure it's a good thing that guy isn't the crown prince anymore. If he became king, the country would definitely fall in chaos. I know that much. Father shook his head even more hopelessly, then continued. What I want to say is that there was no need to force him on the Noms house. If that wretched imbecile becomes the next Baron Noms, the province will definitely suffer wretched imbecile. The old man sure had a way with words too. Well, after knowing of Sullivan's recent rampage, I suppose it would be normal to describe him like that. I agree completely about that. Having him marry into the noms could have been shallow thinking on my part. I spread my arms wide and expressed agreement with my father's words. Father was rubbing his temples, as if trying to suppress a headache. I made him worry. His hair will get even whiter than before. I looked at my father's pate and regretted giving him more things to worry about. A little, I had no intention of troubling my father, nor did I wish the eastern province to fall into disarray. So I was honestly sorry that my actions resulted in this outcome. Anyway, don't worry about it, father. I have an idea about how to deal with Sullivan. I sowed the seeds, so it was time to reap them. To be perfectly honest. Now that I had dragged him off the crown prince throne and tossed him into the baron house, I had little interest left in Sullivan, but I had to carry out my responsibility until the end. What are you plotting this time? Lord Din, please do not overdo it. Ha ha, don't call me that when I'm working, it's alright. I won't overdo anything, nor will I trouble the old man this time. I meant to ease their concerns, 
but both the house steward and further looked even more apprehensive than before. They don't trust me one bit, huh? Oh well, you really don't need to worry, okay? I'm not going to do anything complicated. If Sullivan acts in a way fitting to his current status, then okay. If he doesn't, then I'll just do what my position as the Margrave heir compels me to. I am just going to give Sullivan a test of loyalty to see if he's fitting to become a noble of the eastern province. Is that so? Anyway, I leave it all to you. And you will not regret that you did. You might as well leave those documents to me too. I already finished my share. I took the documents from my father's exhausted hands and continued doing my job as the Margrave's heir. There was still some time left before a new commotion struck the eastern province of the Lamparoo Kingdom. Chapter 10 the nightlife is rife with peril. The largest city in the Maxwell Territory was the district capital, Avalon. Located in the heart of the territory, Avalon was a city of two faces. One was its daytime face, as the largest commercial district of the eastern provinces. It housed a market frequented by traders coming and going from the central, northern, and southern provinces. The market was also crowded with merchants from the eastern province, looking to find new goods, and the local people as well, so it was bustling like a festival every day. The city's other face appeared at night. As the sun set, the taverns and brothels opened their doors. On the street, you would start seeing wobbling drunkards and women inviting men to follow them into their alleys. Torches burned brightly on streets filled with the smell of perfume and alcohol. I walked through the streets of this Avalon, heading towards a certain back alley. I knew the path all too well, after walking it so many times, so I had no need for a guide. The district I was in now had turned into a slum, so you could see vagrants and hungry orphans here and there, as bleak as ever. The district capital appeared crowded and bustling in the main streets, but one step beyond them revealed a desolate environment. The back alleys were the places left behind by the urban development, where people that barely made enough to live the next day gathered. Every time I visited this place I felt as if sharp thorns of ice pierced my chest. As part of the ruling class, I felt responsible. It's not like the old man's policies are failing either. No matter how many public institutions we raise and jobs we give to the poor, there's always people that fall into ruin. Some ruin themselves with alcohol or women. Some gamble until they drown in debt. Some are cheated out of their fortunes. No matter how able the Lord was, how much he loved and treasured the people, there were always those who fell to the pits of society. There was no point mulling over it. I knew that in my head, but. We have to do something about the kids, at least build a new orphanage, make sure they can get a minimum level of education, can't do anything without money. I proceeded through the back alleys without hesitation, while I grumbled to myself. I came to visit a man who lived in these slums. It was already late at night, definitely not the right time for a lord's heir to walk around on his own, but no one from the manor stopped me, thinking that I was going to a brothel anyway. Should I take that as trust or irresponsibility? That's the problem. I was going out for a very serious reason, but everyone thought I was just seeking pleasure, which was kind of irritating. The person I was going to meet was not someone I could see in public, so it was necessary to act in secret. Why do they have to live in a place like this? Anyway, that's what I don't get about these underworld types. I suddenly felt a presence and stopped in my tracks. Looks like I have a guest. Someone was hiding in the surroundings. It was definitely not someone from the slums, a sticky, heavy aura of killing intent permeated from them. It was the typical aura of an assassin, something I had learned to recognize after years of experience. Just my luck, if I have to play at night, I only wanted to do it with pretty girls, though. I turned a corner and arrived at an empty plot. There weren't any vagrants round luckily. It was the perfect spot to go a little wild. I blew out the flame in the lamp I was carrying and put it on the ground. The only remaining illumination was the moonlight, but I could see fairly well in the dark, so that wasn't a problem for me. I drew the sword at my waist and asked a question to the darkness. Ready and waiting here, what about you? The answer came in the form of an arrow. I dodged it without much effort and a second, third one followed. There. As I continued dodging the arrows, I felt a presence overhead, 
Take Theus, a man jumped down from the building next to the vacant plot. The arrow attacks were meant to lead me here, apparently. What are you doing? Shouting during an ambush, third rate trash. Gah. I quickly dodged the man's dagger and slashed his head clean off. I then caught the dagger falling from his hand and threw it in the source of the arrows. Gah. Bingo. Who's next? I doubted they actually answered my call. But two men armed with swords appeared from the front, then one with an axe from the back, attempting to pincer me. You de -e. The two swords from the front came first. I leaned to the side and slipped through the opening between them. What? Come on here. Gua. I pulled one of the men's hands to make him lose his balance, then circled behind him and kicked his back. I kicked him exactly in the direction of the axeman who was aiming to strike me from behind but ended up splitting his comrade's head in two. Don't think half-assed teamwork like that is ever going to work on me. After taunting the aggressors, I cut down the other swordsman. Only the axeman remained. D damn you. Wait. You. The axeman tossed his weapon to the ground and hightailed it. Surprised by the sudden turn of events, I didn't chase him immediately. You killed your own comrade and now run away? What the hell did you come for then? Aren't you going to avenge them? Shut up. My own life is more important than any of that. Comrades, screw that. While exhibiting almost refreshing selfishness, the man and his presence disappeared into the darkness. It would be fairly dangerous to chase him through pitch black alleys, so I decided to let him go. Ah, damn. I forgot to ask who sicked them on me. I scratched my head as I sheathed my sword. Then reached for the lamp I had left on the ground. <laughs> that very moment, a scream of agony came from the darkness. A scream which, if I heard right, came from the man I had just lost sight of. That wasn't, someone on my side, was it? Correct, I am not your ally. I certainly didn't expect an answer. But I received one from the darkness. It was a light, clear female voice like a breeze blowing through open plains. I heard footsteps coming closer, and eventually, the owner of the voice stepped into the moonlight. Oh, moonlight flower, not bad, not bad. I'm not exactly sure what you mean, but I'll take that as a compliment. I suppose I should say thanks. She was a beautiful woman with silver hair stretching down to her waist. In her hands, she carried a lance. She twisted the handle and pointed the tip of the lance towards me. Every single one of her movements were graceful and refined, almost mystical. I see, going out to play tonight was really worth it. The night was turning out to be more fun than I expected. My lips curved into a feral smile as I pointed my sword to the moonlit beauty. My eyes narrowed as I examined her closely from head to toe. Then I nodded vigorously. She's killed her fair share. No doubt about it. I could not find any real opening in her stance. Her aura made it clear that any hesitation or reckless strike would end up with her lance impaled in your body. She was either a veteran mercenary or a knight. A whole nother level from the guys in black before. Definitely my greatest threat today, or maybe. The woman wore a simple white dress with a leather half plate over it. The dress had long slits that generously exposed her bare legs. Fair pale skin that gleamed in the moonlight. Honestly speaking. She looked terribly appetizing. That's quite the provocative dress you're wearing. Doesn't that get in the way during your assassinations? It was a real pity that she was an assassin. If she was a woman of a different trade, I'd gladly fill her pockets with gold. Her response, however, was pretty unexpected. Oh, please do not misunderstand. I'm not an assassin, but an adventurer. An adventurer? Adventurers were people who explored ancient ruins and other unknown lands dug up treasures, exterminated dangerous beasts, and similar things for a living. There were few such ruins in the Maxwell Territory, so I rarely met any, but in the northern province, where ruins were scattered everywhere, the Guild, an organization created to manage adventurers and their activities, had enough power and authority to rival the state. Last I remember, I'm not a monster. Nor did I do anything to become the target of extermination. Maybe not in this country, but unfortunately I come from the Eastern Empire. The Adventurers Guild there put a price on Ginger Maxwell's head, enough money to buy a castle. Well, isn't that an honor? It turned out the lady was a killer sent by our neighbors, the Empire. The Empire occupied the lands to the north and east of the Lamperor U Kingdom. 
We had several military conflicts in the past. I had participated many times in those battles. I took down famous commanders, more than once, so there was plenty of cause for me to be targeted. The adventurer beauty pointed her lance to one of the corpses sprawled on the ground. Though I must say that I joined forces with those people for the first time today, and I do not know where they come from. They seemed used to ambushes in the dark, so they might be actual assassins. Is that so? Anyway, you killed the guy who ran off earlier, right? Won't that be a problem for you? Even if they aren't adventurers, I thought killing your comrades was taboo in your line of work. I brought up the fact that she killed one of her comrades, but she just laughed. No, that's not a problem, thank you. We were just hired by the same people. They don't qualify as comrades for me. I was actually opposed to this ambush to fight against a renowned warrior such as Dinger Maxwell like this, many against one, hiding in the dark, a complete waste of an opportunity, a waste, you say? I asked with a suspicious frown on my face. Yes, I propose to challenge you to a duel, to face you one by one, in order, though, they didn't even consider it and left me out of any further discussion, so the beautiful adventurer explained with a disappointed tone in her voice, I found her willingness to fight fair and square commendable, but it wasn't an intelligent strategy, despite her calm and collected exterior, could it be that she was just an idiot, well, now it's just you and me, so all's well that ends well, I guess, I took this request because I wanted to fight you, actually, there's no one in the way anymore, so let's cross swords to our heart's content, shall we, I see, so that's your type, there are some people who feel most alive when they fight with their lives on the line, they call them battle junkies, though for me they're just troublesome fools, apparently she was one too, the only thing she was thinking about was fighting me in a duel to the death, personally, I prefer to have my battles with beautiful women in bed, I sighed and expressed my honest opinion, and the lady adventurer replied with a serious look on her face, you can do what you want after you've killed me. I won't be able to resist anymore, so you can just go all out, right? Do you take me for a maniac or something? If I slept with a woman after killing her, I bet I'd have nightmares later. You're difficult, aren't you? You could put up with that much. What? I'm the weird one here? Talking wasn't getting me anywhere, evidently. I exhaled a long breath, then readied my sword in a fighting stance. My blade was then pointed to my opponent's ample bosom. No point in wasting words, huh. Looks like it'll be faster to let our weapons do the talking. I'm going to capture you alive, I'll hit you until you can't move, then drag you to the nearest inn. How interesting. Let's see if you are truly skilled enough to take me alive. Rest assured, I will. I'm Denja Maxwell. Name yourself, Princess of the Night. After I introduced myself, my beautiful opponent bared her fangs, like a lioness targeting her prey. I am Shana Salazar. Let our bodies and souls burn in the joy of battle. The princess of the night, Shana thrust her lance, which I met with my sword. The two weapons clashed loudly, scattering vivid sparks into the darkness. Chapter 11, Magic Lance and Magic Sword. In a vacant lot in Avalon's slums, the sounds of clashing metal echoed repeatedly. Ha! Ha! Ha, ha ha ha, this is so exciting, Dinger Maxwell, glad to hear that, I'm fighting for my life though, just when I thought I had parried the blade coming from the left, she thrust the pole from the right, when I blocked her slashes from above, she attempted a strike from below, Shana's seamless attacks forced me to take a defensive stance, the lance was superior to the sword in two areas, the first was, obviously, the length of its reach, the second was the ability to attack with both of its ends, the blade and the pole. Shana's lance was somewhat shorter than the ones used by soldiers in field battles. Thanks to its reduced length, she could spin it and use centrifugal force to unleash continuous attacks. In the time I took to swing my sword once, Shana could perform two attacks with her weapon's blade and pole. Our speed was more or less the same, which meant that I was at a massive disadvantage in terms of attack frequency. What's wrong? Is this all the Maxwell prodigy amounts to? Shana was probably confident in her superiority, she shouted as she continued attacking, without leaving me any time to regain my balance. Ha! I can't act uncool before a beautiful woman like you. 
Guess I should put in some effort. I dodged Shana's pole strike and used my free hand to perform a palm thrust. My target was the center of Shana's lance. The axis of its rotations. Ka? No matter how fast she spun her weapon, as long as she rotated in a circle, there was an axis about the center. Since the axis did not move, there was no way to evade my strike. Shana took the full brunt of the impact and was knocked backward. Impressive. To see through my lance in such a short time. I excel at finding a woman's vulnerable spots after all. I use the tip of my sword to flick one of the pebbles at my feet, sending it flying. While it was just a pebble, if it hit someone's forehead at that speed, it was enough to knock them out. Wow. Shana hurriedly blocked the attack coming from beyond my sword's range. It was finally my turn. I continued bombarding her with pebbles, without giving her one second of pause. TCH. Ah, you sure are nimble, aren't you? Shana gradually came closer, while parrying my stone bullets. I stepped backward as she did, so the distance between us did not change. I continued flicking stones as I moved. Of course, I wasn't going to get in range of her blasted lance ever again. Ha <laughs> ha. I admit it feels nice to be chased around by such a pretty woman. Gra, damn you and your tricks. Time for a change of plans. Shana stopped parrying the pebbles, retreated a bit, and wielded her lance in a different stance. She looked full of openings at first glance, my stones were hitting her shoulders and legs, but she didn't seem affected. What's going on? I had a bad feeling and concentrated more on her movements. The next instant. I found that my instincts were right on the money. See snake. Whoa. Shana thrust her lance forward and a real snake made of water materialized from the tip. A snake, as thick as an adult man's arm, shot towards me at high speed. I instinctively rolled on the ground to dodge the snake's fangs, and the water creature crashed through the stone wall behind me. That lance, is a magic tool. Indeed. She's my beloved partner, Leviathan. In this world. The mysterious force called magic did not exist anymore, it only appeared in fairy tales and similar stories, magic users were the stuff of legend. More than 1000 years ago, however, magic techniques were widespread. Magic tools, the relics of such an era, were sometimes found in ancient ruins. Magic tools were the last remaining evidence of an era when magic civilizations flourished. In the current age, as the usage of magic was lost, they were considered miracle tools. I found this magic tool myself when I explored ruins in the Empire. Its ability is as you just witnessed. Shana swung her lance twice, sending two water snakes to attack me. TCH. The two snakes attacked me from the left and the right, and I could not dodge completely. One of them grazed my left arm, which started dripping blood. This lance lets me create snakes made of water and send them to attack my enemies. It's just water, in the end, so they're not strong enough to damage metal, but it can destroy stone, or easily rip through someone's neck. Yeah, I feel that all right. Really impressive. My face was twisted in anger. I finally met a breathtaking beauty, but she turned out to be a killer sent to take my life, and was armed with a magic weapon to boot. Insane. You're right. It's going to be hard to take you alive. You make it sound like it'd be easy to kill me. He he he. You sure can make my body and soul burn. I almost want to embrace you and give you a kiss. I'd gladly accept that, any time. Oh, I will. But to your corpse. Shana swung her lance multiple times, creating a water snake each time. Once again, I was forced on the defensive and ran around the slum's vacant plot. Putting more distance between us, however, turned out to work against me. I started running out of breath without finding any opening to counterattack. She really is one hell of a woman. The situation was deadly, but I wasn't really worried. I couldn't counterattack immediately, but I was sure she couldn't continue such a barrage forever. How long are you going to run around? Didn't you want to capture me alive? Nah. I'm fine just running. You're going to collapse any moment anyway. What did you say? Shana's well-formed eyebrows rose. I've fought a few times against magic two losers. I know that you can't just use them forever. Eventually you'll run out of strength. Magic tools fed on the user's physical energy, spirit, and maybe a mysterious energy we didn't know about. You've been swinging that lance a lot already. 
and I know that you're getting tired if you wipe your sweat in that sexy way, anyone could tell. NGH Shana had been swinging her lance with reckless abandon the whole time, but after using its magic tool abilities she started sweating profusely. Judging from the fact that her legs, exposed by the slits of her dress, were clearly sweating too, she had to be fairly fatigued already. I don't even need to attack. I'll just wait till you collapse. Then bring you back home with me. Oh, do you really think you can dodge my snakes until I run out of energy? Yup, without breaking a sweat either. I scoffed and taunted Shana, then pointed a finger at her. The snakes coming out of your lance may look like they can move freely anywhere, but actually they have fixed patterns, right? If you swing the lance down, the snakes come from above. If you swing it from the right, they come from the right too. Basically, they move the same way the lance does. As long as I observe your lance, dodging the snakes is a piece of cake. So you found out. Having an ace up your sleeve doesn't mean anything if you don't take out your opponent immediately with it. If you just keep shooting randomly like that, it's like you're begging me to figure it out. Maybe you need a bit more experience in actual fighting. She probably never fought an opponent skilled enough to dodge the sea snakes repeatedly. Her fighting style was simply too straightforward. Trump cards should be kept hidden till the last moment, but she completely lacked such tactics and schemes. Shana was quiet for a while, then finally spoke. I see. This was a learning experience. Really, you can surrender any time, you know. However, there's a misunderstanding. When did I say that the water snakes were my trump card? This is what you call a trump card. Shana raised her lance high, then swung it down. Then, from the tip of the lance, a water torrent gushed forward. Ooh, face my lance's secret skill, sea serpent. Shana unleashed a massive water dragon the size of a tidal wave such that the water snakes looked puny in comparison. Its size and speed were much greater than the snakes. If you have so much confidence in yourself, try to dodge this. Taste my power to the fullest. Yeah, no way, I can't dodge that. It was physically impossible to dodge such a massive water dragon at this distance. So I had to give up on any evasion attempts. I guess I have no choice, but to cut through it. What? I faced the water dragon directly. Out of my own free will, I jumped into the beast's scaping maw. Are you throwing away your life? No, not really. Here goes. I swung my sword through the air. The blade cut through the water dragon, slicing it in half. T this can't be, Siegfried, the water dragon, cleaved in half by my sword, turned back to mere water, lost all of its momentum and splashed on the ground, the water dragon was now nothing more than a puddle, it did not pose a threat anymore, I used the momentum of my jump and hit the speechless Shana with a flying kick, the, gah, maybe because she had run out of energy after using her magic tool's power to the fullest, Shana couldn't move and my kick hit her squarely in the abdomen, sending her flying. Her lance leviathan fell from her hands and rolled away from her. Your, sword, is a magic tool, too. Shana managed to pull herself up on her feet and squeeze the words out. I told you, you gotta keep your trump card hidden till the very last moment. My Siegfried was a magic tool with the power to cut through any and all forms of magic power. In an age without magic. It was just a very sharp sword, but against opponents armed with magic tools, like Shana, its true ability shone. If you used that sword from the start, you would have defeated me more easily. I couldn't have captured you alive though. I promised, right? I'm going to drag you to an inn. Even disregarding the magic tool's powers, Shana was a master of the lance. If I used my sword to neutralize her sea snakes from the start, she would have simply continued to fight purely with her lance skills. If the battle developed like that, I might have not been able to exhaust her like this and capture her unscathed. I see, so you were holding back from the start. Ha <laughs> ha, so you want to make me yours that badly? I believe you are a woman worthy of risking my life for. Yeah, I must say, it doesn't feel bad to be so sought after. Ah, honestly. That strength of yours is just irresistible. After whispering such words, Shana collapsed on the ground again. She had completely lost consciousness. I put my sword back into the sheath and lifted her body up. <laughs> Lighter than expected, I leisurely observed her body from head to toe, then snorted, satisfied. As excellent as I thought, 
To be able to find women like her is what makes nightlife worth living. Anyway, you might as well come out already. You're there, right? He he he, you found me, sir? A lean man stepped out of the shadows. He was the very reason why I visited the slums at that time of night. You've been there for a while, right? You could have given me a hand there. Sir, please. I could not join a battle of such level with my meager skills. He he. The name of the man I had previously sent to infiltrate the man-eating tiger's bandits was Clown. It was definitely not his real name, but I couldn't care less. I have a new job for you. Do you have time now? Naturally, sir. With the world as peaceful as it is these days, people like me have very little work, unfortunately. Really? Well, first of all, carry my luggage. He? Luggage? I motioned with my chin at Leviathan lying on the ground. I have my hands full. As you can see, pick that up and follow me to the inn. I have to take care of the lady until she recovers. She might have been hurt in the battle, so I had the duty to watch over her very closely and take good care of her, after all. R. He, that's your request, sir? Yeah, for today. That's my top priority. Clown was perplexed, but my answer was firm. No matter what work requests I had, nothing was more important than the beautiful woman's body. I'll contact you another time about the other job, it's nothing urgent anyway. He, is that so? Clown seemed a bit dejected but did not protest as he obediently picked up the lance and followed me. I looked up and noticed that the moon had reached its zenith. This is a really good night. So I whispered, enthralled, as I caressed Shana's beautiful thighs, damp with sweat. Chapter 12. A Maid's Melancholy. Point of View. Eliza. My name is Eliza. I am a servant of House Maxwell, the leader of the nobles in the eastern province. More precisely, the personal maid of Dinger Maxwell, next in line to be Margrave. Then, I'm going out. I'll be back late today. Very well. Please take care, young master. I bowed politely and saw the young master off. I remained bowed while the young master's horse carriage was visible, then finally raised my head after the carriage turned a corner and disappeared from view. As a servant of the house of Margrave Maxwell, as the young master's maid, I always ensured that my conduct was impeccable. The young master went out again somewhere today. One of my recent concerns was that the young master left the manor more frequently than usual. He often returned late and also spent the night outside at times. I also felt that he sought our company less frequently than before, but I was certainly not dissatisfied. On the contrary, I was honestly relieved that he did not make love to me until I passed out. But leaving that aside, Sakaya, are you there? Of course, Miss Eliza. I called Sakaya's name and she appeared out of nowhere behind me. Her presence was difficult to detect. As usual, you could barely hear her footsteps when she walked. I wonder what kind of job she had before she started serving in the Maxwell Manor. There are some unnatural points in the young master's behavior lately. It's possible that, a new woman? Sakuyu apparently shared my prediction. I nodded to her and continued. If you think so too, then you surely know what I want to say. Please leave it to me. Shadowing is my specialty. After all, as soon as she finished talking, Sakuyu vanished into thin air. I looked around to see where she went and found her running at high speed on the manor's walls, while holding up the skirt of her maid uniform with both hands. Her movements are incredible as always. What is that girl, really? Sakuya had been brought to the manor by the young master about three years ago. When she arrived, she had already received the young master's initiation. Only the young master knew what she did before. She was terrible at cleaning or doing laundry, but was exceptionally skilled with blades. She was also very knowledgeable about poison. She also caught a thief that broke into the manor once, using bizarre fighting techniques. She probably used to do a very unique kind of work. But it is not proper to dig into someone's past, is it? Well then, I have to do Sakuya's housework today as well. I went back inside the manor and resumed my duties as a maid. Section. The woman's name was Shana Salazar. Yes, it appears she is Lord Dinger's new lover. Sakuya had returned in the evening. I didn't even hear the door open, but she was suddenly standing behind me. I was so surprised I screamed. She had completed her job successfully, Sakuya reported about the young master's new lover in detail. I see, a killer hired by the Empire, 
That's dangerous. Yes. She is currently living in Lord Dinger's other residence. The young master possessed a residence exclusively for himself in the Maxwell Territory, which he used to house his direct subordinates. The women he could not bring to the Maxwell Manor also lived there, so Shana had become a new member of that group. Should I dispose of her? She appears to be a skilled warrior, but it shouldn't be impossible to poison her. Sakuya casually proposed a very aggressive countermeasure, but I shook my head. No, don't. Let's see how the situation develops for now. Are you really sure? Sakuya was as expressionless as ever, but her voice told me that she was a bit unhappy. Yes. It is not a problem for me if the young master has another woman, as long as she does not prove problematic for him. Of course, for the sake of avoiding any and all misunderstandings, allow me to say that I do not investigate the young master's relationships with women out of jealousy. Sakuya and I are also the young master's lovers, definitely not his wives. Even if the young master starts relationships with other women, we have no right to accuse him of anything. The only reason I make sure all women who approach the young master are thoroughly investigated is to confirm whether they will be dangerous to him. The young master is not always careful when dealing with women, or rather, there are openings in his guard when he does, thus we must support him from the shadows. I recalled past memories and continued. Our young master was shrewd and clever, but he could be naive when women were involved. He apparently did not notice that Lady Selina was cheating on him, so he might end up deceived by an unsavory woman. Until now, Sakuya and I had neutralized several women who tried to get closer to the young master aiming to take control of the Maxwell House's authority or finances. Based on the report, I do not think that Miss Shana will become a threat to the young master. She appears to be the warrior type and someone who does not deceive others. If they fight one-on-one, -on -one, the young master will never be defeated, not even if he holds back because of her beauty. Indeed, even if she is an assassin, I'm sure Lord Dinger will be fine. I couldn't kill him after all, so I doubt any other assassin could. I think I just heard something utterly unforgivable. But I suppose I should pretend I didn't. Yes, I really should. Asking further questions could lead to terrifying developments. Well, in any case, we should move only to prevent the young master from being tricked by honeypots. Let's leave Shana alone for now. Understood. Oh, by the way, Ms. Eliza, I have a good technique to entice Lord Dinger, since contact has been a bit scarce lately. Eh? Please listen. First, you should remove your clothes. Then sit down with your legs tight. Next you take a drink and, as Sakuya taught me her mysterious oriental techniques, I waited for the return of my beloved master once again today. Incidentally, Sakuya's new technique was successful beyond expectation, that night. We were both loved until exhaustion for the first time in a good while. But that is a story for another day. Chapter 13, Fools Never Stop Walking. Point of View Sullivan noms. Shit. Shit. Why? Why did this happen? My name is Sullivan. I am the crown prince of this kingdom. No, I was. The other day, because of a series of mistakes and misunderstandings, I was disinherited from the royal family and ended up having to marry into the family of some penniless baron in the sticks. I was in the room assigned to me in the noms manor, crushing a letter I had just received. The letter was a reply from a friend in the capital after I requested them to help me regain my title as crown prince. I sent 15 such letters but received only 3 replies. All of them said the same thing, I cannot help. Why? Why? Why won't anyone try to help? Were their oaths of loyalty all fake? All my friends had offered their loyalty to me, comrades with whom I swore to make this country a better place. The moment I lost my title of the crown prince, however, they immediately cut off all ties with me. I just couldn't forgive them. Why do I have to go through something like this? It was all because of Maxwell, that murdering psychopath, and my idiot of a wife, Selina. I was engaged with a perfect fiancé once. Her name was Marianne Rosais. She was beautiful, noble, refined, a woman truly ideal as the bride for me. The next king of Lanperor Uge, slightly overwhelmed by her perfection, I made a small mistake and ended up cheating a trifle on her. Yes, it was a really small mistake. A trifling case of cheating. Marianne, however, could not forgive that tiny mistake and really broke our engagement. Thinking about it now, 
I felt that I did not truly want to break our engagement. I simply wanted to confirm her honest feelings towards me. I just wanted to see Marianne cling to me, tears brimming in her eyes while saying please don't leave me, to confirm that she truly loved me. Mine was just a way to see my fiancé's true feelings, something like a prank, and yet, that Dinger Maxwell, that damned Dinger Maxwell, that countryside noble, blew my tiny mistake out of proportion and my relationship with Marianne was ruined beyond repair. If it wasn't for that man's meddling, we would have made peace immediately, the relationship between Marianne and I would have returned to normal so easily. I could still be the crown prince. Selena has her share of the blame too. Despite all my toiling and suffering, she won't say a word to console me, always crying in her room. The woman I married after throwing away everything I had was not, frankly speaking, someone of my standing. She had no rank, no education. Her looks and figure were both severely inferior to Marianne. She was no better in private either. I acted a little rough once and she screamed it hurts. It hurts. Comma killing the mood ever since, now that I had a clearer head, I honestly couldn't remember why I had fallen for her. That time, she must have secretly fed me some strange drug. Could this also be part of Maxwell's plan? It made perfect sense for Dinger Maxwell to use his fiancée to ensnare me, the kingdom's accomplished crown prince, in a trap. I didn't do anything wrong. It's all that man's fault. Shit, 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 shit 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 shit. I slammed my fists on the table and stood up from the chair, filled with indignation. Every time I thought about that man I became furious. I need a drink. I can't put up with this anymore. I violently opened the door and walked toward the entrance. I met some of the manor's servants on my way out, but they did not even greet me as they quickly brushed past me. Irritated even more, I headed out of the manor with angrier, louder footsteps. Are you going on a walk? sir? What? I was about to open the door when a man called to me. He was the house's firstborn son, Cranoms. Where might you be headed, when all your work as the next head of the house is left here? I'm going on an inspection in town. I replied with the least emotion possible. Looking at his face reminded me of the humiliation I was subjected to during our visit to the Maxwell Manor, where he slammed my face against the floor repeatedly. Just you wait, when I'm crown prince again. You're going to pay. I will definitely kill the man before me. So I solemnly swore in my heart. Cray reacted with affected surprise. Oh my, an inspection. That is very admirable. Allow me to advise you to inspect the town also beyond its taverns. TCH, naturally. My destination had been found out. I felt my face redden with shame. Take care on your way back, please. They say that no one cries when a drunkard gets stabbed and dies. Exclamation mark. I barely restrained myself from shouting back at him and opened the door. In exchange, I slammed it shut. Shit. This whole barren house is looking down on me, and it's all Maxwell's fault. I let out a roar of indignation in my heart and left the Nums Manor section. Shit. Shit. God damn it. After I finally reached the tavern, I started downing liquor, glass after glass. I had visited this place several times already. Some of the other patrons seemed to know who I was, though, no one ever had the decency to greet me. They just watched from a distance. I am the crown prince, you lot. The blood in my veins is nothing like yours. Show some proper respect. Damn it all. I was not as foolish as to voice my complaints out loud, but I couldn't keep the words from leaking out sometimes. The people around me distanced themselves even more after hearing me curse. I knew that well enough but couldn't stop it. Shit, shit. Who the hell do they think they are? Give me one more. Sir, do you have enough to pay today? The waiter's helpless tone irritated me even more. I am a noble. You insolent pleb. We do not use your wallets or whatever. Send the bill to house noms. I shouted back at the waiter, who sighed. It is time for you to leave then. The door is that way. What? Who do you think you are talking to? I am the successor of house noms. The waiter's unbelievable disrespect sent my blood boiling. I shouted louder, banging my fists against the table. But the waiter simply looked at me hopelessly. Unfortunately, sir, we have been contacted by that same house noms. We have been informed not to let Sir Sullivan drink for free. 
you may forget about the payment of today's drinks, but could you refrain from coming here again? Hey, are you serious? House noms contacted them? Not to let me drink for free? What lengths will they go to insult me? My anger finally took over completely and I grabbed the handle of the sword at my waist when I felt a sharp voice from behind me. Is there a problem with our waiter, sir? A hand firmly grasped my shoulder, so I turned round and found the hulking figure of the tavern's hired bouncer. Why you shh shameless? Who the hell do you think you are? You damned sponge. Hike. My shoulders shook in surprise and I let go of my sword. The hired guardian dragged me out of the tavern by force, as the patrons laughed loudly. Ha ha ha. Look at that. Pathetic. Serves the guy right for demanding to drink for free, as expected of former royalty. Ugh. The drunkard's taunts stabbed my chest deeply. I never felt so miserable in my life. When did I become so weak? My life of glory and victory. Where did it go to? I was about to leave the place. As the pitiful loser I was, when, gentlemen, I believe that is enough. A merciful hand extended towards me. I raised my head and found an elegantly dressed man. He seemed to be about forty years old. His well-trimmed beard and features gave the impression that he was a member of the cultured elite. He was either a noble or a high-ranked servant of a noble family. In any case, certainly not someone that would frequent such a shabby tavern. Gentlemen. The noble blood of the honored Lamperor royal family runs in the veins of this man. He might have been removed from the royal register, but as vassals of Lamperor Ush have a duty to honor his bloodline. Do you not see that vilifying this man is a shameful act for a son of this kingdom? Ah, yes, but, the drunkards attempted to protest weakly, but the gentlemen shot them a chilling glare. But, what? You have a legitimate reason to vilify the royal family bloodline, I suppose? Ah. No, nothing. The gentleman's words turned the tavern completely silent. He then took out a leather wallet from his breast pocket. This should cover this man's drinks. Please. R. Dot dot a. What about the change? Take it. The gentleman threw several gold coins at the waiter's feet. It was more than enough to pay for ten times what I drank. The gentleman ignored the panicked waiter and approached me. I apologize for my impertinence, Lord Sullivan. Please forgive me. N eh, no, thank you. The gentleman's tone and manners were filled with deference towards me. It was the first time I was treated with respect fitting of royalty ever since I came to the eastern province, so I felt moved to the point of tears. My deepest apologies, my lord. I haven't introduced myself yet. My name is Zale. I work as a royal commissioner in the capital. I am currently staying in this town on certain duties. The gentleman who introduced himself as Zale smiled kindly at me. An acquaintance of mine manages a tavern nearby. Would you care to join me for a drink? Please, allow me the honor to entertain a descendant of the royal family. Oh, yes, I shall allow you to. Wonderful. Wonderful. Please. This way. I followed Zale in a small alley of the tavern district. Chapter 14, Fools Never Stop Sinking. Point of view, Sullivan Noms. I followed Zale deep into the town's back alleys until we reached a small, isolated bar. The place may seem small, but they serve very fine wine. It is the sort of place only connoisseurs frequent, so we will be able to drink in peace and quiet. <laughs> fine. Not bad at all. We entered the dimly lit bar and I noticed there weren't any other clients. A white-haired man was wiping glasses behind the counter. Have a seat here, please. Boss, serve your finest wine to my honored guest. The wine served to me was the very same brand I used to drink often in the capital. I took a sip and the memories of my life in the royal house came flooding back, filling me with nostalgia. Have one more, please. Why yes. Encouraged by Zale. I drank glass after glass of that sweet nectar. Delicious, and so nostalgic. I could drink this every day before. Why did things turn out like this? As I became tipsier and tipsier, I started talking about my dissatisfaction with my present life and my hate towards Dinger Maxwell. Azale listened to every word I said, without the slightest sign of annoyance. What a tragedy you have been through. It pains my heart to listen. When I eventually stopped complaining, Zale waited for the best timing to console me. A tragedy, indeed. You are right. I could let out my frustration for the first time in a long while. It had been months since I last felt so light. 
I continued drinking heartily and the alcohol pleasantly took over my whole body. The rumors were true then. Ginger Maxwell does not see the royal family with due respect. Yes, that man is not worth his title of noble. I have heard that the most powerful nobles of the four houses tend to act in a hostile way towards the royal house. If such a situation is left unattended, they will look down on the royal house more and more, eventually creating a hotbed for rebellion. Something must be done to preserve the future of the kingdom. But, you are perfectly right, but what could be done? I held my chin deep in thought, the problem did not affect only me anymore, if that treacherous country bumpkin was allowed to act freely, the kingdom's future would be in grave danger, yes, if that man isn't eliminated, this country will fall into ruin, this must be done now, for the sake of the Lamparor U kingdom, somehow, if we could eliminate Dinger Maxwell, have him assassinated, maybe, it was only after saying those words that I realized their gravity, I had definitely said too much, if someone heard me, I could be the one eliminated instead. I hurriedly looked around, but luckily there were no other clients in the bar. The owner had also disappeared in the back of the store, so my careless words were heard only by Zale. I am sorry, forget everything I said, no, I cannot possibly do that, as I do believe that is an excellent idea. D do you think so? I didn't expect him to agree, I looked at Zale surprised, and found the completely serious expression on his bearded visage. Assassination, yes. To free these eastern lands from those imbeciles, it might be necessary to take such extreme measures. Why yes, I think so. The fact that Zale agreed made me more convinced that it was really true. I tried imagining that man collapsed on the ground, wounded and bloody. I would feel so relieved. If only the death of Dinger Maxwell would also mean that the rift between the royal family and the Maxwell house would be no more. Consequently, your path of return to the capital, Lord Sullivan, would open by itself. There might also be the possibility of you becoming the next Margrave Maxwell. Me? Inherit the Maxwell house? That cannot be. Even if the next in line for the Margrave title died, I couldn't believe that the position would be turned over to me. No, there is a possibility. Lord Sullivan, there wasn't the slightest trace of joking in Zale's tone. Calmly, he started explaining in detail. The current Margrave Maxwell does not have any children other than Dinger. It appears that his wife lives far away and I have never heard of him entertaining any lovers. There is also no one among his close relatives of suitable age to succeed him. In other words, if Dinger Maxwell dies the Margrave will have no choice but to adopt an heir from another house. I can understand that. But would the Margrave ever choose me? I was well aware that there was no way Lord Maxwell saw me in a good light. He did not come to my wedding ceremony with Selina. But more than that, who would ever choose the man that snatched your legitimate son's fiancé? It all depends on how you choose to see things, my lord. Among all male offsprings of the eastern provinces noble families, no one surpasses your lineage. Lord Sullivan, not even Lord Maxwell can afford to ignore the royal family's bloodline, if you put it like that. In addition, if you become the next Margrave Maxwell, the eastern provinces would fall under the influence of the central government, a development that the royal family and House Rose Eyes would find extremely appealing. They would definitely provide support on all fronts for Lord Maxwell to adopt you as his heir. I see. The more I heard about it, the more it seemed like a very good prospect. They threw me in these remote provinces, so I would pay them back by becoming the ruler. I was going to gain enough power to rival both the royal family and House Rose Eyes. When I became the next Lord Maxwell, even House Noms, who dared treat me like dirt, would bow their heads to me like slaves. But more than anything else, I could take away the most precious thing promised to Dinger Maxwell. The man who stole everything from me. It was music to my ears. How can we find an assassin? I felt more and more invested in the plan, so I started to ask about it in concrete detail. Unlike the time I was part of the royal family, I had no connections to hire assassins at present. Zale then came closer and whispered something in my ears. Lord Sullivan, have you ever heard of those called Fangs of Steel? When I heard the name I couldn't help but frown. You can't be serious. That's only a legend. 
isn't it? Fangs of Steel was the name of a fabled band of assassins, rumored to be in the Lamperor U Kingdom for more than 50 years. Some said they were heartless killers without a fixed leader who would kill anyone provided they were paid enough. Some said they were behind most if not all assassinations of important figures in the kingdom and would murder even members of the royal family without hesitation. Others said its members were not human beings, but man-eating demons alive since the age of magic civilizations. Because of these unbelievable rumors, they were something parents used to make their children behave. If you do bad things, the fangs of steel will catch you and eat you whole. Indeed, rumors are rumors. There's a lot of nonsense flying around. Zale first expressed agreement, then continued, However, my lord, while the rumors might be overblown, the fangs of steel really exist. Please keep this to yourself, but, I actually have a way to contact them. What? If you so wish, Lord Sullivan. I could introduce you. I couldn't believe my ears. I thought the fangs of steel were the stuff of legend, like dragons or the like. Even if I was told they were real, I couldn't just accept it. Oh, please forgive me, my lord. I understand your feelings of doubt. Someone as wise and noble as you, Lord Sullivan would never believe the words of a man you met today for the first time, I suppose. R, N, no, I did not mean that. My deepest apologies, truly. Please forget my drunken ramblings. <coughs> Zale ended the conversation and took a sip from his glass. His words, however, wouldn't leave my thoughts, unless Ginger Maxwell is guild. I cannot escape my current situation. Can I? Am I going to end my life as the heir of House Noms? I the crown prince, reduced to a mere baron. That cannot be allowed. Even if I had to rely on a fairy tale, I had no intention of spending the rest of my days in these provinces, I might not have the chance to step foot in the capital again. How could I ever accept such a life? Zale, my good man, could you let me know about that more in detail? Lord Sullivan, I cannot possibly entrust the eastern province to a dangerous individual like Dinger Maxwell. This country is not for someone like that to play with. The words I pronounced next sealed my fate forever. Dinger Maxwell must die. In order to do that, I will do anything I can, even rely on fairy tales. At that time, I did not have the slightest idea of how that decision would affect my future. Chapter 15 the Lance Maiden is relatively easy. HNN. Ha. Ya. Ha. Phew. Ha. Mile per hour. The silver haired beauty, Shana continued swinging her lance. The lance she was wielding now was a wooden one, so it was not lethal per se, but, if it struck a critical spot, it could still cause bone fractures. Each one of her strikes was meant to defeat the opponent before her, but I dodged all of them relatively casually. And that's all, folks. Ka. I waited for the perfect timing to grab the lance's handle with my left hand and pull it towards me, as I thrust the wooden sword in my right hand to her neck. Game over, I win again. Ah, I lose again. I announced my victory, and Shana let go of her lance, slumping down on the ground. Her eyes brimmed with tears. She was two years older than me, but her expression in these moments was kind of childish and lovely. The place we used for our sparring much was the garden of my private residence. After our moonless duel in the slums, I took the unconscious Shana back to a nearby inn. There I tended to every nook and cranny of her body, with utmost care, and finally let her go. I had already fully enjoyed my privileges as the victor, so I had no intention of restraining her any further than that. So if she said she would return to the Empire, I would not try to stop her. How can I go back like this, with my tail between my legs? I demand another duel. Shana, however, only requested another contest. Maybe it was her warrior's pride, or maybe she just hated losing, but she challenged me again, unaffected by how thoroughly I had had my way with her. I wasn't keen on having a duel to the death with someone I had slept with, naturally, so I set some conditions for our next duel. Condition 1. The duel will be conducted with wooden weapons for mox battles and killing the opponent was forbidden. Condition 2. If Shana Salazar wins a mox battle, Dinger Maxwell will face her again, with actual battle weapons and at full power. Condition 3. If Dinger Maxwell wins a mox battle, Shana Salazar will serve him as subordinate and lover for one month. This was my twentieth win in a row, 
Isn't it time you give up? At this rate you're not going back to the Empire in this life. I then tossed the wooden lance at her feet. I had already won twenty times, so Shano would have to serve me for almost two years. Since I could keep a beautiful master of the lance at my side in a completely honorable manner, the duels were nothing but a blessing for me. You should have realized already that you'll never defeat me with these conditions. MGH. I talked down to her on purpose, and Shana looked away from me, pouting. After all, the conditions of the duel put me at a clear advantage. In our duel in the slums, Shana cornered me more than once. That wasn't because our fighting skills were equal, but because I held back and fought without the intent to kill. If we fought with sparring weapons, without the danger of death from the start, I did not need to hold back. Shana's mastery of the lance ranked among the best I had ever faced. However, she was not the best. In other words, it also meant that I had fought multiple times against warriors superior to her. Her technique of spinning the lance and using the generated centrifugal force to attack was troublesome to deal with, but it was a technique I already learned how to counter. If she used a wooden lance, Stopping the tip even with my hands wasn't difficult. No matter how many times we fought, there was no way for me to lose. MMGH, how frustrating. I wanted to draw out your full power no matter what, but... My full power? <laughs> Our last duel in the slums wasn't enough? I had the impression that you held back much of what you could do at that time. If my instincts are right, you still have aces up your sleeve. <laughs> I wonder. I shrugged in response to Shana's suspicions. Then she blushed and showed an annoyed expression. I cannot possibly go back to the Empire before you and I have another duel to the death. I suppose I will have to continue this life for a while, to seek a chance for revenge. Well, works for me. With a provocative beauty like her at my command, I had nothing to complain about. I stabbed my wooden sword into the ground, took Shana's hand, and helped her stand back up. I used the momentum to go ahead and embrace her. R, hey now, it's still noon. I caressed her behind, and Shana protested. It's fine, it's fine, respecting the rules of the duel, however. She did not resist, so I let my hands advance beyond the slits of her dress. The feeling of her sweaty thighs was so pleasant, I always felt I could just keep touching them forever. You're hopeless, let us go inside at least, I feel like doing it outside today. Don't worry, I'll finish by the time you have counted all the clouds in the sky. MMH, what a troublesome master I have. Shana blushed and rubbed her thighs against each other, feeling awkward. I had made her mine several times already, but maybe because she always lived the life of a warrior, her reactions were still inexperienced and adorable. If we stay here, won't we be seen in the nude by someone? You wouldn't like that? Of course not. I have become used to being seen by you, but I loathe the idea of being seen by others. I see. I guess I should send away the peeping Tom then. Eh? I quickly pulled the wooden sword from the ground and threw it towards one of the oak trees growing in the garden. The instant the sword stabbed into the oak tree's trunk, a man clad in black jumped out from the shade behind it. I prepared for the man to attack us but he jumped over the residence's fence and disappeared from our sight with incredible speed. Ooh, how fast. That man must be really skilled. I was genuinely impressed, but Shana seemed shaken. WW what was that? An assassin? W when did he get there? He's been there since we started the mox battle. That's for sure. You didn't notice? I shrugged in reply. At this rate. The day Shana could defeat me was still very far away. And you act like this with an assassin watching. I am starting to doubt your sanity. I do what I must. No matter who watches. Even the battlefield is a good place to make love to a woman. That's the kind of man I am. I see, hero and fool are truly two sides of the same coin. Helplessness. Admiration. Disappointment. I sensed a mixture of emotions in Shana's tone. I shrugged again and pulled her closer. There was still time before lunch. I might as well use it for another short workout. Chapter 16 A Midnight Visitor In a small town located in the eastern province of the Lamparoo Kingdom, in a building immersed in complete darkness, voices could be heard. A request has been received from Sullivan Noms for the assassination of Dinger Maxwell. The presence in the darkness rustled ever so slightly. Several other presences surfaced. Then another voice echoed in the dark. Ho ho ho, 
for the disinherited crown prince to wish for the death of the eastern hero. How imprudent that man has no chance of winning against Dinger Maxwell using conventional methods, surely. Definitely, once a request has been received, we shall do everything in our power to fulfill it. Such is the law of the fangs of steel. He he. This marks the end for that man. One of the presences in the dark vanished. The others followed it, one after the other, until only one was left. Well then, will things proceed as planned, or not? This will be interesting. The last presence vanished as well. The only thing left in the dark room was a deafening silence section. The man clad in black was running through the slumbering town. It was already late at night, only the moonlight illuminated the streets. The man in black brushed past drunkards and women of pleasure in his path, but no one seemed to notice. It was like the man was part of the night scenery. Everyone walked on, oblivious to his existence. Ha! The man eventually reached his destination. He used the momentum of his run to leap over a tall wall. He landed without a sound and quickly snuck into the shadow of a small tree. Concealed behind the tree, the man scanned the garden of the residence he infiltrated. There were armed soldiers here and there in the garden, accompanied by hunting dogs. The residence's security was comparable to a military fort. Securities tight, as expected of a margrave. The place infiltrated by the man was one of the most guarded locations in the eastern province, Margrave Maxwell's residence. Soldiers patrolled the manor at all times. Even the man, a veteran assassin, could not have infiltrated the manor's premises easily without advance information about the position of the guards and their patrol schedules. Okay then, at this hour, the target should be in his room, probably with one of his women. The man recalled what happened earlier that day, then sighed and shrugged. He had been spying on the target, who was at another residence and found him engaged in lewd acts in broad daylight. The man continued observing, feeling frankly envious, but the target apparently detected that he was being watched, yet continued enjoying himself nonetheless. In the end, the man in black was unexpectedly attacked, as brazen as always, I have to say. No wonder they call him a prodigy. The man took advantage of a slight opening in the manor's security and snuck into the entrance hall. He had burned a special incense in advance, in order to fool the guard dog's sense of smell. Inside the manor, there did not seem to be any guards. The residents were apparently all asleep. As the man could not sense any human presences, the target's room is. Oh my! A guest at this hour. How rare! Newat, startled by the sudden voice coming from behind him, the man flipped and turned around. There was no presence just seconds ago, but now a human silhouette stood before him. Esteemed guest, I must ask you to ring the doorbell first before you enter. Standing before the man in black was a young maid of short stature. The maid had black hair and black eyes, a rarity in the kingdom. Without a sound, she stepped right next to the man. K.H. The man noticed that something shone in her hand and instinctively performed an evasive maneuver. The next instant, a blade slashed through the space previously occupied by the man. Talking before making a surprise attack, aren't you a kind little girl? The man was sure that if the maid attacked before saying anything, he could not have completely avoided her attack. The little girl before him was a denizen of the underground, like him, with skills possibly superior to his. I have to exercise sometimes or my body will get sluggish. That's some confidence, a lethal trait in our line of work. The man took throwing knives out of his pocket and shot them at the maid. The maid, however, dodged the flying blades without much effort. Naive little girl, the man had naturally predicted that she would dodge the knives, he had used them only as a diversion. He grabbed the maid's right arm, preventing her from using her blade, and took advantage of the difference in their physique to push her down. Victory is mine, so it seems, the maid accepted her defeat all too easily. The man had a wide smile on his lips, but his expression soon turned to ice. Mile per hour, na, a tiny needle shot from the maid's mouth, piercing the man's neck. Paralysis quickly spread through the man's body, which slipped and fell powerless. A. Dart. Poison. Of course, I would never wrestle a man with thin arms such as mine. The maid pushed the man's limp body aside and slipped out from under him. She then punted his sides, as if to give him the coup de grace. I am terribly sorry, 
but the only man allowed to mount me is my master, Lord Dinger Maxwell. After saying these words, with a sort of pride in her tone, the maid reached for the man's mask, she stepped over his body and removed it forcefully. Even if we are related, you are not allowed to touch me without permission, Brother Obera, you have become truly skilled, Sakayur. The man in black honestly praised the maid, and little sister, who had defeated him so easily. I waited for Sakaya and Obera's sibling fight to end and went down the stairs toward the entrance hall. So is it over ye, hey, what are you doing? Ga, 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 help. On the marble floor lay Obra, assassin and acquaintance of mine. Then, for some reason, Sakuya was standing on his torso, or more precisely, she was stepping on it. Her rhythmic steps made it look like she was dancing, as she continued stomping on her older brother's chest and stomach with her heels. What's that, Sakuya? A form of grooming, Lord Dinger. Sakuya answered my question without changing her expression a bit. If a pathetic man like this one, who loses to his sister, five years younger than him, becomes the next head of the fangs of steel. It will be a grave issue for both Lord Dinger and House Maxwell. Thus I must correct my brother's crooked character. As you can see, Sakia did not stop dancing on her brother throughout the explanation. Da, gua, ga, yo young master, I beg for your help. Gua, the heels are piercing my liver. It is going to burst. Silence. You are not to speak to Lord Dinger unless spoken to. Gua, is that the way to treat your brother? Gua, ow, ribs broken. Did you not hear me? I told you to be silent. Are your ears mere decorations? I suppose you do not need them then? Gui? No kicks to the head. The toes got into my ears, my eardrums. Sakuya. Get off him for now. I can't talk to him like this. Understood. Following my order, Sakuya suspended her torture. No. Her grooming immediately. I approached Obra, pitifully sprawled on the floor, crouched, and looked at his face. You all right? Can you hear me? I, I wish you'd have helped me sooner. Well, you know, it isn't proper to interrupt communication between siblings. I chuckled and shook my head. There might be people who enjoy being kicked and stomped by a girl out there, but, unfortunately, Obra did not have such peculiar preferences. Okay then. Can we start with interrogating this prisoner of war? Why did you infiltrate the manor? I knew the answer already, but I asked all the same, out of formality. Hey, I cannot answer that. The fangs of steel do not betray their patrons. Obera refused to talk, as was their formality. It was the kind of exchange you had to go through for form's sake. But Sakuya, despite being aware of such circumstances, sharply rebuked her brother. Lord Dinja asked a question. How dare you refuse to talk? Gua, N no. This is just for appearances. Hey, enough kicking. Ah, uh, so can you answer me now? The conversation was about to be derailed again, so I interrupted them. Obera grasped the chance of salvation I gave him and eagerly answered. I if, if you ask so much, then I suppose I must talk. We have been requested by Sullivan Noms to assassinate Dinger Maxwell. Obera's confession confirmed what I suspected. I looked down and sighed deeply. Ah, I see. As expected, he couldn't become a member of the Eastern Province nobles, he couldn't part with his past as Crown Prince. You have my condolences, young master. I don't know how Obra took my words, but he tried to console me. I, however, shook my head and laughed. Oh no. It is well within the realm of my expectations, but it's sad nonetheless to be forced to condemn a man with royal blood in his veins. It's just, so tragic, ha ha, ha ha ha. Your words and expressions do not match, Lord Dinger. I flicked my hand at Sakia's serious remark and continued talking with Obera. You have proof that Sullivan requested my assassination, right? Of course, that man signed the contract and even sealed it in blood. He did it so easily, without even thinking it could be a trap. Really, fools will be fools. I guess I honestly didn't expect him to fall for it so easily. A man you happen to meet tells you that the legendary assassins, the fangs of steel, really exist and you believe it just like that? Not only that, but also that the measly amount of money you could pay was enough for the assassination of a Margrave son? You went ahead and even signed the contract, believing that everything was going to be resolved? This was all my plan. 
There wasn't a single chance for Sullivan's revenge from the start. A moron without limits. To fail my test of loyalty like that, at least now I can dispose of him without reserve. Sullivan's death was now decided. The series of events started by my broken engagement continued longer than expected, but the conclusion was finally in sight. As for a final gesture of mercy, you'll be the one to choose whether you die a quick death or a really painful one. While considering such thoughts, I expressed my gratitude to Obera. I'm sorry for having you do something so troublesome, Obera. You can go now. I'll send some good alcohol your way next time. Give my regards to the Elder too. Understood, young master. By the way, Sakuya, I can't seem to move an inch yet. What kind of poison did you use? A lethal dose of paralyzing poison. Dear brother, Sakuya's answer to Obera's question was rather shocking. L lethal? How could you kill your own brother? Rest easy, dear brother. Thanks to your training, you will be able to resist its effects for two hours. So in two hours I'll be dead, and I should rest easy. G give me the antidote. Now, I looked at Obra, still lying on the ground but kicking up a fuss, and a question popped in my head. You can't move an inch, but you sure can talk a lot. Huh? Yes, I made a special concoction that would make it possible to interrogate the victim of such a poison. I did not learn it during my time in the Fangs of Steel, but created it myself. Oh, that's impressive to continue studying like that. Well done, Sakuya. I pulled Sakuya closer and patted her head. Her expression softened and she put her head against my chest. H hey, you can have your wholesome moments later. Antidote first. I would have liked to carry Sakuya to bed like that. But the man sprawled on the floor. Obra, got in the way of my plans. Sakuya, it'd be a pain to have him die, so give him the antidote already. He's going to wake up the whole manor. Yes, my lord. Sakuya responded to my order by pinching the hems of her maid's skirt and bowing politely. I shall now go concoct the antidote. Please wait a little while. You're going to make it now? Why didn't you prepare it in advance? Please stop making a fuss. It makes you look pathetic, dear brother. It will only take me one hour or so for the concoction. So please wait here. That's very close to my limit. So you really want to kill your own brother? Sakuya ignored her siblings pleas for his life and walked up to me. She stood on her toes and pressed her lips against mine, smiling faintly. I shall be at your side as soon as possible. Please wait for me in bed. Yeah, I'll be waiting, but let me have a quick taste in advance. MMH. This time I pressed my lips against hers and penetrated her mouth. Sakuya stretched her tongue and entangled it with mine. Antidote. Please. Death approaches. Sakuya and I continued exchanging passionate kisses, with Obera's desperate pleas as a sort of background music. Chapter 17. The first kiss tastes like poison. Point of view, Sakuya. My name is Sakuya. I work as a maid for Lord Dinger Maxwell, heir to Margrave Maxwell, the leading noble of the eastern province. My special skills are staying awake throughout the night to guard my lord, escorting, patrolling the manor, concocting poison, then assassination, poisoning, garroting, bludgeoning, erasure, massacre, extermination, and many more. Presently, Thanks to these skills, I am working as an impeccable maid, but until three years ago I was engaged in a different profession. A profession commonly defined with the word assassin in the land my ancestors hailed from. It was also called ninja. The organization I used to belong to, a league of assassins called the Fangs of Steel Ninja Squad, originated from an island country located beyond the sea east of the continent. More than fifty years ago, in the far east country of Wanokuni, our ancestors accepted requests received from the government and the daimyo, in this country, one would call them nobles, and mainly performed infiltration, sabotage, and assassination work. The village where our ancestors lived, however, was completely destroyed by a certain daimyo, chased away from their own country. They sought refuge in this continent. After a long period of vagrancy, their final destination was here, the kingdom of Lamparor Uj. The Lamparor Uj kingdom was founded when its predecessor, the Lamparor Uj Alliance, a group of city-states, decided to band together in order to protect themselves, triggered by the empire's territorial expansion. Fifty years ago, when the kingdom was newly established, 
It was surrounded by enemies in all directions, to the north and east lay the empire, a known aggressor country boasting massive military strength, to the south, territories were subjected to the pirates' turf wars, continuous plundering, and massacres, the western borders were often threatened by a fearsome army whose name people did not even dare to pronounce. In a country surrounded by enemies, where the flames of war never died out, our ancestors had countless opportunities to put their skills to use. They assassinated generals from hostile countries, procured secret documents, eliminated subversive cells within the country, eventually, Fangs of Steel became known as the name of a legendary group of assassins. Legends too fade over time, the Empire's invasion attempts were put on hold, the pirates' turf wars reached their conclusion, a truce was formed with the terror army, the value of the fangs of steel also dimmed. As the kingdom entered an era of peace, our existence was relegated to the fairy tales. To discard our profession as assassins and continue living here, or leave to seek new battlefields, the time to choose had come. It was precisely at that time that he appeared before us. Section. Hello there, this is the hideout of the Assassin Guild Fangs of Steel. Yes? It happened three years ago, in the small town where the Fangs of Steel established their headquarters. A young man suddenly opened the door of the tavern that served as a front for the hideout. The young man was about fifteen years old. He had a black sword at his waist and carried a bag over his shoulder, which seemed filled to the brim. What are you saying? boy. This place is for members only. The Fangs of Steel member who acted as tavern staff replied, unfazed. All the people present in the tavern, me included, were Fangs of Steel ninjas. I was sitting at a table and eating. When the young man came in, I casually took my poisoned needles from under the table, preparing to attack him if necessary. The other ninjas disguised as tavern patrons secretly prepared their weapons as well. Ha ha, all this killing intent you're giving out is proof enough. Let me guess, all those here are assassins? The waiter made eye contact with me. It was the signal to move. I quickly moved behind the young man, without making a sound. I would not kill him immediately. We had to interrogate him first, to know where he had learned about the location of our hideout. First you will be paralyzed. I tried to stab the young man's neck with a needle coated in paralyzing poison, but something very unexpected happened. Oh, you're fast. Are The young man dodged my attack, without even looking at me. The next instant, he turned around, grabbed my wrist, and raised it high. Ka, whoa there, you have bad manners, girl. I tried using my free hand to poke his eyes, but the young man dodged that easily as well then caught my other hand too. Kh, but I still have my legs. I tried kicking him between the legs to send him flying, but the young man retaliated with a surprising attack. You sure are feisty, despite your size. As expected of a legendary league of assassins. Okay then, I should start by giving a reward to this young lady here. Nah? The next instant, the young man kissed me. It was the first time my lips touched someone else's. My first kiss as they say. HNN, NNH, NNH, MMH. I desperately resisted at first, but as the young man's tongue penetrated inside my mouth, I gradually lost the ability to move. I'm paralyzed. Instead, the young man's tongue skills were so lethal, I began to wonder if his tongue had been coated in poison. He sucked on my lips, licked and caressed each one of my teeth. I felt all my strength leave my body and before I noticed it I was leaning against the young man. Dot. I never felt anything so good. I felt as if I had been lulled into an ecstatic drinking stupor, but that moment of bliss ended abruptly. <laughs> Delicious. Unripe fruits have a great taste too. Anne. My lips were finally released, after who knows how long. I was dazed for a while, like I was floating. When I fully regained my senses, I saw the tavern's tables and chairs scattered and broken, broken bottles and shards of glass everywhere. All the fangs of steel ninjas except me were lying on the floor. The one posing as the waiter, my older brother Obra, was lying face down, the young man stepping over him. This is what you get for interrupting a love scene, you uncivilized goons. Who in the world? 
Are you? All of the ninjas present were fangs of steel assassins. Each one of them had survived countless deadly situations. They were all masters of their art. And this young man defeated them all by himself, while kiss, kissing me. Me? Oh yeah, I didn't introduce myself, right? My name's Ninja Maxwell. I have a hunch we're going to have a long relationship, me and you. Well, anyway, pleased to meet you. The young man, Lord Ninja Maxwell smiled like a mischievous kid. I opened my mouth to say something, but before I could laugh to echoed in the tavern. Ho ho ho, it sure is lively in here today. Gee grandfather, I turned round and found the familiar face of an elderly man. The tall man with a long white beard was Jojen. He was the current head of the Fangs of Steel and my grandfather. After my parents had died in the line of duty, he was also the person who raised me. I must say I am surprised to see someone who can manage this much against our youngsters. I see they don't call you prodigy for no reason, Maxwell boy. Impressive, impressive. Grandfather laughed merrily, like a kind elderly neighbor, but his eyes were not even smiling. He glared sharply at the intruder and the ninjas who were defeated so easily. In turn, Lord Ninja released me from his embrace. Still overwhelmed by his passionate kiss, I slumped down on the floor. I'm the impressed one here, Elder. I didn't even feel your presence until you spoke. Lord Ninja praised Grandfather with a smile. Ha ha, I didn't grow old doing nothing. After all, my grandfather replied and smiled back. The atmosphere around them seemed peaceful as if they were already friends. I noticed, however, that they both carefully kept their distance from each other, gauging the other's range. Well then, Sir Dinger, may I ask what brings you here? I'm sure you did not come only to teach a good lesson to our youngsters. That's right. I came here for a work request. Ooh, that is intriguing. Let us hear it. Sure. Lord Dinger placed the bag he carried on a nearby table. He then opened it, revealing a large number of gold coins. The request is for assassination, and the target is, Dinger Maxwell. In other words, me. Those were Lord Dinger's exact words. His unbelievable words created total silence in the room for a while. I was still sitting on the floor, speechless. Is this some kind of joke? Grandfather too was suspicious. He frowned as he asked Lord Dinger to explain himself. Lord Dinger grinned as if our reaction was just what he expected. He then raised his index finger next to his face and replied, No, this is definitely not a joke. To put it simply, I want to make a bet with you fangs of steel. A bet? What do you want to say? Yes, a bet. You have one month to try to assassinate me. If you succeed, that money is yours. If you fail, the fangs of steel will become my subordinates. Who? You would have us serve you? Yes, that's right. The conditions aren't bad, are they? Ho ho ho, how funny. Young people should be reckless, as they say. However, you're getting ahead of yourself, boy. Grandfather was laughing heartily one moment, but the next one his expression changed completely, as he sternly addressed Lord Dinger. I had never seen Grandfather brimming with such killing intent. Even if I wasn't the target, I couldn't help but tremble. Your little victory over our men here must have gone to your head. We are assassins, not warriors or mercenaries. Our essence is only one, to murder. We use any means available, no matter how low or immoral they may be, to silence our targets forever. Do you really think you could escape the full extent of our assassination techniques? You, a brat less than twenty, what arrogance, elder, yes looking at you, I understand how reckless I was. I really underestimated the legendary League of Assassins, it seems. Lord Dinger sincerely bowed his head, then continued, I cannot swallow my words any more though. I might have a very slim chance of victory, but do let me try those legendary assassination arts of yours. What pushes you to do such a thing? If you wish for us to be allies, you could simply offer money or land in exchange. I know well you don't mean what you just said as if that would be enough to sway you. Lord Dinger shook his head at Grandfather's legitimate question. Fifty years have passed since the Fangs of Steel first appeared in the history of this country. You have accepted the requests of many, but never pledged allegiance to one person or group. Have you? I don't know if that's your motto or you simply haven't found someone worthy enough to accept as your master yet. When I thought about a way to win you over, the only thing I came up with was to show you my resolve and abilities. So here I am, 
thus you stake your own life to win us over, that's flattering indeed, it would all mean nothing if you die, though, if that happens, that will mean that it was my limit as a man, they say I've the devil's own luck though, I'm going to fight tooth and nail with everything I have, you'll see, Lord Dinger laughed brazenly, that time, I thought he was glowing, I felt as if I had seen the sun for the first time in my life, I pressed my hands on my chest to stop it from thumping so much, but my heart continued to beat faster, stronger, louder, very well, I understand, your request has been accepted, if one month from now you are still alive, the fangs of steel shall become retainers of Sir Dinger Maxwell, I'm really looking forward to that, causing harm to anyone else is against the rules though, alright, ho ho ho, very well, Lord Dinger then left our hideout, I looked at him go, then asked grandfather a question, was it really alright to accept such a request, that was the only way, a single man showed such a resolve to us, how could we not respond in kind? Grandfather nodded while stroking his prized beard. Our current way of life has reached its limits, anyhow. This might actually be a good chance. The age when the fangs of steel were considered necessary was long gone. The requests for assassinations, which bore the most fruitful rewards, decreased day by day. We were forced to re-examine our way of life. Based on such a situation, Entering into service of a powerful noble house such as the Maxwells was not a bad prospect at all. The only problem is whether that boy was a worthy enough vessel or not. No, it does seem he could be worthy as a vessel, and he has enough strength too. It all depends on what kind of star he was born under. Now, Grandfather looked at his unconscious subordinates, shrugged, and sighed. He then turned towards me. A deadly serious look on his face. Secure. I leave the assassination of that man, Dinger Maxwell, to you. A eh? grandfather's order took me completely by surprise. I could not understand how such an important mission, upon which depended the very fate of the fangs of steel, could ever be assigned to someone who had already lost and was shamed like I was. Are you truly sure about this, grandfather? There are many members more skilled than me. The unconscious members in the tavern were all young members of the Fangs of Steel. I knew and was proud of the fact that I was the most skilled one of them all. My brother Oberu included, among the members who supported the group through the warring age alongside Grandfather, however, there were much more skilled than me. Grandfather shook his head to my question. Those who will serve Sir Dinger are not us elderly, but you youngsters. Normally, it would be the next head's duty to perform this test. But looking at Obra's pitiful state, I cannot entrust it to him. Gwe. Grandfather stepped on my brother's body, then scratched his head. I'm going to have to retrain this fool, so the request is yours. This is my decision as head. Understood. If my grandfather ordered me to take the mission as the head, I had no choice but to obey. I was going to do everything in my power as an assassin to fulfill the request. Use all the techniques you have learned and determine whether he is fit as our leader or not. Do not go easy on him, even if you've fallen in love. Are we clear? I, I haven't. I forgot my position and talked back to grandfather, then bid my burning red face with my hands. Section. One month had passed since then. I targeted Lord Dinger's life with all the means at my disposal. The result was defeat. I did not hold back in the slightest, but Lord Dinger foiled all my attempts, through sheer luck and his own abilities, thus proving that he was fit to become our master. After failing an assassination, Lord Dinger caught me and did all sorts of things to me. As a result, I realized my only path was to serve him as a maid. But that is a story for another time. Chapter 18. The Final Struggle. Point of View. Sullivan Noms. Shit. Why haven't they reported back yet? I was sitting on a chair in my room in House Noms, nervously tapping the armrests. I tried my hardest to contain my irritation these past few days. Two weeks ago, I met a man called Zale in a tavern in town. He introduced me to the band of assassins Fangs of Steel, to whom I requested the murder of Dinger Maxwell. The man from the Fangs of Steel accepted the request saying they would fulfill the request in the span of a few days, but I had yet to receive the report that the request had been completed. Shit, how can they be so slow, after making me pay all that money? 
I slammed my fists on the table as I spat out those words. I had to go through all sorts of trouble to gather the money requested by the assassins, I couldn't speak about the request to house noms, of course, so I had to prepare it all by myself. I bathed my friends in the capital via letter and managed to obtain a bit of money from them. Several of them accepted my request, but the attached letter also said this is the last time, don't contact me ever again effectively severing their ties with me. When I saw those letters, I felt so insulted I tore the letter to shreds. You better remember this. When Ginger Maxwell is killed and I become the next Margrave, I'm going to start a revolt and burn down the capital. All your heads are going to roll. At first, I planned to take back my title of the Crown Prince, but, because of the unbelievable way my friends changed, I started thinking of such plots. House Maxwell was one of the four houses. Its military strength was one of the greatest in the kingdom. Once it was in my hands, it wouldn't be a dream to punish the royal family that abandoned me and the central nobles who betrayed me. You will regret disinheriting me, all of those who oppose me will die. I'm going to take back the throne by force. Father, who abandoned me, and my younger brother, who stole my title of crown prince, were going to burn at the stake. I'll cut off Duke Rosai's head and put it up for all to see. I'll take his daughter Marianne and enjoy her all her life as my sex slave. As the fantasies came alive in my head, my lips naturally curved into a smile. I was going to exact revenge on the people who drove me to ruin and bring destruction to the minced head. How could I not laugh? Knock, knock, knock. Lord Sullivan, may I? Someone knocked on the door and interrupted my thoughts. What is it? I'm rather busy now, just when I was relishing my bright future prospects, my tone barely hid the irritation I felt, a guest came to see you, my lord, may I let them through, ooh, yes, of course, let them in, understood, right away, my lord, I cheered loudly in my mind, ever since I started living in house noms, I had not received even one guest, which meant, this guest surely brought the report I longed to hear, they carried out the assassination. Finally, I lightly leapt out of my chair and briskly made preparations to welcome the guest. I was almost dancing with joy, so I failed to notice that the butler who came to announce the guest's arrival spoke with a terribly tense tone of voice. After a little while, someone knocked again. Oh, do come in. With your permission, I've been waiting. The guest who entered my room was a very unexpected one. Allow me to introduce myself. Sir Sullivan Noms, my name is Lowen, I am the captain of the 1st Security Division of House Maxwell. The guest was a man clad in full armor. On his chest he bore Margrave Maxwell's crest, the blue dragon emblem. There were two other soldiers behind Lowen, who were armed in the same way as him. M. Maxwell's Security Division, Captain, W. What business brings you? My voice turned shrill and high-pitched. Acting so restless was like exposing my guilty conscience, but I couldn't hold back my turmoil. You do not know what brings me here, sir? Lowen asked an inquiring question. I clearly felt all color leave my face. I, I, I have no idea. Is that so? Then, please look at this. W what is that? Lowen took out a piece of rolled parchment and spread it for me to see. It was a contract I remembered all too well. This document was found in the hideout of a gang of assassins we have apprehended recently. Its contents, as you can see, detail a request to assassinate our lord, Dinger Maxwell. On the bottom of the document you can see your own signature and seal. www. What is this? Impossible. Were they caught? Weren't they legendary assassins? I barely managed to keep myself from shouting my thoughts. I tried desperately to restrain my shock but I couldn't keep my body from shaking. I, I, I have no idea about any of this. Someone must have impersonated me too. I see, in that case, please allow us to conduct a proper examination. Unlike signatures, seals cannot be duplicated. After all, please show us your fingers. It will only take a short time to verify. You, you, are, you, you. I curled my fingers into my hand and collapsed on the spot. There was no need for any examination. I had pressed my seal on the contract myself, it appears we reached our conclusion. Follow us quietly, and you may have a chance to explain yourself in court. Do you, mean to judge me in court, like a criminal? I, 
the crown prince of. It appears there is a misunderstanding here, you are the crown prince no more, you are now simply reaping what you sowed. If you resist, we will have to take measures accordingly. Lowin then caressed the hilt of the sword at his waist. I fell silent for a short time, then opened my mouth again. Understood, I will prepare my belongings, please wait just a moment. I was still looking down when Lowin stopped me. Entrust your sword to me first, please. Gah, what insolence. I restrained the urge to shout back and handed Lowin my sword. Damn you all, is everyone in this blasted kingdom eager to get in my wee? Is there no god in this world? Why did I have to endure such trials? All I ever did was lead a life worthy of a crown prince. Whatever did I do to deserve all this? Enough. Gaining the help of lowly criminals was a mistake. Evidently, I'm going to kill Maxwell with my own two hands. At this point, it was clear that I had to create a path myself. I could never allow myself to be judged as a criminal in a treacherous trial plotted by House Maxwell. Justice is on my side. Maxwell, you will pay. I pretended to prepare my belongings and took out something from a drawer. When I was disinherited and thrown out of the royal house, most of my belongings as crown prince were confiscated. There was one thing, however, I could secretly bring with me, he he, he ha he, what I took out of the drawer was an old, dull silver bracelet, as an accessory, it was too shabby for royalty like me to wear, but what I needed now was not its value as a decoration. The royal house's magic tool, Heracles, one of the national treasures of the kingdom of Lamparor Uj was now equipped on my left arm, chapter 19, the hero's bracelet, ha ha. Ha ha ha. What? Sullivan started laughing all of a sudden, so Lowen frowned. He then noticed that Sullivan was now wearing a silver bracelet and looked at him. Why died? What's that bracelet? Men, restrain him. Yes, sir. Lowen did not know what the bracelet really was, but he was sure it was a magic tool. So he immediately ordered his subordinates to move. However, Gwawah Sullivan roared and swung his arms. Gah? He only swung them wildly. But one of Lowen's subordinates was tossed against the wall. You, Lowen glanced at the soldier thrown against the wall, then drew his sword. He stepped next to Sullivan in an instant and slashed him diagonally. Sullivan's body was cut deeply and sprayed blood. Ha ha, ha 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 ha, that is nothing. Grawah, im impossible. Sullivan's wounded body recovered, almost instantly. Sullivan then swung his arms in Lowen's direction. Lowen parried with his sword and jumped backward to kill the momentum. Gh, what unbelievable power. Captain Lowen. You, damned rebel. The other soldier pierced Sullivan with his spear, exactly under his armpits. The spear went through the ribs and reached Sullivan's heart. Out of my way, you imbeciles. Even with his heart pierced, Sullivan did not die. He forcefully snapped the spear with his arms. You dare wound my noble self? I will have you all hanged. Mark my words. Sullivan broke through the window and jumped out. Stop. The soldier who stabbed Sullivan with his spear drew his sword and started giving him chase. Stop. Don't chase him. Lowen, however, stopped him. There's no need to take care of his wounds instead. But, sir, the soldier looked at the shattered window. Then his comrade slumping against the wall. It's fine. There was an unexpected accident, but things are largely proceeding as planned. We wanted to let him escape from the start, anyway. Ah really sir? Understood. The soldier cocked his head, confused. Lowen shook his head and sighed. He heard clamoring voices from the hallway. The residents of the Noms house heard the commotion and started gathering, naturally. Lowen headed towards the hallway, to explain the situation to the head of house Noms. Let's leave the judgment to the young master, if only he let himself get caught. He would have been judged as a human being. Lowen's whispered words were filled with pity. Section. Shit. 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 Sullivan cursed as he ran through the town at an incredible speed. Heracles, magic tool and national treasure of the Lamparor U Kingdom. Its power boosted the wearer's physical and healing abilities. There were many magic tools that boosted physical abilities, but Heracles was especially powerful. As long as Heracles was worn, the user would not die even if their head was smashed or their whole body was stabbed by spears. The wearer became immortal and could fight hordes of enemies on their own. Additionally, unlike other magic tools, Heracles did not cause any fatigue to the wearer. 
so it could be used without limit. When the kingdom of Lamparor Uj was founded, the first king fought with Heracles, spreading his fame as an immortal warrior, leaving legends such as his battle against armies of thousands on his own. Who do you think I am, you miserable peons? I am the fated ruler of this kingdom. Everything in this kingdom belongs to me. Sullivan had lost his position as crown prince, his position as heir to house noms, everything. What he had left was only the old silver bracelet on his left hand. Nothing will stop me now. Yes, a country where I am not the king cannot be right. I have no need for it anymore. Sullivan's heart sank deeper and deeper into a swamp of ill intent. His uncontrollable rage and hatred painted the scenery before him red. The people in the streets, alerted by his screams, quickly opened a path for him, but he did not even see them anymore. I will kill you, Dinger Maxwell. Your father Dietrich too. I'm going to take your two heads as a gift and turn to the Empire. If the Margrave of the Eastern Province, guardian of the border, was killed along with his son and heir, the Eastern territories of the Lamparor U Kingdom will surely crumble. If the Empire took the opportunity to invade, the whole country was going to fall. Yes, I will become a hero in the Empire. The country that abandoned me will be burnt to ashes and a new age will be born. The dashing young noble's handsome features twisted evilly. Sullivan's heart had no more traces of love for his homeland. There was nothing but hatred and a desire for revenge upon those who caused his life to go out of control. First of all, I must regroup and Yes, Zale, I must punish that man for introducing me to those useless assassins. Sullivan was now headed to the residence Zale told him he could use as an emergency shelter. It was rather far from the town, but, thanks to Heracles, he could reach it in about one day. So I'll just you wait. Your king will punish you personally. The silver bracelet style glow grew stronger as Sullivan kicked the ground with more power. The journey to the residence would normally take days, but the bracelet's full speed allowed Sullivan to arrive by sunset. The residence was located in an area known as a summer resort in the eastern province. Among many other noble residences, it stood taller and more imposing than any other. Its garden was large as well, making it look like a villa fit for royalty. HMPH, if he could build a mansion like this, he must have quite a lot of finances at his disposal. Looks like I might be able to make good use of you, Zale. Sullivan opened the iron gates and adamantly made his way inside. The residence was very large, but there was no sign of security anywhere. Not even servants or maids could be seen. I expected to find more security, though. Could he have deserted the place? Sullivan, perplexed, walked towards the entrance. Eventually. He spotted a gorgeously decorated door. Before he could reach it, however, the door opened from inside. Whoa! You got here earlier than expected. What? You are. From beyond the luxurious door leading into the residence emerged Sullivan's most hated man, Dinger Maxwell himself. Dinger Maxwell. Why are you here? Why? Why can't I be in my private residence? I shrugged at Sullivan's angry shouting. The residence we were in was one of my private properties, if someone was to be accused, it was him for entering without permission, but I knew that such reasoning wasn't going to work on the idiot standing before me. Your private residence? That's impossible. This is Zales. You called for me, Lord Sullivan? A man appeared from behind one of the pillars in the entrance hall. Zale. What is the meaning of this? Why is Dinger Maxwell here? Sullivan continued yelling. The world rest man. His composed, gentlemanly expression unperturbed on his face, replied to Sullivan's question as if appeasing an unruly child. I see you still do not realize, what exactly your current position is. Even in a situation like this, you still do not see on whose side I am on? You can't be saying. Sullivan was hit with the realization. He finally understood in what place he had been lured in, that the man called Zale was not his ally. You bastard. How dare you. Betray me. Betrayal? I am afraid that is not correct. In the first place. Enough already. I'm sick of hearing you talk like that. Could you stop? I couldn't stand to watch that farce anymore, so I interrupted the man. Your job is over now, so you can talk as you usually do, clown. Ooh, is that so? He? Let me talk normally then, sir. The atmosphere of the man Sullivan called Zale changed completely. 
his polite manners and gentlemanly features crumbled away, leaving a vulgar-looking hoodlum in their place. That was the true appearance of the man said to possess one hundred faces, Zale, clown. This face might be a fake one too, though. W who the hell are you? Where did Zale go? Sullivan was completely confused by the drastic change in Zale's appearance. He had instantly changed to a completely opposite face. I understood how he felt though, when I saw it for the first time, I was speechless too. He he he, the man named Zale never existed in the first place. My name is Clown, I am just a poor swindler. A, eh? a swindler. Yes sir, you have been deceived from the start. I approached you as Zale, told you about the fangs of steel, said that you had a chance to become the next Lord Maxwell, all to lure you into a trap. He he he. I can't, believe this. Sullivan's expression twisted horribly. What emerged from his expression now was humiliation and suspicion. You haven't realized it even now? You fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. It was a test, to see if you were worth the title of Baron Noms, and you failed it spectacularly. You spat and stomped all over it. He he he. Sullivan fell silent after Clown's mocking words. Then, after a brief silence, he exploded. D damn you ooh, 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 ooh. you will pay for deceiving me. The bracelet on Sullivan's left arm gave a dull glow. With a booming sound, as if the very earth exploded, Sullivan jumped at Clown. You, test me, test this kingdom's crown prince, this country's rightful ruler, know your place. Skew ooh, 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 um. he, this looks bad. Clown lightly stepped aside revealing the silhouette of a person who faced Sullivan in his place. Is it my turn finally? The silhouette behind Clown was the Lance Maiden, Shana. Shana smoothly ran past Sullivan, as she thrust the hilt of her lance between his legs to make him tumble. New -oo 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 -oo. Sullivan's legs flew up in the air and he crashed headfirst against one of the entrance's pillars. Over already? How boring. Gwa, gwee -e The marble pillar shattered. It's debris falling over Sullivan. Ah, hey, Shana. Don't go destroying my residence. I couldn't be helped. It's this man's fault for being too weak. Shana spun her lance and struck the floor with the hilt. She parted her silver hair, showing a dissatisfied expression on her handsome face. I can't expect him to be as strong as you, but I wanted to see some more grit, at the very least. Well, Looks like he has enough grit to stand back up though. Ooh, gwa. Sullivan tossed away the debris crushing him and stood up ferociously. There was blood on his head, but the wound seemed to be closed already. His recovery abilities were clearly superhuman. Kill, 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 kill. All those who harm my noble self, will face execution. It can't be. I respect tough men, but... How can he stand up again after that? Shana whispered, perplexed. At the speed Sullivan crashed against the marble pillar, his cranium should have been shattered. His neck snapped. It was normally impossible to stand back up after such damage. It's the royal family's secret treasure. Heracles, the bracelet of the immortal hero. Honestly, how did you manage to steal it? Even if Sullivan was the crown prince, it wasn't something that could have been easily taken outside. It was the first king's heritage, after all, more than just a magic tool. It was a symbol of the royal house's authority. I didn't hear about it being stolen, though. Did someone hide the fact? Could he have allies among the nobles in the capital? The only nobles that could have managed to sneak a national treasure out of the capital were Duke Rosais or nobles with similar authority. For a moment, I considered the possibility that someone secretly gave Sullivan the bracelet in order to dispose of me but I quickly discarded it. I couldn't think of any major nobles in the capital foolish enough to give a national treasure to this idiot, even for the sake of killing me. Well, whatever. Stand back, Shana. I'm going to deal with him. Mile per hour. Didn't you say you would leave him to me? This is the end of our little quarrel. I have to take responsibility, right? Shana, though disappointed, retreated. Clown, on the other hand, had already run off somewhere. Time to settle the score, then. You want to kill me, right? Do your worst. Dinger. Maxwell. Sullivan leapt towards me, roaring like a wild animal. I drew my sword and faced the man who stole my fiancé in our final battle. Chapter 20. How to Kill an Immortal. Maxwee Eel. You don't need to shout. 
I can hear you just fine. Sullivan swung his fists at me repeatedly. I dodged each one, stepping to the right, left, front, and back as needed. Hey, Sullivan, I'm not the petty person you seem to think I am. You know, I said something different when I scolded you. That's true, but I don't throw away a person after a single mistake. I talked, even though I was fully aware that he wasn't listening. As expected, Sullivan ignored my words and simply continued swinging his arms like mad. It's pointless to say any of this now, I know, but if only you refused the invitation to have me assassinated, I was going to forget everything that happened between us. The fact that he stole my fiancé or that he called the nobles guarding the eastern borders insane murderers, I was still angry, of course, but all humans make mistakes, if Sullivan had a change of heart. I would have considered it all water under the bridge. I even thought that, if Sullivan contributed properly to the eastern province as the next head of House Noms, I could put in a good word with Duke Rosais to let him return to the central province one day. I've given you plenty of chances, you know, I let you marry Selina as you wished. I asked Baron Noms to take good care of you. I even set up a meeting to give you the chance to apologize, haven't I? You didn't consider any of them to be chances, that's all. Shut you you are up. Sullivan swung his fists again, as to erase my words. I dodged the fist, which slammed into the stone floor and crushed it. Stop tearing my residence down, it's getting seriously annoying. I swung my sword. Sullivan's body was slashed once, twice, thrice. Blood sprayed and splashed on the stone floor, but Sullivan seemed unfazed. I feel nothing. Puny attacks like that could never affect the future king of Lanper or Uj. I am a descendant of the first king, the immortal hero. That noble ancestor of yours must be weeping right now. Weeping at how idiotic his descendants are. Four, five, six times. I slashed Sullivan's body without pause, but all the wounds healed immediately. Ha 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 ha. Weak. Too weak. This is the hero of the eastern province? You dare oppose the future king with your meager strength? Man, you haven't hit me once and all you have going for you is that bracelet. Say what you will. This is the strength of a king. The absolute power of the conqueror fated to rule the land. Sullivan laughed pridefully as he continued to punch me. I dodged and cut, dodged and cut. I agree that it's powerful, but, dejected, I shook my head and mumbled to myself. Sullivan's power and speed, boosted by Heracles, were really something to behold. His fighting style, which consisted of nothing but wild punches, was too simple and childish. He looked like a kid throwing a temper tantrum. Well, what did I expect? You're just a brat riding on your parents' coattails after all. This guy lived all of his life as the crown prince, so he probably never even got into a fight. I could dodge beginner level punches like this in my sleep. Ha 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 ha. In stark contrast with my thoughts, Sullivan laughed uncontrollably, despite looking like a bloody mess. Looking at him laughing while getting continuously wounded, even I felt a bit creeped out. What's so funny about this? Try to hit me at least once before you laugh. Ha ha ha. You know nothing, Dinger Maxwell. What now? Ha ha. I shall enlighten you you moron. My victory has been decided already. Sullivan stopped swinging his fists and pointed at me. He looked as if he was really convinced he was going to win. I frowned. Again, what makes you act so proud? Honestly, you're creeping me out. Ha ha, say whatever you want, fine, I will tell you. You filthy scum, you have been slashing me with your sword for a while, but I am not defeated yet. Your sword means nothing before my immortal body. However, however, if I can hit you just once, you will turn into a bloody pulp. In addition, thanks to this magic tool I will never grow tired. As soon as you lose your energy and try to flee, it will be the end of you. Ah, now I get it. So that's why he was confident he was going to win. Well, for an idiot he had thought it through. Ha ha, don't let me catch you too easily. I shall have you taste every kind of suffering in this world, then chop your head off. Sure, just you try it. I swung my sword twice, slashing Sullivan's chest in a crosswise fashion, mile per hour, you struggle for nothing, about your analysis there, it was pretty much correct, I think, it's just that, I casually evaded Sullivan's fist, cutting his right hand off his wrist as I did, Gwah. for example, 
What happens if your limbs get cut off, like this? I cut off your right hand now, but if I cut off the left hand, the one with the bracelet, will you recover all the same? Why you bastard? My, my arm. What if I cut you to pieces? Can your body parts recover even if they're torn apart and scattered? Forearm, elbow, upper arm, shoulder. I started slicing Sullivan's right arm from the hand up. Ultimately, Sullivan lost everything from his right shoulder down. Why you BB bastard? My arm. Who do you think I am? You're asking that now? Can't you say anything else? I whispered hopelessly, then thrusted my sword to Sullivan's throat. Gh, Gua, what happens if I cut off your head? Can you recover? Is a new one going to pop up, like a lizard's tail? If you are still alive, will the new head be the same as the old one? S. Stop. I carved Sullivan's throat with the tip of my sword and he let out something of a scream. I chuckled at his reaction and extracted the sword. Gua, ha, ha, ha. So, you still think you're going to win? Do you really think you could? Come on. Let me hear it. Ggh. Gua, I kill you. I'm going to kill you. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You countryside noble scum. How dare you mock me? Sullivan, the wound on his throat now healed swung his remaining left arm at me. My lips curved into a grin and I swung my blade. Really? Sure. If you're still up to it, I'll stick with you to the end. What followed was not a battle, but the butchering of a pig. I gradually cut apart Sullivan's body into smaller pieces. I pulled the guts out of his stomach, extracted his eyeballs and even his heart. Some ten minutes later, in the residence's garden, now a blood-red carpet, Sullivan's mutilated body lay immobile. Chapter 21, A Fool's Demise. Looks like it's over. China walked towards me, looking at Sullivan's mass of flesh, which was sinking in a pool of blood. Yeah, looks like it. It always ends too quickly. I nodded and sheathed my sword. Thinking about it, my sword Siegfried, which had the power to neutralize magic, could have negated Sullivan's immortality, maybe. Oh well, who cares? I had no intention of letting him die easily anyway. This way I didn't have to go to the trouble of capturing him alive and work on him later. He, he, I am, the king, the ruler, of this country, all is, mine. Whoa, he's still alive? I had literally cut him to pieces, pulled his organs out of his body, but Sullivan was still talking. His severed body parts were moving like slugs, trying to return together. At this point, his recovery power was beyond impressive, almost sickening. However, his mind did not seem to heal. Sullivan, now only a torso, a head, and a left arm, smiled despite being immersed in a pool of his own blood. Why don't you remove the bracelet, to put him out of his misery already? Yeah, I guess you're right. Shana probably made her proposal out of pity, I sighed and accepted it. I had the feeling he still hadn't suffered enough but it felt pointless to keep slicing or stabbing him. I walked closer to Sullivan to remove the bracelet. However, Gwa, what? What the? Sullivan screamed out of the blue. Ooh, I was surprised and jumped backwards. Then Sullivan's body started exuding white smoke. Wrapped in steam just like a sizzling teapot, Sullivan's silhouette disappeared from sight. I glared at the cloud of white smoke. Hey, hey, you aren't going to explode, are you? It could be changing form. Cornered monsters always change to their second form, it's a staple in the eastern countries. Chano excitedly strengthened her grip on her lance. I pointed my sword towards Sullivan inside the smoke. Fa, ha, ha, my, body, what, that's. This is, unexpected, the cloud of smoke eventually dissipated, leaving Sullivan behind, but in a very different shape. R, he, R, R, Sullivan. In the short while we haven't met, you sure got old. The Sullivan that emerged from the white smoke looked like he had aged about fifty years. His handsome noble features were now marked by deep wrinkles. His golden locks turned completely white and fell off. The body parts I had cut off all recovered perfectly, but his limbs were now as thin as dried twigs. I doubted that even his closest relatives would recognize him if they didn't witness the transformation. M. My. Boody. How, how pitiful. Sullivan opened his toothless mouth and Shana backed away a couple of steps from him. His instantaneous transformation into a hideous old man probably shook her deeply. I see, 
so Heracles has this kind of side effect. Even the greatest legendary magic tool couldn't be used forever unconditionally. This was especially true for an incredible magic tool that could make you immortal. Heracles made it seem like the user did not spend any energy, but apparently it sucked the user's youth or life force. The first king died of illness in his thirties, didn't he? This is a nasty piece of work. I reached a conclusion and walked towards old Sullivan. Then, boo. Gwee? I kicked him without mercy. Sullivan rolled away and the bracelet easily fell off his now skeletal arm. I picked up the bracelet and slipped it into my breast pocket, and the treasure's mine, though the royal family will get pissed, I guess, maybe they won't find out if I keep quiet. I didn't know if the royal house was aware that the national treasure had been stolen, but now that things turned out like this, they don't have the right to complain even if it falls into my hands. It was a double-edged sword, but a precious magic tool nonetheless, there were a number of ways it could be used, guess I should treat it as a reward for the hard work I do every day. Give it back, the proof of my, kingship, proof of, the ruler of, this country. Shut up. He, he e e e Sullivan clung to my feet, so I kicked him away again. What a horrible view, in more ways than one. Shana sighed hopelessly as I repeatedly punted Sullivan. Why? He's just Sullivan. He e eek. Have, have mercy e. I know that, but, when he looks like that. Shana looked troubled. I scratched my head. Can't be helped. I'll capture him like this. I want him to be punished rather than killed. That is for the best. Shana and I nodded to each other. Then I tied Sullivan up. Even if I left him alive, Sullivan now had the body of a seventy-year-old. He didn't have the willpower or physical ability to oppose me anymore. Okay then, case closed. No, wait. There was another traitor, wasn't there? Stepping over Sullivan's bound body. I looked up into the sky. Chapter 22, Invitation to Despair. Point of view, Selena Noms. Lord Sullivan. I was in my room in the Noms Manor looking at the night sky from my window. About one week ago, Maxwell soldiers visited House Noms. Their objective was to arrest Sullivan, my husband, on charges of the attempted assassination of my former fiancé, Lord Dinger. Oh, Lord Sullivan, why did you change so? The Lord Sullivan I talked with in the flower garden of the academy and the Lord Sullivan that married into House Noms were completely different. Ever since the sweet, gentlemanly Lord Sullivan came to House Noms, he started yelling at me and sometimes even hit me. How could this happen? Where did we go wrong? I asked myself this question many times, but could never find an answer. I wanted to be freed from my terrible fiancé, only that and nothing else is what led me to choose Lord Sullivan. Yet now my prince changed completely. No picture book ever showed such developments after the happy ending. Ah, tears streamed down my cheeks. Lord Sullivan ran away from the manor and had not been found yet. Since then, the servants of House Noms, who already treated me coldly, began taking an even worse attitude towards me. How could she not stop her husband from committing those crimes? Did she really know nothing of the assassination? Why did she marry that man in the first place? I pretended not to notice the servants whispering such things behind my back. Please, someone, anyone, help me, save me, please, oh God in heaven. I looked at the stars twinkling in the night sky and held my hands in prayer. I knew I was thinking selfish things, but I couldn't think of any way to improve my situation except praying. There was no one I could rely on. I could only cling to God. Please, knock, knock, knock. Eh? Were my prayers answered? Someone suddenly knocked at my door. Who is it? So I asked, still sitting on my chair, but no reply could be heard. I approached the door and noticed that an envelope had been slipped under the door. What is this? Who's there? I opened the door, but the hallway was empty. Perplexed, I flipped the envelope. Lord Sullivan? I looked at the sender's name and couldn't help but shriek. I hurriedly covered my mouth with my hands and closed the door. A letter from Lord Sullivan, but who could have? I thought that Lord Sullivan did not have any allies in this house. Who could have delivered this letter for him? Anyway, I should read it. I quickly broke the seal and took out the letter inside the envelope. After reading the contents, I was wide-eyed in surprise. This cannot be, Lord Sullivan. The letter said that Lord Sullivan was currently taking refuge in a certain location. 
in order to gather the necessary military strength to take down House Maxwell, who was sowing seeds of rebellion against the royal family. Lord Sullivan was fighting to protect the kingdom of Lamperor Ouge. In the letter, Lord Sullivan apologized repeatedly for hurting me. His sincere words reminded me of the gentle prince I had met at the academy. R. Lord Sullivan, what should I, what should I do? At the end of the letter, Lord Sullivan wrote that he was going to fight Maxwell soon and he wished for me to be at his side to support him. Such earnest, heartfelt words naturally moved my heart. If I rushed to Lord Sullivan's side, would I find the gentle prince I loved? Lord Sullivan needs me, but if I went to his side, I would be betraying House Noms. Could Lord Sullivan really defeat that terrible House Maxwell? I weighed my expectations and love toward Lord Sullivan with a fear and awe I felt towards Lord Danger. The scales maintained a precarious balance and I was at a loss for what to do. Just then, the poem collection on my desk caught my eye. Between the pages of lyrics written by my favorite poet peaked the dried flower I used as a bookmark. Lord Sullivan, the bookmark was made from a flower picked in the garden where we swore our eternal love to each other. I recalled the days spent with Lord Sullivan at the academy, his bright smile, his calm voice, his gentle fingers combing through my hair, the happy days I had forgotten. Lord Sullivan has pleaded for my help. I have to go. I was going to take back my kind prince. I couldn't just stand around waiting. I had to go save my prince. The prince can slay the evil dragon because he is supported by the princess smile. I packed my belongings and quietly sneaked out of my room. It was already late at night. The whole manor was asleep. Father was away on business, accompanied by my brother. There was no one to stop me. I didn't know if Lord Sullivan could really defeat the Maxwell house. But in any case, I would probably never return to this house. I'm sorry, father, brother. Now that I resolved not to return, I looked back on our life together and realized for the first time how my father and brother actually treasured me. I had closed my heart to them all this time, refusing to accept their kindness. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please, forgive me. My heart aching at the thought of trampling their feelings again. I left the manor via the rear door. Lady Selina Noms? As soon as I was outside, a male voice called to me. I shuddered and stepped away from the man, shaking uncontrollably. Who goes there? The man that called out to me was a middle-aged gentleman. He did not look like a bad man. Because of the late hour, however, I had to be wary. Please, do not be afraid. I am one of Lord Sullivan's subordinates. My name is Zale. D. Did you say Lord Sullivan? Yes. My lord gave me the task of accompanying my lady to him. I have a horse carriage ready, if you would kindly come with me. Yes, please. After thinking for a little while, I decided to follow the gentleman. The horse carriage was a bit further away. It was a luxurious carriage, something house noms could have never afforded. The horse carriage was waiting for me. Its doors opened, and, for a moment it looked like a monster with its jaws open, for whatever strange reason. I'm coming, Lord Sullivan. I shook my head to drive away that ominous image and climbed onto the carriage. My lady, I shall be with the coachman. Please use this space freely. Oh no. I couldn't. Oh, it would not do for my lady to be alone with another man after all. We will arrive at Lord Sullivan's residence by tomorrow morning. Please rest until then. I see. Thank you very much. My guide went to sit at the coachman's seat, so I was alone inside the carriage. I wanted to know more about Lord Sullivan's current situation. But being alone with a male stranger would make me feel uneasy, so I accepted his proposal. The horse carriage eventually started moving. I was told to rest, but the anticipation to meet my lover and the guilt for betraying my family would not let me sleep. Or so I thought. MMH. I had not slept much recently. However, so my eyelids soon grew very heavy. Lulled by the shaking horse carriage, I drifted off to sleep. Section. The horse carriage apparently advanced throughout the night. The morning sun filtered through the window and woke me up. I looked out and saw a residence, where Lord Sullivan said he was currently hiding. We have arrived. My lady. R. Yes, thank you very much. The gentleman that guided me knocked at the carriage door and announced that we were at our destination. I rubbed my half-opened eyes. Lord Sullivan. Is here? Yes. Please allow me to show you the way. 
I stepped down from the horse carriage and looked up at the residence. It was more than twice the size of my home. Its luxurious appearance clearly showed a great amount of money had been invested in building it. Its sheer size surely required more than twenty servants to manage it properly. Curiously, the stone pavement and walls in the garden were shattered in places and there were strange black patches here and there, but overall it looked like a summer residence built for royalty. Lord Sullivan, how did you build such a magnificent manor? Lord Sullivan often mentioned his money troubles, but was it all an act? Could it be that his unstable attitude after coming to the eastern province was all a front he put up to deceive the eyes of the people of House Noms? Now I understand, Lord Sullivan has been preparing to do battle against House Maxwell this whole time. He said he went out drinking every day, but he was actually making these preparations. I reached such a conclusion all by myself, then followed the gentleman inside the residence. The residence was crowded with a large number of servants who all seemed busy working. If you don't wipe here first you're going to leave dust everywhere. I am very sorry. Please forgive me. I turned towards the voices and saw an elderly man, maybe around 70 years old, being scolded by a young butler. Who is that man? I asked the gentleman next to me. That elderly man recently entered the service of this residence. He is a fallen noble who lost all of his belongings and had nowhere to go. So Lord Sullivan invited him to come work here. Is that so? Lord Sullivan is as kind as ever. I couldn't shake the feeling of having seen that elderly man somewhere before but walked on without paying him too much attention. He was struggling with the cleaning. A job he certainly was not accustomed to, as he did not even glance at me. This way, please. Everyone is waiting for you, my lady. Oh, yes. Thank you. The guide showed me to a door in the back of the residence and I put a hand on the doorknob. Everyone, who could that be? I found the gentleman's words puzzling, but did not think on them too long and turned the doorknob. The contents of the room were thus revealed to me. Hey, it's been a long time. We've been waiting. Eh? Standing before me was my former fiancé, Lord Dinger Maxwell. W-Y-R-U? Ha ha, husband and wife are truly alike. Ha. Huh. You even ask the same questions. Lord Dinger sat on a chair and folded his arms over the desk. His tone was calm and friendly, but I felt indescribable hostility hiding deep within his mischievous smile. A chill ran down my spine. What? Why? That's what I want to ask you, you miserable fool. Eh? An angry shout suddenly struck me from the side. I shuddered and turned completely stiff. I turned towards that familiar voice and found none other than my father and brother standing there. Father? Why are you here? Why? Why? My sweet, kind father showed an expression twisted by unbearable grief. Why did you come here? You would have been forgiven if you didn't. Why? Was that man so important to you? A. R. That's not. But, looking at my father's face filled with anger and sadness as I had never seen before, I finally realized the gravity of my mistake. Next to my father, my brother also had a pained expression. Our eyes met, but he immediately looked away awkwardly. Zale, how long are you going to keep my lady on her feet? Offer her a seat. Certainly. My lord. W. Wait. The gentleman forcefully pushed me towards the chair set in the center of the room. Unable to do anything to resist. I sat down on the chair, the gentleman then held my shoulders down. I had no way to stand up or escape, Baron Noms. Yes, Lord Dinger called to my father. Even while crying and softly sobbing, father duly answered the heir to his lord's house. Now that things have turned out like this, I have no choice. Do you have any objections? None, young master. I leave everything to you. Lord Dinger. Very well. Very well indeed. After hearing my father's words, Lord Dinger exhaled, pleased. Then, you can go back. Sorry for all the trouble. I, I, Lord Dinger, Selinu is my only daughter, so, I know. Lord Dinger turned towards me. His eyes, like a beast observing its prey, paralyzed me. I promise her life will be spared. Don't make me say anything more. Yes. Further nodded to Lord Dinger's words, then left the room, his hair drooping down. My brother gave him his shoulder to lean on and they left together. Ah, my fate had already been decided, completely beyond my knowledge or control. 
Such fear compelled me to ask my father and brother for help. Lord Dinger's glare, however, prevented me from actually saying anything. The door closed behind father and brother. I would not see their faces anymore. Such a hunch, which felt so close to a certainty, filled my heart. So, my dear former fiancé, do you know why you are here? That's... I couldn't answer Lord Dinger's question. No, I do not. I didn't know why he was here, nor what I came here for anymore. I felt so confused. You do not know? Not at all? That can't be. You came to help Sullivan, the man who plotted my assassination. Isn't that right? Lord Dinger, however, mercilessly pursued me with his words. You came here to help him take down House Maxwell, to help him kill me. Isn't that right? Why are you pretending not to know? R. R. I finally realized in what position I actually was. I was. I fell into a trap. I have been tested, to see if I would side with Lord Sullivan or not. Is that right? You're quicker than Sullivan on the uptake, at least. That's correct. Lord Dinger laughed cheerfully. Before his horrifying laugh, I felt like a criminal waiting for the death sentence. What happened to Lord Sullivan? I was trapped with no way to escape. But what I wanted to know the most was what happened to the man who was not here right now, my husband. What happened to the man I once loved? Was he safe and sound? Or was he dead? He's not of this world anymore. The moment I heard those words, I felt all strength leave my body. I fell from the chair and collapsed on the floor. A. Ha. A ha ha. Ha ha. My prince is. Gone. My only. Prince. I laughed spontaneously. I felt as if my soul was leaving my body. I, what will become of me? Will I, be killed? I'll spare your life, out of respect for Baron Noms. But let me say this straight, you will not step one foot outside this manor ever again. Is that so? Aha, I got caught then, the evil dragon, gobbled me up, my prince, will never come for me. I laughed, laughed and snorted, louder and louder. I kept laughing hearing the sounds of my heart cracking to pieces. The prince fell before the dragon and the princess ended up in the beast's stomach, and they lived happily ever after. Chapter 23 The day the royal palace shook and the beginning of a turbulent age, I said let go, your highness, please calm down. Silence, you dare give orders to your king? That day, the royal palace was enveloped in a commotion. In the throne room, the king was ranting and raving his servants and the nobles, his subordinates, were desperately trying to contain him. The normally calm, or rather, meek, king was now raging furiously. Several days prior, a letter had arrived from a major noble house in the eastern province, House Maxwell. The letter explained how the former Crown Prince Sullivan, who had left the royal family to marry into House Noms, a barren house of the eastern province, had plotted the assassination of the heir to House Maxwell, failed and was killed in the aftermath. After reading the letter, the king, who still harbored feelings for the son he had let go, foamed at the mouth and collapsed instantly. He ended up sleeping for several days, but, as soon as he woke up, he sparked this commotion. My precious Sullivan was killed? Nonsense. This is all a conspiracy by the Maxwell house. Inform the generals immediately. House Maxwell must be destroyed. Gua, his highness did not mean those words. The king is simply terribly exhausted. You all have not heard anything. Is that clear? Duke Rosais hurriedly closed the king's mouth with his hands, to stop his unbelievable order, and barked at everyone present to forget what they just heard. The king flung away the duke's hands and angrily protested. Chancellor. Does this mean you are on House Maxwell's side? Those filthy traitors are treating Sullivan as a criminal, without a shred of proof. How can you allow that? Where is your loyalty? Your Majesty, I beg of you to settle down already. House Maxwell has sent proof. House Maxwell had indeed sent concrete proof that Sullivan attempted the assassination. There was a contract signed and sealed by Sullivan. When compared with the documents preserved in the royal house, it was verified that the handwriting matched perfectly and the seal was indeed Sullivan's royal seal. Sullivan's guilt was so incontrovertibly clear that anyone would not suspect it was really a setup. The compensation detailed in the contract also matches with the total amount of money Sir Sullivan borrowed from his friends in the capital. 
I'm sorry to say that there is no doubt about the charges against him. Shut up, shut up. Even if that was true, there is enough just cause to exterminate those Maxwell rebels. We're going to rescue Sullivan. Now, how absurd. Duke Rosai's face twisted in indignation. Other than the king and the duke, there were also several central nobles and functionaries working in the royal palace present, to publicly call a major noble house such as the Maxwell as rebels in such a situation might even spark a civil war. The king, however, did not seem to care for such implications anymore. As his inflammatory remarks continued, raise the troops and dispatch them to Sullivan's rescue. Now, I had Sullivan bring the immortal bracelet with him. He's definitely still alive and well. The immortal bracelet. Heracles, Duke Rosais was shocked. His eyes wide. You cannot be saying you have given that to Sullivan? You have given such a precious treasure to a disinherited prince? The immortal bracelet. Heracles, was an inestimable treasure handed down through generations of kings of Lanper or Uj. It was the symbol of royal authority, and only the king was allowed to wear it. There is nothing wrong for Sullivan. The next in line for the throne, to have the proof of royalty. Sullivan is the next king. He is my only son. I will never allow anyone else to take the throne, especially that little bastard. What? The king's words caused the nobles to stir. The current crown prince, the second born son, resembled his mother very much, but did not look like the king or Sullivan at all. However, who would have ever expected the king to publicly declare he did not recognize him as his son? Shut your mouth already. Gua, Duke Rosais could not allow the king to say anything worse. So he resorted to drastic measures. The duke's fist struck the king's stomach and his frail old body folded easily. None of the nobles or even the royal guards attempted to stop Duke Rosais. The king collapsed from fatigue. Quickly bring him to the royal chambers and do not let him outside until I say so. All servants who will enter the room shall wear earplugs. Why yes, right away, sir. Everything that happened here today must stay here. If not, you understand me, yes? Duke Rosais glared at the faces of all present, one by one. It was more than clear who truly was the person to fear most in the room. Yes, naturally, we have heard nothing, no one dared object, as all present violently shook their heads. Section. Half a day later, the king woke up and started raising a fuss again, rampaging in the room he was locked in. For better or worse, the king suddenly held his head and collapsed again, thus quelling the commotion. The king's life was saved by the royal family's secret potion, but, as a side effect he suffered from strong paralysis, which did not allow him to even stand from his bed by himself. Because of this, the crown prince, despite only being twelve years old, ascended to the throne, assisted by Duke Rosais as his regent. The national treasure was lost too long with Sullivan. The nobles' trust in the royal family was lost as well. The new king was not recognized by the former king as his legitimate son. Thus the kingdom of Lamperor Uj entered a new age, carrying such issues within it. The direction the turbulent kingdom was heading towards, was still a mystery to all. Chapter 24, A Traitor's Demise, and that's all I heard. How exactly did you manage to hear all that? I shared the rumors about the royal family related to me by my friend in the capital to my father, who reacted half impressed and half worried. The broken engagements, Sullivan's marriage into the Noms house and arrival in the eastern province, the attempted assassination of the Margrave's heir, its aftermath, and Selina's punishment. One month had passed since that series of events agitated the eastern province. After taking care of all related issues, I took a leave from work to recover in my private residence, with Eliza, Sakura, and some of my favorite maids. In my private residence, I enjoyed days of complete leisure accompanying my maids, crossing swords with Shana, and playing a game called Shogar against fangs of steel members. One day, however, I received a visit from an unusual guest. My father, he was apparently worried about his son and the attempted assassination. So he came to see how I was doing. Father and I were sitting at a table in the garden, drinking tea. I had the maids stand by a bit further away, so it was our first private time together in a while. The damage caused to the garden in the fight against Sullivan was already fixed. 
The soil drenched with blood had been replaced as well. In stark contrast to the elegance of the garden decorated by seasonal flowers in bloom, our topics of conversation were rather dreadful. People's mouths cannot be sealed, as they say, no matter how hard Duke Rose's eyes might dry, the king letting go of the national treasure, the new king is considered an illegitimate son by the former king, there's no way juicy rumors like these would stay hidden forever. HLNG, my migraine is starting again, I shouldn't have come here. After hearing me talk about the many issues that shook the Lamparor U kingdom at its core, father pressed his fingers against his temples with a pained expression. Let me ask, just in case. This isn't my fault, right? I wonder. Father answered my question coldly. The entire tumult brewing in the capital originated from my broken engagement after all. I honestly felt I owed an apology to Duke Rose Eyes, who was terribly busy dealing with the aftermath. Father's next words then made me wonder if he just read my thoughts. If you really feel sorry, why not return Heracles to the royal family? I heard from the soldiers who went to arrest him. He was wearing the royal family's treasured bracelet. What's that about? That bracelet disappeared with Sullivan, right? For heaven's sake, so you really plan to make off with that? I must warn you, my son. If they find out you took it, you'll be accused of treason. Even if it was all the former king's or Sullivan's doing, I had never seen further take such a serious expression. His fierce look would not allow any excuses or loopholes. It was the face of the guardian of the kingdom the man who had protected the eastern borders since before my birth. I averted my eyes from his serious look, looked up to the sky, and replied, Rest easy, I don't want to pick a fight with the royal family, I'm not as reckless as to believe I can take on the central nobles with the empire breathing down our necks, you make it sound like you would do it if it wasn't for the empire, don't glare at me like that, old man, I have my own plans, that's all. I wasn't exactly intimidated by my father's pressure but decided to express my honest thoughts. I also wanted to know how he would react to what I said, as Margrave of the Eastern Province. This country is pretty twisted, isn't it? The Empire to the North and East, the evil armies of the desert to the West, the pirates and island countries to the South. The four Margrave houses are fighting endlessly against these threats, but if just one of the four houses was defeated or turned to the enemy's side, the whole kingdom would crumble just like that. Dot. In this castle built on sand, the central nobles live coddled and protected, but look down on us as countryside nobles, as if it was the natural order of things. Sullivan called me a murderer to my face. But I imagine the central nobles all see us like that even if they don't say it out loud, you know? I paused for a moment, took my teacup and brought it to my lips. I sipped on the tea while thoroughly enjoying the aroma of its high-quality leaves. Father did not press me and waited until I finished drinking. <laughs> Delicious. Anyway, even if I didn't do anything, something will burst eventually, be it in the north, south, east. Or west. I'm just preparing for that. Fifty years, a country as corrupt as this sure managed to last long, huh? Are you planning to rebel against the kingdom? As I said before, I'm not going to do anything as long as the empire's in good health. I don't have enough pawns or weapons anyway. I tapped the bracelet in my breast pocket, careful not to let father notice. The immortal bracelet Heracles was the greatest fruit born by this series of events, but I wasn't satisfied yet. Not by a long shot. What I wished was not only to be able to win against the central nobles. My wish was to attain overwhelming power, something that could not be opposed by anything or anyone, something that appeared invincible in anyone's eyes, and ultimately declare the Maxwell territory independent from the Lamparor U kingdom. I honed my fighting skills, trained the soldiers. I gathered magic tools with the money I earned via domestic affairs, assimilated the fangs of steel into our forces as an assassination, spying division. Such preparations, however, were not nearly enough. Old man, I love the Maxwell territory. I love this eastern province. You can rest assured that I will never start a war that could bring suffering to the people of the East, as long as the royal family and the central nobles have even the smallest chance of victory. I will not do anything. I see. Further fell into thoughtful silence for a while. 
then leaned against the back of the chair. My headache is getting serious. Can I retire? I can't move freely if you retire this soon. So no. I thought so. Ah, this is painful. I miss my wife. I want to see Grace. Not another word about the old witch in my residence. I frowned and abruptly cut off father's words. At least, I now knew he had no intention to punish me. I breathed a sigh of relief and sipped on my tea. Oh yeah, I hired a new servant recently. Let me introduce her old man. The serious conversations were done for the day, so I changed the mood. Father shook his head, a sour expression on his face. Another one of your lovers, I bet. I can't say I'm interested. Don't say that. Just meet her. She's a really intriguing one. If you say that, it's fine. But I rang the service bell and told the maid who approached the table to bring the girl here. The maid quickly complied and led the girl to us. This girl is. Let me introduce you. She is Kanna, the newest member of the Fangs of Steel. Further looked at her unusual appearance and swallowed his breath. The girl I introduced was about 18 years old. Kanna was completely white, from the tip of her head to her toes. She had bright white hair, pale white skin, and eyes the color of ash. She wore a kimono, traditional clothing from the fangs of steel homeland, which was now completely white too. Only her lips were dyed bright red, looking like bright crimson flowers blooming in completely white plains. Her facial features could be described as charming but were devoid of any emotion. Unlike Sakuya, who had learned to hide her emotions through training, she looked purely empty of any emotion, as if she had not felt any since the day she was born. Further looked at Kanna, perplexed, then whispered, Kanna, you say? That can't be. She is, Selena Noms. Isn't she? I grinned at my father's reaction. The girl I called Kanna was indeed what became of Selena Noms. Kanna, the girl formerly known as Selena Noms slowly raised a hand and pointed at me, treasure, woman, collect, sword, devouring hero, cursed black dragon, Fafna, what the, what is she saying, Kana started speaking in a monotone and father frowned, she did not even react to my father's question, but pointed at him instead, protect, east, heart, south sea, stretching branches, to eternal maiden, guardian tree, sephiroth, hey now, Kana, don't point at father, that's rude. I'm, sorry, I, apologize, deeply. Din, what did you do to Selena? Hearing Kana listing words and broken pieces of sentences, my father glared at me again. I pursed my lips as if whistling and replied, I told you, she isn't Selena, she's Kana. I motioned at Kana to come closer. She pranced closer, so I pulled her hands and had her sit on my lap, then hugged her from behind. Look. Selena would never let me do something like this, right? She hated me to the point she tried having me assassinated after all. Look at this. Squeeze. Squeeze. I buried my head in Kana's whitened hair and enjoyed the light fragrance of her sweat. Father was rendered speechless. The kimono Kana wore was a sort of gown worn by passing your arms through it, which was then tied over the waist. Its greatest advantage was that it was easy to put your hands inside the chest part. I slipped my hands in between the folds and played a bit with her breasts. Even if her breasts were being touched, Kana's expression did not change at all. Her former self would have surely started crying out of fear if I ever attempted such a barbarous act. But now she accepted it normally. She's just like a doll. What in the world did you do? Further seemed sincerely disgusted. I grinned as I continued playing with Kana's body. I didn't do anything myself, really. It's all the Fangs of Steel guys doing. Selena, who I had captured during the aftermath of the incident as Sullivan's accomplice, was so shocked her mind was shattered. She just laughed and laughed, without even eating or going to the toilet, so I was honestly at a loss for what to do. In a state like that, I couldn't put her to work as I did with Sullivan, nor use her for pleasure in bed. I thus discussed what could be done with the Fangs of Steel ninjas and they proposed to take her with them. After about one month, the girl named Kanna was born. According to the Fangs of Steel people, she had the potential to be a Maiko. Maiko. One of those priestesses of the East, was it? Yeah. The female priestesses that can see things not of this world and hear the voice of the gods. They can even predict the future sometimes, apparently. In the Fangs of Steel there was an old woman with a similar talent. Under her guidance, Selena could develop her talents, 
develop her talents. She must have gone through some horrible experiences though. Selena was apparently forced to go through grueling training, such as being forced to drink special potions or being thrown naked in cold water. Based on her pure white hair and ashen eyes, it was evident that she had gone through something unimaginable. After such harsh training, her shattered self was reborn in the twisted form of the white Myko, Kana. I haven't asked about the details yet, but it looks like Kana can see a person's soul and their true essence. She also says some bizarre prophecies sometimes, according to Kana. The true essence of my soul was the cursed black dragon Fafna, an evil dragon who snatched away women and hoarded treasures. It did sound fitting for me, honestly. It looks like they taught her all sorts of techniques for night services too. I haven't tried yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Don't give me even more headaches now. How am I supposed to face Baron Noms? Father held his head tightly and leaned forward on the table. Incidentally, Baron Noms was cleared of his responsibility for Sullivan's rebellion because of his collaboration in Selena's capture. Some of the other nobles in the service of House Maxwell protested as it was too light a punishment, but I had forced Sullivan on them in the first place. I had great expectations for the next head of House Noms, Cray, so I thought that the dishonor of one of their family members having rebelled against their lord was punishment enough. Well, just tell him she's doing fine. It's not like he'll ever see Selena anymore anyway. I'm going back. You better wrap up this vacation of yours and come back to the manor. There's work to do. Yes sir, I shall do my very best. I raised my hands in surrender and looked at my further leave, accompanied by his guards. Sorry for all the trouble I cause you. So I whispered to myself as I looked at my father's horse carriage depart. I did not think of myself as a good son. I was well aware of what kind of weight I exerted on his nerves. Even so, I could not contain my desires and ambitions. I did not think that containing them was the right thing to do. I was probably going to continue causing all sorts of trouble and all sorts of headaches. You better live long, old man. Live long, great tree, not wither. I embraced Kanna's shoulders and went back inside the residence. Chapter 25 Thus history moved. NNH, R, young master. MMH, ha, ha, Lord Dinger, that's incredible. KH, you, master, not there. Q, NNH, 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 my, lord. A body as plentiful as the goddess of prosperity, Eliza, a small body and a myriad of techniques, Sakuya. Ideal proportions without the slightest excess, Shana a thin figure with yet thick, supple curves, Kana. I was making love with these four women repeatedly, one after the other, enjoying their bodies as my desire commanded. After all, the old man gave me his warning. My days of rest in my private residence were coming to an end. The best way to conclude was, naturally, a banquet with my beautiful ladies. Okay, I'll do from behind next. Kana, put your hands down. Yes, ah. It was the first night I made love to Kanna. She was Sullivan's wife, so I honestly didn't expect much, but her body was more balanced than I thought. There was pretty good affinity between us. I was worried that losing her emotions could also have turned her frigid, but when I tried this and that she showed deliciously tend reactions, I thought Sullivan might have planted some sick habits in her, but looks like I worried for nothing. Kanna, meow for me. Meow, meow. Good girl. Meow. Reborn from a shattered personality, Kana was as innocent as a newborn, she obediently absorbed anything I taught her. I felt the guilty, immoral pleasure of teaching such bad things to a child and my back shivered with excitement. It's not like I particularly like virgins, anyway, taking someone else's lover isn't half bad either. Snatching someone else's woman felt strangely exciting, especially if she's the woman of someone I dislike. Hey. Sullivan. I bet that felt good. To steal my woman and make it out like I'm the bad guy. I bet you felt like a damn hero. As a result, he lost his rank, his woman, and even his youth. I couldn't help but smile. My e e e o. I took the broken, pure white maiden and shaped her my way. To freely mold a woman as I pleased was something close to supreme bliss. He he. Young master, don't give all your attention to Ms. Kanna, please. Newer members should let us veterans take the lead. Oh well, I can go last, 
H hey, where are you hi ah. I casually switched to Shana, who was trying to sneak away. The night was still young. I was going to indulge in the banquet till I was completely full. My relations with them thus continued for several more hours. Section. Our banquet of love started immediately after dinner and continued for seemingly forever, but it too eventually reached its conclusion. We were lying on my king-size bed, our energies completely spent. Ah, that was great. I haven't felt this satisfied in a long while. So I whispered, my head buried in Eliza's ample bosom. Eliza was gently caressing my head. You have truly worked hard, young master. Worked hard? I'm sure I can go harder, though. I'm not talking about that. So many things happened these past few months. You must be tired, don't you? <laughs> Who knows? The series of events starting from my broken engagement. It first triggered Sullivan's disinheritance and the attempted assassination then the gradual fall of the Lamperor royal family and confusion in the central government. I knew that these problems weren't the end of it. Things are only going to get busier. I have rested plenty, so I'm not going to complain because of this much. Really? Please do not push yourself too hard. Eliza softly hugged my head. I fully enjoyed her tender embrace. HNN. I was there flirting with Eliza when Kanna suddenly slipped out of the bed and tottered towards the window. Hey, what's wrong? She did not answer me, however, and instead removed the window's bolt and locked to throw it wide open. A chilling wind blew into the room. Our hot bodies were cooled down instantly and Eliza shuddered. Kanna, it's cold, please close the window. Wait, she's acting strange. Kanna was stretching her hands towards the sky. Something then emerged from the darkness and landed on her white arm. An owl? That's the fangs of steel messenger owl. Sakuya got up from the bed too. The owl spread its wings, as white as Kana's hair, both being white. They got along well. That was surely not the case, but the owl pecked gently at her cheek. We use that owl for emergency communication. Kana, give the letter here. Kana obeyed Sakuya's order. Removed the small paper tube tied to the owl's feet and brought it to us. Sakuya spread the letter and quickly scanned it. This is, hey hey, what's it say? An emergency? Yes, it's urgent indeed. Sakuya raised her eyes from the letter and looked at me. The sharp look in her eyes was proof enough she was telling the truth. The emperor of the Bal Empire has passed. Apparently, the cause of death is illness. The words, related by Sakuya in a grave tone resounded in my head. The Emperor's death, House Maxwell had fought against the East and Bal Empire multiple times. I had heard rumors that the Emperor was ill, but I did not know it was something so serious as to cause such a sudden death. The Emperor had three sons, but had not named a successor yet. It was easy to see that some sort of internal strife would arise. I see, so this is what it looks like to see history in motion. Interesting. The King of Lamperor Uge falls ill. Then things start to move in the Bal Empire. The sparks of war are waiting to be lit everywhere. So this was history. Ages of tumult are born this way. I was now living in a turning point of history's flow. Interesting, so interesting. I sincerely thought so. My time had come. I was going to swallow everything, all events, all commotions, and turn them into sustenance for me and House Maxwell. I stood up, barely able to contain my ferocious excitement and faced the window. The sun was about to rise. The land, still immersed in darkness, was slowly seeing the light again. I looked at the sun, rising from the east, and pointed towards the direction the empire was supposed to be. Yes, this is my time. Kingdom, empire, you better shake in your sleep. A new era of war and turmoil is coming, and I will reign over it all. I'm a bastard. But this era is worse. This era of idiots who couldn't preserve its peace. Interlude 1, Dinger Maxwell's first battle. The day after I received the news of the Emperor's death, I began making preparations to do battle against the Empire. First, I had to contact the nobles affiliated to House Maxwell. I was sitting at the desk in my room, penning letters to the Eastern Province nobles my age who I had close relationships with. I see you are working fervently, my lord. But do you really think the Empire will attack us? Sakuya placed a cup of tea on the desk and asked me this question. I gave a glance to my black-haired maid, without pausing my pen on the paper. I don't want to say it will definitely happen, 
but chances are there is going to some turmoil on their side. I waited for the ink to dry, then put the letter in an envelope. I stamped House Maxwell's wax seal and wrote the recipient's name. The first and second prince's factions have been competing evenly for the last ten years. Neither has the decisive power to settle who is going to be the next emperor. The possibility that they will come harass the territories on the border in order to break that balance is definitely there. The Lamperor U Kingdom and the Bal Empire have always been sworn enemies. Winning over such an enemy would surely be regarded as a great achievement, a solid stepping stone to become the next emperor. The first prince, especially, had a long history with the Maxwell territory. His personal grudges alone could be reason enough to justify the invasion. Ideally, I'd prefer if the two princes started a civil war, but I know it won't be that easy. I see, by the way, Lord Dinger. I recall that the Empire attacked once just before I entered your service, is that true? Oh yeah, that was my first battle, five years ago, when I was thirteen years old. The Empire attempted a large-scale invasion of the Maxwell territory. It was a very important memory for me, as it was the first time I stood on the battlefield. I finished writing the second letter and took it in my hands. The recipients of the first two letters I wrote were my comrades in arms in that first battle. La Defrita, Sam Silphis. I gave the two letters addressed to them to Sakia and looked outside the window, the clouds trailing in the blue sky reflecting in my eyes. It's been a while since all three of us last gathered together. Our next gathering will be on the battlefield again, pretty fitting, I suppose. I recalled the battlefield where I fought with them and smiled. The faces of the two friends I trusted the most appeared in my mind. As well as the face of the hero who became my first and greatest enemy. Interlude two to five years ago. The prodigal son's disappearance. Point of view, Margrave Maxwell. So war is unavoidable. Yes. So it seems. I received the house steward's report and nodded gravely. My name is Dietrich Maxwell. I am the head of House Maxwell, Margrave of the eastern province of the Kingdom of Lamperor Uge, defender of its borders. Presently, the eastern province was facing a very risky situation, an invasion attempt by the neighboring country, the Bal Empire. The Bal Empire has been a long-time enemy of the Maxwell territory. We have fought many times over the years since before the birth of the Lamperor U Kingdom. The Empire, founded 200 years ago by Emperor Zebul Bal I, has always held the unification of the continent as one of its core principles. Guided by this goal, the Empire has repeatedly attacked its neighboring countries. Fifty years ago it clashed for the first time with the then Lamperor Uj alliance. Our battles with the Empire did not cease after the alliance was reborn as a kingdom. House Maxwell and House Ugard, located respectively near the eastern and northern border, crossed arms with the Empire on many occasions. The last invasion attempt was two years ago, wasn't it? Yes, the Empire's forces used the northern route that time, thus we did not participate in the battle. The Empire had become more and more active in the last ten years. The reason lies in the declaration made by the current Emperor, Pabia Bell, five years ago. The seat of the next emperor shall be inherited by who, among my sons, annihilates one enemy country first. The current emperor had three sons, he assigned one country to each son and announced that whoever defeated the enemy country and subjugated it under the empire's rule first would be his successor. Spurred by the declaration, Lars Bell, first prince of the Bell Empire, attacked the Lamperor U Kingdom. That blasted emperor and his blasted last words, why do we have to pay the price for their inheritance games? Master, the emperor is still alive, so I'm afraid those are not his last words. HMPH, it's just a matter of time. That nasty bastard. I snorted as I pictured the emperor in my mind. I had seen the supreme leader of our sworn enemies only once on the battlefield, when I was young. Now he was apparently ill and could not even leave his castle. Who knows how long he had left to live. If all princes failed to achieve their assigned goal before the emperor passed, the resulting inheritance conflicts would surely bring turmoil within the empire. For the Lamperor U Kingdom, there couldn't be a better prospect. In any case, we must prepare for battle. When is the empire's army expected to arrive? 
According to our scouts on the border, they are expected to reach Fort Bryden in 20 days at the earliest. 20 days, 5 days were needed to hold a war council and decide our counterattack strategy. 10 days to assemble the army and gather supplies. The fortress was one day away on horse, 3 days on foot from here. We certainly didn't have much leeway. I see. We will hold an emergency council of war first. Send orders to our retainers to prepare their troops. You have dispatched a messenger to Fort Bryden already, I hope? Yes, certainly. I have also sent word for our generals to gather, so the war council can be held immediately. I see. Excellent. Having a skilled house steward allowed me to move quickly and efficiently. He was an invaluable asset. I stood up from my seat and spoke my thoughts out loud. Oh, right. Let's have Dinger experience his first battle this time. The young master, my lord? Yes. He's already thirteen after all. It's time for him to experience the battlefield. I plan to put him in the rear. Of course. My son, Dinger Maxwell, was objectively an outstanding young man in many ways. He already excelled in his studies of both martial arts and horse riding skills and was also a quick learner in terms of internal politics and military strategy. He's getting a bit cocky lately though, I will let him see an actual battlefield to teach him how harsh reality can be. I had such thoughts in my head as I continued speaking. Since we're at it, let us have the effort to and Sylphie's sons see their first battle too. I'll have them accompanied in. The heirs to House Efritu and House Silthys, Viscount ranked retainers of House Maxwell, were currently staying in our residence. We were having them learn various disciplines, as well as build a relationship with Dinger, who would eventually become their lord. Let Din and those two participate in the Council of War. It will be a learning experience for them. I nodded to myself, convinced it was an excellent idea, and gave instructions to the House Steward accordingly. Ah, the young master. Actually, M.H. Did something happen? I encouraged the house steward to explain, and he did so in an apologetic tone. The young master and the two Viscount heirs have left early in the morning. It's already past noon though. They aren't back yet? Yes. Well, apparently. They went hunting in a mountain close to Fort Bryden. According to the message the young master left with Eliza. I'm going straight to the fort after the hunt. What? I couldn't close my jaw. My foolish son apparently went ahead to the battlefield on his own. Dinger Maxwell, the boy that would later be hailed as the Maxwell prodigy. It all started twenty days before his first battle. Interlude 3, The Three Rascals Climb a Mountain. My name is Dinger Maxwell. I am the heir of House Maxwell, the guardian of the eastern border of the Lamparoo Kingdom. I just turned thirteen years old this year. I was now in a mountain located close to the border, hiding in a bush. The reason was, young master, it's coming. Yeah, a red bear about two meters tall passed next to the bush we were hiding in. Red bears were the largest carnivorous animals on this mountain. The massive beast walked leisurely on its four legs. Its bright red fur rustled by the breeze. It had all the aura of the king of the mountain. Just a bit more. Three, two, one. Gotcha. Yeah. Grach. The red bear got caught in the trap we set up in advance. The upper half of its body was stuck in the pitfall, exposing its rear end and flailing hind legs. Do it, lad. Right on. Lad. One of the men who accompanied me, shot an arrow. The arrow hit the red bear near its hips. Grach. Grach. The beast writhed in pain. It forcefully pulled its body out of the pitfall and advanced towards us. Sam. Yes, sir. My other comrade. Hiding in a different spot, shot an arrow too. It struck the red bear on its head, but its thick skull prevented the arrow from penetrating through and the arrow fell to the ground. TCH, it didn't work. Please run, young master. No, it's okay. Leave it to me. The arrow didn't pierce the red bear's head, but it hit the beast near its size and succeeded in frightening it. I drew my sword and slashed the red bear's torso as I dashed past it. Grah, blood gushed and sprayed the ground. The red bear stood on its hind legs and tried to crush me with its massive front paws. Yep. Thank you for standing up. Now you can go to sleep. Standing up revealed the beast's weak point. I jumped in closer to the red bear and thrust my blade in its throat. GW, Gah, Grah, shut up already. Gwa, Gah, Grah. 
The red bear fell backward. I jumped on the red bear's huge body and used my body weight to push the blade deeper into its throat. The red bear swung its front paws like mad in a final struggle with its remaining strength. I extracted my sword and quickly jumped away so that the claws wouldn't reach. Gwa, ga. The red bear struggled for a while more, but its movements gradually dulled and it eventually died. Looks like it's dead. I shook the blood from my blade and put it back in the sheath. Great. We're having meat tonight. Dancing around the red bear, flaming red hair swaying in the air, was Lad Efrita, the firstborn son of Viscount Efrita, one of House Maxwell's retainers. He was thirteen years old as well. Sheesh, that was chilling. The man wearing glasses who emerged from a nearby bush was Sam Silthys, the heir to House Silthys, another retainer of House Maxwell. Like the other boys, he was thirteen. Sam took out a handkerchief from his breast pocket and handed it to me. Please wipe the bear's blood from yourself, young master. I thought my heart was going to stop when you jumped at the bear, honestly. Ha ha. Come on, it was just a bear. Of course I'm going to worry. After all, if something happens to you, we'll have to take responsibility and give our lives too. Lad and Sam had both been entrusted by their houses to house Maxwell. The goal was to have them study general disciplines and military strategy, in order for them to better serve House Maxwell in the future. Another reason was for them to build a relationship with me, the heir to House Maxwell. If we don't put my life on the line like this, it won't be a proper test of courage. The first battle is going to be a lot worse, you know? For heaven's sake, don't be so reckless on the battlefield too. Sam sighed, trying to calm my ardent spirits. The Maxwell territory would soon become a battlefield because of the invasion of the neighboring empire. It would also probably be our first experience of a real battlefield. In order to prepare for our first battle, we came to hunt bears on this mountain, close to Fort Bryden, as a test of courage. Incidentally, the only person I told about this expedition was my personal maid, Eliza. I kept it a secret from my father, the Margrave so we would surely be scolded once we went back. Kahaha, who cares? Let's cut this baby up, I'm hungry. There's no way beginners like us can butcher it properly. I'll go call people from the village at the foot of the mountain, so just wait. Lad laughed heartily, but Sam reprimanded him, slung his bow over his shoulder, and headed down from the mountain. Lad and I watched him go, then sat on the nearest suitable rock. Ah, I'm starving. Young master, you don't have anything to eat with you? I'd be eating it if I did. Sam was a polite, well-mannered man, but Lad had an unconventional personality for a noble. Even if I was the heir to the house of his lord, he addressed me rather casually. I was an only child, so being with them felt like having an older and a younger brother. Their company was very comforting to me. I got water though. Here you go. PFF, water? It can fill your stomach at least. If you've got the time to complain, why don't you start a fire instead? So we can cook the meat after they butcher it. Yeah, I guess I should go gather firewood. Lad stood up from the rock and started picking up firewood. He soon stopped, however, and cocked his head to the side. Hey, young master, there's someone over there. Just another hunter? No? Oh yeah, I guess so. He's got a basket so I guess he must be picking up herbs or something. Herbs. Lad's words caused me to frown. I stood up too and looked at the person Lad saw. A man wearing simple clothes made of hemp was on the path we used to climb up the mountain. He was walking while carefully looking at his surroundings, carrying a large basket on his back. Yeah, he sure looks like someone looking for herbs. But, my eyes narrowed as I observed the man more closely. Hey Lad. From this moment, we're kids from the nearby village. Act like that. Eh? What are you talking about? Just do as I said. I slid down the gentle slope, landing in front of the man with the basket. Whoa. The man was naturally surprised by my sudden appearance. Hello, mister. I smiled in a friendly way and waved at the man so that he wouldn't be wary of me. Oh heavens. Boy. I thought it was a bear for a moment there. Ha ha ha. Sorry. My name's Din. I'm from the village of Seiki. Are you from Ain Village, Mr. Seiki and Dane were both actual villages located at the foot of the mountain. Yeah, that's right. The man nodded, 
we came to the mountain in secret, so we were wearing simple villager-like clothing. The man would surely never imagine I was the Margrave's son. My name's Zap, and yeah, I'm from Maine. Did you kids come here alone? You're going to make your parents worry, you little rascals. The man named Zap looked at me and Lad, who came down after me, and raised his eyebrows. Nah, we come all the time anyway. What are you doing instead, mister? Just looking for herbs. As you can see, I nodded, convinced. Oh yeah, the sallow greens are in season, right? They really taste good in a stew. Right. But I haven't found any today, so I'm not giving you brats anything, okay? Stingy. Come on, you don't have anything to eat? Lad pouted and grumbled. He didn't have any manners from the start, so his way of speaking felt very genuine. He was very convincing as a village brat. I'm busy here. Get lost already. Che. Stingy. Stingy. We complained a bit more, then stepped out of the way. Before I left, however, I turned round and called to the man with a smile. Oh yeah, you're from Maine, right mister? So you know the elder, Lucas. I heard he's sick lately, tell him to get better soon. Okay? Sure. Whatever. Go home. I waved at the man as I walked away, going through the bushes until Zap could not see us anymore. Pretty careless, that guy. Huh? What do you mean, young master? Lad looked at me, confused and I grinned. In the mountains round here, the sallow green season is early spring. You aren't going to find anything now that it's summer. Besides, there's no one called Lucas Inane. Eh? What? Who's that guy then? A spy from the Empire, I bet. In the Empire, it's colder than here throughout the year. I bet he got it wrong because you can harvest sallow greens in this season over there. What? Hey hey, we can't let him go like that, right? Let's kick his ass. Lad looked behind us, baring his fangs. It looked like he would run off any moment, so I grasped his shoulders to stop him. Easy there, there might be other spies with him. It's pointless to catch only one. Anyway, Lad, have you ever seen fireworks? Fire, works? Lad was clearly perplexed by the sudden change of topic. He was still glancing in Zap's direction from time to time, so I knew he was still eager to run off fireworks. Those burning stones from the southern countries, right? I never got out of this country my whole life. Of course I haven't seen them. Really? I've seen them a couple of times. Actually, now I'm going to show you something similar, so endure it for now. I smiled broadly at Lad. He looked curiously at me, then nodded. We returned to where we left the Red Bear's corpse and found that Sam had arrived with the villagers who already started butchering the animal. I told the villagers we'd share the meat with them and they happily invited us to their home, where they treated us to stew. I thoroughly enjoyed my first bear stew, then started thinking about the upcoming battle against the Empire. Interlude 4, the father's fist and the mother's sword. We three then headed to Fort Bryden, anticipating the Maxwell armies. As I had foreseen, the Empire's forces were already heading this way. The soldiers in the fort had already been informed. Okay then, since we managed to arrive here early, might as well check out the frontline defenses before the old man gets here. According to the officer in charge of the fort, the Maxwell army would arrive in about two weeks. Until then, we trained with the soldiers stationed in the fort and observed its defensive structures. Then, ten days later, Margrave Maxwell had arrived a couple days in advance. You blasted for Ool, go. As soon as the old man, Margrave Dietrich Maxwell, entered the fort, his fist collided with my head. After becoming Margrave he did not go to the front lines as often as before. But my father was an extremely skilled swordsman who succeeded in winning the Royal Marshal Tournament in the capital ten times in a row. The fist of the man called the Sword Demon was so heavy I thought my head was going to split open. You little rascals. You've really done it. Uh, my deepest apologies. Lad and Sam were also subjected to the same two hour long hellish lecture I received. The old man had come earlier to the fort specifically to lecture us. The main army would arrive later. Was he so eager to scold me? Really? A test of courage at a time like this. I don't know whether I should be impressed or worried. After two hours of endless lecturing, the old man's anger finally abated. I pursed my lips and objected. They say kids have to learn on their own, right? 
We just gave ourselves a trial. That's not something a kid can say. Who did you get that from, honestly? The old man scratched his head hopelessly and sighed. Lad, Sam, you two can go. Not you, Din. Yes sir. With your permission. Yes, my lord. With your permission. Hey. Why only me? You two. Wait. My two comrades did not hesitate to abandon me as soon as they were allowed to leave the room. I glared fiercely at the door as it closed behind them and the old man laughed wryly. Rest easy. I didn't keep you here for another lecture. There's something I have to give you. What? Pocket money? If you want that, you have to behave. I have something for you from Grace. Grace. As soon as I heard that name, I began to make my escape. The house steward was standing in front of the door, so I ran towards the window and put a leg through it. Stop this instant. You're not going anywhere. The old man grabbed my collar and rested me back to the center of the room. Incidentally, we were on the second floor. It's your fault for saying that name. You're going to give me bad luck just before my first battle, you little. That is no way to talk about your mother. Yes, Grace was my mother's name. I didn't know what people normally thought of their mothers, but for me the mere mention of her name was enough to make me tremble in terror. For me it was simply insane of the old man to say that name just before my first battle. A very important event in my life. I can tell that you're thinking some really nasty things right now. Grace is a kind and loving mother, isn't she? You got maggots in your brain, old man? Want me to call the head doctor? The old man sighed at my reaction, but only received insults in return. As always, he was far too easy on her. How could he see illusions like that in that crazy woman? Honestly, Grace went out of her way to send a present for your first battle, you know. You better fix your attitude towards your mother. What? She sent a present for me? My bad luck wasn't over yet. I thought to run away again, but stopped once I saw the present in the old man's hands. That's a sword, right? Yeah, Grace sent this for you. There aren't any poisoned needles on the hilt, right? It won't explode if I take it out of the scabbard, will it? What do you think your mother is? A crazy woman screwed up in the head, is what I wanted to say, but I just kept quiet and took the sword instead. I took the sword out of the scabbard to see it under the light, revealing a steel blade. The hilt and scabbard looked a bit worn out, but the blade itself was very well built. It looked extremely sharp, it's not new, the design looks pretty old too. Is this an antique or something? Could it be a magic tool? A magic tool? The sword looked pretty old indeed, so it wouldn't be strange if it really was a relic from the ancient ages. However, well, supposing it's a magic tool, how do you use it? The problem was that I didn't know how to use it. What was the point of giving it to me without a single explanation? Don't be so rash, Grace included a letter. It surely explains how to use it. Yeah, right. The old man gave me the envelope and I opened it. I opened the letter and read it. But the contents were pretty simple. Grace prepared a present for your first battle. Isn't she a kind mother after all? I know that you're in your rebellious period, but you should show her proper respect and... Here, old man. The letter. You read it too. I gave the old man the letter and he read through it curiously. The letter read exactly as follows. To my son. Kill all enemies. Rape their women. Take their riches. Don't let even one go back alive. Grace D.O. Maxwell. What was that you said? Proper respect? Grace has a playful side to her. After all, she's just too embarrassed to be honest sometimes. Ha ha ha. What part of that is playful? That is your wife. Except the reality. Interlude 5. Twin Wings of the Empire. Lars Bell, first prince of the Bell Empire. In the first division of the Empire army he leads, there are two famous generals known as the Twin Wings. Three more days to Fort Bryden. Standing on a hill overlooking the marching army of the Empire was the Twin Wings right wing. Mighty General Bjork Sagan, a veteran commander in the Empire's service since the era of the previous Emperor, he was already over sixty years old. His hair was white and his rugged facial features showed many wrinkles as well. His physique, however, showed no signs of aging. His two-meter-tall muscular figure stood imposing like a massive boulder. Indeed, it will likely be a field battle, so the fighting will break out as soon as we arrive, I think. 
The slender man standing next to Zagan answered his words. He was the left of the twin wings, wise general as Halfers. He was much younger than Zagan, just over thirty years old, but his cunning schemes and strategies had allowed him to obtain his rank of captain of the first division despite his young age. Halfers faced the west, the direction of the Lamparor U kingdom, with a cold look in his eyes. So you believe Maxwell will not barricade in the fort? Zagan's words sounded like they were meant to test Halfers. The latter nodded and replied, Yes, Dietrich Maxwell is well known for his expertise in field battles, and as there are no expected reinforcements on his side, a barricade would be pointless. Maybe if our forces were more numerous they would have barricaded themselves in Fort Bryden. But that is not the case, is it? The forces sent from the Bal Empire to invade the Lamparor U Kingdom on this occasion were 6,000 foot soldiers and 1,000 armed cavalry exactly half of the total forces of the 1st Division of the Imperial Army. The Maxwell forces amount to about 5,000, including the troops provided by his retainers. Numbers are key in field battles, but with such a small difference between our forces, we cannot say to be at an advantage. If only we could have mobilized more troops. That cannot be helped. Our true enemy is not Maxwell after all. Halfers lamented their situation and Zagan responded by shrugging. Margrave Maxwell had repelled the Empire's attempts of invasions for the last fifty years. The Maxwell soldiers were fierce battle veterans, but if the full First Division attacked, their overwhelming advantage in numbers would surely lead the Imperial forces to victory. On the northern borders of the Lamparor U Kingdom, however, stood the house of Margrave Ugard. The pirates, rulers of the Southern Seas, always threatened the towns on the sea. These two powerful enemies did not allow the 1st Division to gather in one spot. Normally, we would have more time to make preparations. Yes, if only the Emperor did not issue that declaration. The twin wings looked at each other, a sour expression on both their faces. Their march on the Lamparor U Kingdom began without proper preparations because of certain words spoken by the current Emperor. The seat of the next Emperor shall be inherited by who? Among my sons. Annihilates one enemy country first. Such a declaration at the start of a succession conflict caused more confusion within the empire than to its enemies. The empire was a militaristic country. So choosing a powerful man as the next emperor was a legitimate idea, however, fueling conflict among the imperial heirs was equal to splitting the country apart. Zagan and other close advisors to the emperor advised him to reconsider to no avail. If the succession conflicts continue for long, the empire will lose more and more power and authority. It will not become a grave issue as long as the emperor is healthy, but if his illness worsens. Zagan then voiced his resolve to Halfers. We must win this battle, no matter what. Let us put Prince Lars on the throne with our own hands. Yes, our prince is still young and sometimes lacking but still a much better prospect than the other two. That was disrespectful, even for you. Zagan reacted sternly to Halfer's criticism of the prince but agreed with him in his heart. The first prince, Lars Bell, was still young, only twenty years of age, and tended to act on impulse. He was a straightforward man, however, and his prowess in battle was something to behold. If the twin wings gave Lars his support, he could surely become a fine emperor. The second prince, Gret Bal, was an excellent planner and schemer, but he cared little for others and tended to look down on anyone below his position. He was also rumored to have a penchant for very young girls, making him a very difficult person to serve sincerely. The last candidate to the throne, the third prince Seros Bal, had no intention to become emperor in the first place. He stayed shut in the province assigned to him never fighting against enemy countries, spending his days enjoying alcohol and women. I'll say it again, we must win this battle, no matter what, for His Highness Prince Lars' sake, and the sake of the Empire as a whole. Indeed, let us do our utmost, General Bjork, leave it to me. In order to achieve certain victory, the Twin Wings had come up with a strategy. The main forces, led by Prince Lars and General Halfers, would proceed straight toward Fort Bryden and engage Margrave Maxwell in a field battle close to the fort. In the remote case the Maxwell forces barricaded themselves into the fort, Halfers would raid the villages and towns nearby to lure them out. 
Zagan and a small force of 500 elite soldiers would cross the mountains to circle the Maxwell forces and catch them in a pincer attack. Their numbers were very small, but they were an elite group led by the 1st Division's strongest general, so the enemy forces would surely be shaken. The Margrave's forces would grumble, paving the way for the Empire's victory. To penetrate the enemy territory quickly and strike the Maxwell forces from behind, as well as do battle against Maxwell's powerful troops. With only 500 soldiers is something only you could pull off, General Bjork. It pains me to entrust you with such a dangerous task, but, you don't have to. If this is the best plan conceived by you, our army's finest strategist, I will devote my mind and body to its success. It is a shame that His Highness did not approve. The two generals recalled that Prince Lars opposed the plan and sighed. We are soldiers of the mighty empire. Such feeble tactics are not fit for us. Even if I achieved victory through underhanded means, who would ever recognize me as the emperor? To use our strongest general for such a thing is complete nonsense. The twin wings had a hard time convincing the prince, who strongly disliked relying on schemes in battle. Especially Halfers, since the plan he had thoroughly honed had not only been completely rejected, but he had also been insulted personally so he barely managed to restrain his anger. The prince will surely realize your true value one day, my friend. An emperor cannot keep his hands immaculate forever after all. On the contrary, people like you are who our emperor needs the most. Do not worry about me. Rather, please be wary at all times. Margrave Maxwell is a straightforward man like our prince, so he will not notice our plans but there is a chance that he is raising promising young talents as well. In that case, they simply will fall before me. You make sure His Highness is protected at all times. I will, no matter what it takes. The two generals silently bumped their fists, then headed to their respective tasks, without knowing that they had now spoken with their most trusted comrade in arms for the last time. Interlude 6 Battle Preparations Stand by in the rear with 30 attendants some and lad included. Going to the front lines is prohibited, the rest is left to your judgment. Is that all? Yes, his lordship insisted that you do not do anything rash, young master. Doesn't he trust me at all? Damn stubborn old geezer. I heard my orders from a soldier and looked up at the sky. Irritated, the Empire's army was scheduled to arrive at the fort the next day. The old man was going to set out for battle, leading the province's forces with him. Since it was our first battle, we were to stand by in the rear, we could expect to not experience any actual fighting. Those are some pretty soft orders though, letting me take at least one enemy in my first battle would be more important, so that people wouldn't look down on me as the next Margrave. His lordship is worried about you, young master, please respect his wishes, I frowned and the soldier who brought the message tried to appease me. The battlefield will be the plains. Our forces amount to 5,000, the enemies to slightly over 6,000. It's not a battle we can't win, but, who knows? Do not worry, young master. We have fought the Empire in similar conditions many times and have never lost. Please believe in the strength of House Maxwell. I don't have any doubts, of course, but if the Empire always loses in those conditions, I wonder whether they will fight the same way again. That's, because they're barbarians who think about nothing but fighting, after all. So that's it. All I knew was from rumors, but the Empire's 1st Division supposedly had two very skilled generals, Zagan and Halfers. This battle is very important for them, since the seat of the next Emperor might depend on it. They can't afford to lose, so would they really call the so-called Twin Wings for a strategy proven not to work? They had to have a secret plan up their sleeve. I recalled the suspicious man I found in the mountains the other day. They bet it all on an ambush, I guess. It sure pays off to go mountain climbing sometimes. Did you say something, young master? Nope, nothing. By the way, did the things I ordered arrive already? I changed the topic with a different question. Oh, yes. A carriage arrived from House Maxwell for the young master. The place is. I heard the location of the carriage and serenely nodded. Got it, thanks. You can go now. Thanks for everything. Ah, yes. The soldier seemed a bit perplexed, but followed my orders and left. I went to see the carriage and checked its contents. Good. 
Good. They sent everything I asked for. The carriage was loaded with five large boxes, each marked with the words keep away from fire. Hey, young master, what are you up to? Oh, it's you, lad. Lad was walking towards me, with Sam at his side. The latter spoke to me too. We're going to be stationed together tomorrow. What shall we do? Stay in the fort, or observe the battlefield from the rear guard? Let's go to the front lines. No one will find out if we keep quiet. I'm not going to keep quiet. If I disappoint the Margrave anymore, it will damage the reputation of my house. You're going to betray us? We're friends, man. Lad and Sam started quarreling noisily. I glanced at them as I opened one of the boxes and took out its contents. It was a large clay pot, wrapped in straw to cushion any impacts on the way. It was sealed with a wooden lid from which a short piece of rope poked out. What's that? Lad peeked over my shoulder and asked about the pot, a puzzled tone in his voice. I raised the pot and grinned. I had these prepared in case we needed them. Working hard when you're young really pays off, as they say, who would ever thought that the shitty witch's teachings would come in handy one day? Huh? What are you talking about? Yes, what are you saying, young master? Lad and Sam both looked at me, confused. Despite fighting so often, they were perfectly synchronized sometimes. Our plans for tomorrow are decided already. We're going mountain climbing and playing a bit with fireworks. Oh, okay. Ha, understood. What's with your faces, both of you? I grinned, exposing my canines, and both of my comrades reacted by stiffening up. I later learned that at the time, my smile looked as scary as a dragon naming for its prey. Interlude 7 the feast starts with fireworks. The first division troops, led by Bjork Zagan, were proceeding through the mountain. Five hundred armed soldiers were climbing up the mountain path, stepping over grass, crossing through the bushes. The scouts previously sent by his halfers had mapped the mountain paths completely. They had to avoid being seen by anyone for their ambush to succeed so they chose roundabout paths that the locals seldom used. The faces of the soldiers trailing up the steep mountain paths were showing signs of severe fatigue. Their morale was still unaffected, however, as they were led by the hero of the Imperial Army, after a full day of climbing. They finally reached the mountain top. Good. This will be our final rest stop. Once we cross to the other side, the battlefield will be before us. The Empire's victory depends on us. Steal your resolve, all of you. Yes, sir. The troops' final rest stop was in a valley just before the peak that separated them from Fort Bryden. The valley was surrounded by tall wells of rock, so there was no risk for anyone to spot them. They could use a nearby stream to replenish their water supplies. It was the ideal spot, as observed by the spies who had explored the area. Few. I'm too old to climb mountains like this. Zagan sat on a large rock and sighed. His imposing physique was already over sixty years old, every day he felt his strength leaving him. I wish I could retire already and spend my last days in peace, but that will have to wait until the kingdom falls. If the Empire could subjugate the Maxwell territory in this battle, the fall of the kingdom would be close. The central nobles, with their lack of any actual battle experience, would crumple like paper before the Empire's invasion. The other Margraves were fully occupied with defending their borders, so they would not have the troops to spare. Forty years had already passed since Zagan first joined the Imperial Knights, thinking that his long battle was finally coming to an end. He felt the wrinkles on his face smoothen. His elite troops were convinced victory would soon be theirs too. They were resting, exhausted by the unfamiliar mountain path but their eyes brimmed with expectation. Phew, I'm beginning to lose it. At a certain age you start losing focus right away. I have to whip the troops into shape before we depart. Bump. Zagan stood up, thinking to rouse the troops, when something hit his foot. A black sphere had rolled up to him. He picked it up and saw it was a pot made of clay, with a short rope sticking out of it. The short rope was burning. Troops head down. Zagan realized what the object really was and shouted. At the same time, the pot exploded with a thunderous boom. The boom was not only just one. It was followed by many others all over the valley. The soldiers' screams of anger and agony were overwhelmed by the loud explosive sounds. As their silhouettes disappeared in thick black smoke, 
Whoa, so that's fireworks? Looking at the series of explosions down the cliff, Lad cheered loudly. Excited by his first experience of the power of gunpowder, he lit another clay grenade and threw it down. I had led Sam, Lad, and the thirty soldiers assigned to me up the mountain behind Fort Bryden. We found the Empire soldiers in hiding, just as expected. So we took a position above their rest stop and started attacking with the clay pot bombs I had prepared. I do not think those are actually fireworks, but, young master, where did you retrieve such things? Sam's reaction was very different from Lad's. Every explosion made him shudder and tremble. Nevertheless, he continued throwing down clay grenades, a testament to his serious personality. Gunpowder and bombs were weapons often used in the southern countries beyond the sea. Their usage was mostly unknown in the kingdom and the empire, as well as how to manufacture them. Apparently, the southern pirates used gunpowder to attack enemy ships. The damage they caused was clearly substantial. It pays off to work hard when young. Indeed, my mother loves toys like these, you see. Because of that, she often forced me to make them when I was little. Thanks to that I learned how to make them, which I did from time to time to keep a good number in stock. Your lady mother, hey hey, keep your hands moving, keep throwing. If you're out of bombs, start shooting arrows. Yes, sir. The Maxwell soldiers started raining arrows on the valley, covered by the black smoke. They couldn't properly aim, of course, but for any survivors among the Empire troops it was definitely dangerous. It's impressive how you could find the Empire's ambush though. This mountain is really wide, isn't it? They used spies to explore the mountain after all. If they planned to cross the mountain unnoticed and strike the Maxwell forces from the rear, this was the ideal spot to take a rest. The plan was probably conceived by his halfers the wise general of the Twin Wings. It's hard to predict how dumb people will act, but smart people act rationally and logically, so it's not difficult to anticipate their train of thought. I'm impressed, young master, truly, don't praise me too much, Sam, or I'll get cocky. Well then, I doubt they'll be able to regroup and come attack now, they're going to retreat any moment now. A roar even louder than the explosions echoed through the valley, as a giant silhouette emerged from the smoke. A figure as tall and bulky as a bear climbed ferociously up the cliff, almost running vertically. Are you serious? You bastards. In no time, the massive figure reached the peak. It belonged to an imperial soldier, who made use of the momentum of his climb to leap in the air and swing down his spear. Gah. Wah. The incredibly heavy blow shattered the rock and caused a landslide. Some of the Maxwell soldiers were caught and fell down the cliff. I managed to keep my footing and glared at the man who delivered such a terrifying blow. He was one of the twin wings, mighty General Bjork Sagan. The strongest general of the Empire pointed his spear towards us. Interlude 8. The old hero swings his spear. Bjork Sagan, as heroic as the rumors, he had not introduced himself nor had I ever met him before. But I couldn't imagine there being another man brimming with such a gallant aura and fighting spirit in the Empire. You are the leader of this group? So young. No. A child. Zagan spoke while looking at me. His tone was calm, but each one of the words he uttered was full of a chilling killing intent. His intimidating aura felt like it made the very air tremble. There was no better proof of his heroism. It pains to take the life of promising youth. But you surely do not expect to receive any mercy after all you have done. Mercy, huh? Well, I don't think it would hurt for you to hold back a little against a child. Do not make me laugh. You attacked the very moment when our guard was the lowest and our exhaustion was at its peak. You have noticed our presence here, prepared such rare weapons in great quantity. How could I ever treat someone so talented as a child? Zagan swung his spear ripping through the air and shaking the trees violently. His lance had an axe-shaped blade on the tip, it was a halberd, which allowed him to perform bludgeoning, slashing, and thrust attacks as well. My troops have fallen already. We cannot advance any further, I thus shall take your head in exchange for such a failure. The old general thrusted the hilt of his halberd on the ground and howled to face the full brunt of the killing intent of the Empire's strongest general right from my first battle. It looked like I was destined for great things. Old man, you better not get too arrogant. Lad, 
who had managed to escape the landslide, jumped at Zagan, weapon in hand, the broadsword, which he swung with power much greater than the other boys his age, was probably on par with Zagan's halberd in terms of mass. MMMGH Whoa! Zagan swung his halberd too fast for the eye to follow, clashing with Lad's broadsword. The latter was blown backwards, weapon and all. Lad, KH. Sam quickly jumped in to catch Lad, but couldn't suppress the momentum. They were thus both blown away and disappeared in the nearby thicket. Stay out of my way, you brats. Hey now, what's up with that weapon? Can it change its weight or something? Seriously. I glanced at my friends being blown away and whispered. My eyes narrowed, shattering rock and blowing them away like that wasn't something possible through muscular strength alone. That halberd seemed to be over 100 kilos. The old man before me was indeed very muscular. But there was no way he could swing such a heavy weapon around so lightly. He definitely couldn't have run up the cliff carrying it either. It was impossible to explain the events I witnessed, unless the halberd's weight could be manipulated freely. Ooh. You have seen through my halberd's true nature in such a short time. Zagan's eyes opened a little wider, then he started speaking proudly. My halberd, C. Itenzai, possesses the ability to manipulate weight. It can render objects light as a feather or heavy as boulders. It is a magic tool bestowed upon me for my loyalty by His Highness the Emperor. I see, that's how you could climb up the cliff so easily. I felt sweat drip down my back after Zagan's words. The halberd's ability explained how Lad could have been blown away like that. The weapon was made lighter to swing it quickly, then the axe part was turned over 100 kilos heavier right before the impact. The great momentum thanks to the weapon's light weight and the weight of the axe combined to create a force greater than a charging boar. But the most fearsome part was that the old man before me knew how to use the halberd's abilities perfectly. I could have figured out a plan against a beginner who only relied on the weapon to fight, but the man before me was a master of his art even without such a weapon. Even if Zagan had come armed with a normal spear, I would have very slim chances of victory. Damn. This is really bad, I got too cocky. I shouldn't have come here with just my men. I should have reported the ambush to father and let him deal with it. I should have never even thought of trying to make exploits for myself to show him what I could do. Ha, huh. gh. This is bad. Zagan swung his halberd and charged at me. Lad and Sam disappeared into the woods. The other soldiers fell down the cliff because of the landslide and could not fight again immediately. I completely overestimated my strength. I'm going to die here. I regretted my recklessness as I faced such a desperate battle. I put up the steel blade received as celebration for my first battle to protect myself against the halberd approaching me at fearsome speed. Interlude 9, a new hero swings his sword. He's something, quite like a young lion. No. A young dragon. Zagan praised the young boy before him as he swung his C.I. and Zai. He made his halberd lighter, swung it, and slammed it down after making it heavy again. It sounded simple in words, but it was the very reason why Zagan had buried countless enemies in his military career. The technique that made him undefeated. Each one of his blows could be lethal. But the boy, who barely had any experience in battle, managed to parry them all. If he took any of the halberd's attacks head-on, their weight would crush him easily. The boy seemed to know that too, as he nimbly deflected them all with his blade. Not only that, but he was even ready to strike back as soon as he found an opening. How could there be so much audacity in such a small body? Even in a situation where the slightest misstep meant death, the boy continued fighting against an opponent superior to him. In ten years? No. Even only five years he could have surpassed me in military prowess. His attack on my troops was incredibly well executed. As a strategist, he already rivals Halfers. Truly regrettable to be forced to crush such budding talent here. But that was also the reason why Zagan absolutely had to crush such budding talent then and there. Zagan was sure that, if left alone, the boy would surely grow to threaten the Empire's very existence. Ugh. Zagan's attacks became even fiercer. To protect the Empire's future. To remove a menace that could destroy the Empire. Zagan unleashed every ounce of his military might. Ugh. This is bad. Damn damn damn. I continued parrying Zagan's attacks, one more powerful than the last. 
while screaming internally. If I received even only one of the halberds strikes, I was definitely a goner. Those were the attacks I continued to barely evade, as if walking on a shaky tightrope above certain death. If only, if only I could block at least one. Zagan was undoubtedly a veteran of the battlefield. His offensive had no openings, leaving not even the smallest chance for a counterattack. If only I could block the halberd's attacks once, if only I could knock it away, I could maybe have the chance to strike back. Yeah right, no way. He's going to crush me. It was a completely reckless idea, however. The attacks of the halberd freely changing from light to heavy were powerful enough to shatter boulders. How could a thin blade like mine block them? I have to find another way. Are you sure about that? Eh? Are you really sure you can't stop it? Why don't you try? What the? Who the hell are you? I was straining my brain at full throttle to find a way out. But suddenly something interrupted my thoughts. It wasn't someone else's voice. Nor a message from above or anything. That voice sounded just like my own. Try it. You might be able to stop it. Actually, no way. I can feel it. I'll just get crushed. Even if you stay on the defensive like this, you'll eventually die. Why not take a bet instead, sink or swim, live or die? That's... no. It can't be. The voice in my head offered no proof to its words. It was like a devil whispering in my ears. Strangely enough, however, I did not feel I should ignore it, and felt compelled to follow its advice instead. Kh, damn you. Zagan's offensive became even fiercer, and my face twisted into a grimace. I was going to run out of energy first, definitely. I could already feel the cold scythe of the Grim Reaper pushing against my neck. If you die here it's all over. It will mean you were only that much of a man. But if you are worth more than that, Dinger Maxwell, you, I can become a hero. Or the evil dragon that devours them. Ha. Huh. I knew the next blow was going to decide my fate. I mustered all the strength I had and, obeying the voice in my head, blocked Zagan's halberd. What the? Zagan was shocked. His facial features clearly showed that he couldn't believe his eyes. So, heavy. I gripped my sword with one hand, using the other to support the blade and block the halberd. The blow delivered by Zagan's arms was so heavy I could feel my own arms turning numb. However, my sword was not broken. My bones were not crushed. The weight manipulation is gone. Kh, you're not getting away. Zagan faltered for a mere split second. But in that split second, I could step closer to him. Ha, LNMGH, I'm going to die, so thought Zagan, as he activated his trump card. It was another way to use C Itent's eye, to turn the enemy's weapon lighter and reduce the strength of its attacks. No matter what kind of attack the enemy unleashed, without mass its power would become nothing to destroy Siegfried. Gah? This can't be. My slash reached Zagan. It nullified C. Itent Zai's magic effects, tore through his heavy armor, deeply scarring his robust body. This is the end. Jork Zagan. Kh, not so fast. I immediately followed with another slash, to finish him off. Zagan, however jumped backward with incredible agility. He had distanced himself from me with speed and momentum defying gravity, escaping the range of any follow-up attacks I could do. Kh. Ha, that sword, is a magic tool too? Yeah, so it seems. I just found out too. Actually, the sword gifted to me by mother apparently had the power to nullify the abilities of other magic tools. The power to nullify magic. I did not know the reason why. But now I perfectly knew how to use the sword, as well as its name, Siegfried. I see, so the magic tool taught you to. I have even more reason to not let you go. I am going to kill you here and now, even at the cost of my life. Really now, it's an honor to hear that from the Empire's hero. The wound I inflicted on Zagan was not shallow. Blood was flowing continuously from the gash opened in his armor. On the other hand, I was still unscathed, but I was sweating profusely on the brink of collapsing from exhaustion. Our conditions were approximately the same. No one could tell who would win. Too bad for you, though. What? Sadly, this is war. Don't go saying I'm cheating, alright? Protect the young master. Shoot. W-H. 
arrows rained on again from above. Sam had come back who knows when and had gathered the scattered Maxwell soldiers and executed well-timed cover fire. Guuuuuch Zagan spun his halberd to knock down the arrows, but could not prevent them all from piercing his body. I took advantage of that opening to close in again. Ha! Uuuuch Zagan noticed my attack and blocked it with the halberd. Our arms were locked as our weapons clashed. Lad! Take this, Gwoach lad jumped in from the side and swung down his broadsword, aiming at Zagan's arms. The Imperial General's thick arms were both severed and fell on the ground. Together with the halberd, Zagan's legs too lost their strength and he collapsed as if kneeling. I swung my sword to give him the coup de grace, but... Your name, eh? I didn't ask for your name, young man. That's true. I nodded and gave a final gesture of mercy to the old dying general, Dinger Maxwell, prodigal son of the Maxwell house. You were definitely stronger than me. I am proud from the bottom of my heart that the opponent of my first battle was the hero Bjork Sagan. I see, I must thank you for such a final battle. Young dragon of the Maxwell house. My pleasure, farewell. I swung down my sword as Sagan's head detached from his body and a spray of blood erupted on the mountain top. Interlude 10. Meanwhile, on the battlefield, on the main battlefield, the two armies were standing by, observing each other. On one side, the attackers, the first division of the Bal Empire army, which attempted to invade the kingdom of Lamparor Uj as a step towards the empire's goal of conquest of the whole continent. On the other side, the defenders, the forces of the eastern province, led by Margrave Maxwell gathered to protect the borders of the kingdom. In the Maxwell forces camp, Margrave Dietrich Maxwell was terribly restless. This is bizarre, what in blazes are they planning? Half a day had already passed since the battle began. Neither army, however, had suffered any significant casualties yet. The reason was that the invaders, the imperial forces, were staying on the defensive for whatever reason, as the eastern province forces were smaller in number. They could not attack from their own side, thus the two armies ended up in the current stalemate situation. Are they trying to lure us into a trap? No. This is Maxwell territory after all, and there was no sign they were building traps. What are they waiting for, then? Something terrible was happening without his knowledge. Such an ominous hunch turned Dietrich's expression bitter. Efrita send someone to scout the surroundings. I have a bad feeling about this. Immediately. My lord, Viscount Efrita nodded and left the camp, accompanied by a few of his men. Dietrich looked at his retainer's leave, then glared at the disturbingly immobile enemy camp. Empire dogs, I don't know what you are plotting, but you will not have your way, my lord. I bear shocking news. What happened? Viscount Efrita, who was supposed to go scout the surroundings, had already come back. His expression was clearly shaken. Dietrich realized that his hunch had been correct. The Empire troops moved, right? Uh, no. Actually, Viscount Efrita's next words, however, were completely unexpected. It seems that the young master, Lord Dinger. What? Dietrich's body arched backwards in surprise at the unexpected mention of his son's name. Section. On the other side of the battlefield, the Imperial forces were restless as well. Inside the headquarters tent of the Imperial camp, the first Imperial prince, Lars Bell, was shouting angrily. What happened? When is Zagan coming? The barely twenty years old prince, sitting on his chair, threw the cup he was holding to the ground, shattering it. The wine in the glass spilled on his subordinates, but he continued shouting regardless. This is why I was against the plan. If we attacked from the front, without cheap tricks, we wouldn't have to face Maxwell. Without our strongest general, like now. My deepest apologies. The left side of the twin wings is Halfers, bowed his head without making excuses. What happened to you, General Bjork? Please be safe and sound. Halfers felt restless too in his own way. His brother-in-arms failed to appear, despite the expected time being passed. His usual calm and collected demeanor now showed signs of worry. Prince Lars stood up, brimming with indignation his golden hair waving in the air. Our only possible course of action now is to annihilate Maxwell ourselves. All troops, prepare to charge. P please wait, your highness. That is too dangerous. Hasfl hurriedly tried to stop the prince. The imperial forces had greater numbers. 
but each of the Maxwell soldiers were of much higher quality, facing them up front was a risky bet. Silence. Who caused this situation in the first place? Ark. Halfers pressed further, but Lars struck him with his fist. The splendid tactician was thrown against the tent, ripping the fabric as he fell to the ground. What good is standing around like this? Maxwell could come attacking at any time. The advantage obviously goes to who moves first. Be but your highness, please, let us wait a little more time for General Bjork to. Enough. Prince Lars disregarded his loyal vassal's words and stomped out of the tent. An imperial soldier, however, approached the young prince. Your highness. Soldiers apparently belonging to the Margrave's forces are heading this way. K.H. So they moved after all. How many are there? T they are. The soldier hesitated at first, then clearly answered his lord's question. They are, only three. Interlude 11, the dragon soars to the heavens. So this is the battlefield. What a majestic sight. The imperial army to the right. The eastern provinces forces to the left. Our horses advanced proudly exactly in the middle of the two unmoving forces. I was carrying a spear wrapped in cloth. My new trusted blade, Siegfried, was safe in the scabbard at my waist. Ha ha ha, this is awesome. Both armies are huge. A few thousands of soldiers, simply standing there, that is enough to make them an intimidating sight. Phew, his lordship is going to scold us again. To my right and left, I was accompanied by Lad and Sam. They were half excited, half shaken by the large armies surrounding us but followed me nonetheless. Let's start, then, for the victory of the Margrave army. When we arrived at the exact center of the battlefield, I proclaimed loudly to the armies to my right and left, Here, here, O oh, proud soldiers of the eastern province, O oh, lowly barbarians of the imperial army. Still riding on my horse, I thrust the spear I was carrying into the ground. Both armies, unable to decide on how to deal with our sudden appearance, simply listened. The Empire's despicable scheme to send troops through the mountains to ambush the eastern province forces from the rear has been crushed. The Empire's hero, Jorg Zagan, has fallen before my blade. The two armies started buzzing loudly. The Imperial forces, especially, expressed their anger and doubt towards the supposed defeat of their war hero. I speak nothing but the truth, and this spear is proof. I removed the cloth wrapping the spear and held it high. It was Seitan's eye, the halberds again wielded. What the cloth concealed, however, was not the spear itself, rather what was thrust on its tip. As soon as they saw it, the imperial forces started wailing. G General, General Zagan, it cannot be. It can't be. General Zagan's head. Indeed, thrust on the halberd's tip was the head of Jorg Zagan, the Empire's hero. The imperial forces wailed and screamed in despair at the sight of what became of their hero. Ooh, it's true. He took down Bjork Zagan in his first battle. Viva Lord Dinger. Viva Maxwell. On the other hand, the eastern provinces' forces cheered in triumph. I raised Zagan's head towards my allied forces. O oh proud warriors of the eastern province, it is time to annihilate the vile invaders. It is time to uphold our justice. Ooh. The eastern province forces war cries roared through the battlefield. The soldiers started rushing out of the camp, charging towards the imperial army. It's over. On the other side, in the imperial camp, many soldiers were crawling on the ground, despairing. Some were weeping at the demise of their hero. They certainly were not in any state to face the eastern province's assault. GGHH, what are you doing? Prepare to meet Maxwell's attack. Lars barked orders loudly, but there was no one who would obey him. Most of the imperial troops were either paralyzed by despair or were fleeing already. Probably less than one-tenth of the imperial forces retained any fighting spirit. No good. This is not good at all. We won't be able to stop them. Is Halfers, while lamenting the death of his comrade, realized the battle was lost. As well as what he was supposed to do next. Soldiers, take his highness and retreat immediately. Those who can still fight, follow me. We will protect His Highness with our lives. Halfers, you, Your Highness. The reason for our defeat lies completely in the plan I conceived. Allow me to take responsibility. W. Wait. Let go. Forgive us, Your Highness. Several Imperial soldiers dragged Lars away. Lars stretched his right arm towards Halfers, 
a desperate look on his face. I will never forgive you, Halfers. You fool. Halfers looked at his lord as he was carried away by the troops and made his resolve. This battlefield was going to be his last. I shall come to your side, General Jork. Let us go. Do not let even one of them through. Halfers gathered the remaining soldiers and faced the Eastern Province Forces attack section. In this battle, the 1st Division of the Imperial Army lost the two famed generals known as the Twin Wings. At the same time, more than half of the soldiers who invaded the Lamperor U Kingdom were killed or taken prisoner. As a consequence Prince Lars lost much of his power and influence, falling behind the other princes in the succession conflicts. Hey, old man, come on, you can praise me. After looking at the Imperial forces fall, I returned to the Eastern Province forces camp, where my father was. The soldiers I passed by all sang my praises, so I got rather excited. Right. Well done, Din. Yeah, yeah, go on, right. I suppose I could pat your head for the first time in a while. Gua, my skull was then struck by an angry fist. It was much more powerful than the blow I received several days prior. I was flattened to the floor. You blasted fool. Shouts of rage echoed throughout Margrave Maxwell's camp. The following lecture spanned over five hours, setting the record for longest lecture I received in my life. Dinger Maxwell's first battle thus ended, carrying his name far and wide throughout both the kingdom and the empire. The man who would later be called Maxwell Prodigy, the Dragon Cub, started soaring towards the heavens. It all happened five years before the series of incidents triggered by Dinger Maxwell's broken engagement. Five years before the start of an all-out war between the Kingdom and the Empire. Digital version short story, Dinger and Eliza's Morning. Lamperor U Kingdom, Eastern Province, Margrave Maxwell's Manor. Dinger Maxwell, successor to House Maxwell, often got up late. Every night he would take one or more of the maids working in the manor to bed with him, playing with them until late at night so he always got up past noon. However, things were different that morning. The sun was just peeking beyond the horizon when a maid visited Dinger's room to wake him up. Excuse my intrusion, young master, it's morning. The maid who entered the room was Eliza. A physique growing more mature every year, curves accentuated by her maid attire, she walked towards her master's bed. You are going to leave for work, yes? You must get up soon or you will be late. Eliza shook Dinger, covered by blankets over his head, and called to him. N.H., N.H. Dinger, however, curled his body into a ball and resisted. Honestly, this part of you still hasn't changed since you were a child. Eliza put a hand on her thigh and sighed deeply. She had served Dinger for ten years already. In her eyes, however, his body had grown but he didn't change much inside. She still thought of him as a troublesome little brother a little more, let me sleep, just ten more minutes. A muffled voice could be heard from under the covers. That won't do. You'll be late. Preparations for departure could take a long time. If she allowed him to fall asleep again, it would be pointless to have prohibited all night games and sent him to bed early the night before. Eliza frowned, then started shaking the blankets again. Wake up, young master, you are not a child anymore. You cannot sleep in like this. You are. Uh, if the Margrave's heir is late the whole house will be shamed. Wake up already, come on. Eliza called to her master as if scolding an unruly child, as she continued hitting the blankets. When she decided to take off the blankets, something unexpected occurred. A. The blankets wrapped around Dinger suddenly spread in the air, engulfing Eliza like a snake's jaws catching its prey. Ah, yo young master. Taken by surprise and pulled into the bed, Eliza shrieked. Dinger embraced the poor maid from behind and buried his head in her slim neck. This cushion is really comfortable. Young master, please wake up. No pranks, or I will get an N.H. So warm, this is heaven. One of the master's hands sank deep into the maid's ample bosom, starting a rather lewd exploration. Ha, an H, young master. Ah, sweet moans escaped Eliza's lips. Dinger was still half asleep, but his hands could move in terribly skilled ways nonetheless. The master held down the struggling maid and started enjoying the carnal pleasures she offered to the fullest. Ah, a high-pitched shriek echoed throughout the manor's early morning. 
approximately one hour later. Dinja sluggishly got out of bed. What? How did this happen? He frowned and looked honestly puzzled at Eliza, disheveled and breathing heavily next to him. End of Volume 1